मिस्टर शोभित डियर डॉक्टर्स वी आर लाइव या A very good morning to all the respected teachers and dear delegates. I, Dr. Devang Bharti, on behalf of Team Epic Twenty One, welcome you all to the second day of this academic extravaganza. A quick reminder before we start the day's session: all your queries may be sent in Zoom chat box, and they will be addressed by the speakers at the end of their sessions. We will also be asking multiple choice questions between the sessions. Be ready to answer them in the chat box. Now, for the first session of the day, let me welcome Dr. Usha Saha, Director, Professor, and former HOD, Lady Haring Medical College, New Delhi. Her area of special interest is pediatric and obstetric anesthesia, ICU, and teaching. I request you, ma'am, to kindly commence the session. Thank you, Devang. Good morning, all of you. And RML Hospital, thank you for inviting me and making me get up early in the morning. Very good. so today we'll start the session without wasting any more time the first lecture we have two lectures in this session the first one is by dr rakesh gurg he is an additional professor at, at uh, aims irch and his area of interest is onco anesthesia and airway and research so dr rakesh is going to speak on evidence based practices today dr akesh please devan we can start yes ma'am in this session we'll discuss about the evidence based practice which is very very important for anesthesiologists whether they are talking about the perioperative care or the intensive care setting or even for pain management pain and palliative medicine management let's understand the basic concept of following this evidence based practice and patient interest and how can we improve the overall patient outcome i bring greetings from my institute all india institute of medical sciences where at work at the institute rotary cancer hospital now the evidence based medicine or evidence based practice it has an origin in a way back uh, in the ancient greece but the concept in the modern science was introduced by archie cochrane and the term was coined by uh, the father of evm who is gordon gait in 1990 he defined evm as the conscious applicit and judicious use of the current best evidence in making decision about the care of an individual patient integration of the best research evidence with clinical expertise and the patient values remains the core concept of practice of this ebm which is either in the form of an evidence based guideline or it is in the form of evidence based individual decision <clears throat> now when we say the ebz the it it remains uh, for an organizational or an institutional level which uh, wherein it includes the production of guidelines policies and regulations on the other hand the evidence based individual decisions they are practiced by individual healthcare provider and the current evidence based medicine focuses exclusively on the ebid now the evidence based practice has the three main pillars which includes the best evidence the clinical expertise on the background of patient values and expectation and these three important aspects are the core uh, principle behind improving the patient outcome and that remains the basic concept but let us see ourselves how do we practice now if i ask uh, that what is the basis of your medical practice uh, among these four to begin with we'll always say that the training clinical experience and consultation with other professionals are usual the routine way of uh, uh, managing our uh, our medical practice but if we see we agree that the clinical skills and experience would increase the past knowledge and practice might remains outdated or inadequate because the knowledge remains updated so this means uh, we need to have some convincing evidence from various articles and case reports to keep ourselves updated but again when we say we want to update ourselves the evidence which we see may be biased they may be outdated incorrect or not applicable to our patient and that is what probably we require the 
preferences of the patient with some shared goals with mutual respect so that we can have improved outcome. And that's why at times we, uh, our basis of our medical practice also includes the preferences of the patient. But when we say the patient should be involved in all important decisions, but this may not be an easy task because there will be a conflict that happen. And these patients, for example, say, when we start discussing something, for example, for hypertension, we may say that uh, you may have no salt, right, lose weight, forget it, just give me a pill. So this is mean when you try to look for the various lifestyle modification, they will say, I won't take that medicine, the side effects are intolerable. But uh, doctor, I do want to have children. So this means he wants to you know, remain alive, but he will not be able to accept those lifestyle modification changes and the conflicts will still happen, right? And this would require an education about various alternatives and risk is often needed for both, both patient and the doctor. And this is what we can do for these patients. When we start educating them for various alternatives, then the patient will start accepting them. And that is what we is one of the core pillar of evidence-based medicine. And the important role in evidence-based medicine is anything. It starts with the patient and ends with the patient. We are doing everything for the patient. And hence, the patient preferences remains one of the important pillar of the evidence-based medicine. And hence, this would require the active search of RCTs, systematic reviews, and meta-analysis so that you can make a good decision. So in the practice of evidence-based medicine, it's the physician duty to find the best and the most current information and apply it judiciously to the benefit of the patient. But a practice based exclusively on science and math is effective only if your patients are robots or clones, but this actually will not happen. We have to treat human beings. So don't forget to allow for individual human differences and personal preferences. And that's why uh, the combination of all the four things is, is very, very important. And once who follows all the four aspects, this is what the evidence-based medicine is. So I have shown you the, uh, the way we learn during our uh, training program and then with experience, and then we understand the patient and then we keep ourselves updated. So this is our routine journey of uh, becoming a good physician. And this is what is called as evidence-based medicine. Now let's go through uh, the steps of EBM once we have understood that why this is required in our clinical practice. Now, the steps in EBM can be just remembered by five A's. First is ask a focused question, acquire the evidence, appraise the evidence, apply the best evidence, and then finally assess your performance. Let's see one by one. Now, when we say focused question, asking good question is always a skill, right? And it is very, very important because if you ask a good question, it will make a life easy and it also others uh, make others understand. For example, say, Lee, exactly how much time did you spend on the FD project? So this question is very non-specific and hence uh, uh, the, the uh, other side person may think of so many other things because uh, this remains a non-specific question. So this means a good question should be that here in this mention, can you give me an accounting of the extra time you spend on that project so that I can charge it back to the client? So here the question is focused, it is relevant, it provides clear communication why it is being asked it clarifies the goal and the need, and it reduces the time needed to obtain the answer. And he just mentioned it very clearly what the answer is. So a good question is very, very important. It, and it remains uh, equally good for practicing evidence-based medicine, wherein it should be specific, answerable, and it should contain multiple aspects, right? It should not just involve a question of personal preference or local concern, and that is what is required. Now, when we say asking question in our clinical practice, there will be two types of questions you can think of. Background questions and the foreground questions. Now, background questions are usually uh, the generalized questions that where are we now and uh, which way we are, are we heading? So they are very basic and concrete questions and they are usually uh, being asked by novices or any person who enters a speciality fresh and they will ask those background questions. But as your experiences comes on, as your training becomes more better, the questions becomes more specific. You think of new possibilities and you become more expert in that and you start asking what is called as foreground questions. For example, if I want to say that what causes post-operative PONB? So it's a very open question. Anybody new trainee will ask in NSCA practice and it remains a background. But if some are so very focused one, is preoperative oral hydration as effective as IV hydration for preventing postoperative PNV? It remains a foreground question. 
how can i tell if my patient is dehydrated again it's a very broad question so remains later on so this is how with your expertise you will start asking background and foreground questions and that is how you can think of a very good clinical question for improving your clinical practice based on the evidence based practice now let's think uh, uh, this clinical problem the doctor told me that i have a mild hypertension right this is the patient who is uh, discussing the concerns with the doctor now the doctor thinks what do you already know about diet counseling regarding hypertension certainly i heard that a low sodium diet helps to reduce blood pressure but is the effect really so relevant now here comes the dilemma now here is uh, the doctor needs to think of whether he is talking about his personal preference or he wants to introduce the ebm that will also include the preferences of both the parties here and here where we start with the evidence based medicine where uh, this gentleman this physician will start thinking of uh, uh, ebm and he will think where should i start i have heard about the five steps of ebm and perhaps now when this clinical problem happens which happens with all of us we start thinking of uh, some questions we formulate a structured question then we think of pie chart then think of something now this is how we start with clinical problem and then raise the pie chart now when we say a question it should be in the form of pie chart pie chart means patient problem i intervention comparison outcome and any question that you ask in clinical practice should be for example the same patient i come back to you the p patients with mild hypertension i is nutrition counseling regarding low sodium diet c is no dietary advice and o is blood pressure now this is how this gives you a complete question when you start looking for or asking for the first step of the ebm it should be the pie chart format where you are standardizing your question in in a complete holistic way now if i show you this one do you think uh, this is a complete question is oral rehydration in emergency room more effective than iv hydration do we say this this uh, incorporates all the aspects of pie chart patient population intervention and comparison or outcome these are the four things we mentioned but it is not mentioning at which population group because the different population profile will have different effect on the hydration therapy in fact infants with vomiting and so on and so forth so this is not a complete question similarly the use of uh, will atrovent help prevent hospitalization of my 2 year old patient with an acute asthma exacerbation so again when we talk of the pie chart we see that the comparison atrovent as compared to what so i will not be able to tell conclusively that this drug a is better than drug b and then i compare something with that so this is this is how the next step would be now i know a pie chart question i know a complete foreground question now how to transfer it to a search term where i can search this remains which database is best for me so here comes the acquiring the evidence the second steps of ebm now the evidence can be generally searched from various data bank if you think these are the common databases pubmed ambase cochrane science direct these are the common databases used for assessing these evidences now when you choose these, uh, these evidences try to understand these boolean operators and or not right these helps you in searching the various search from these databases now when you transfer your pie chart question is turned a search term so these are the search terms which are usually in the form of match terms mild hypertension nutrition counseling blood pressure low sodium diet control will be no sodium so these are the search terms right so these are have been mentioned now sometimes people may say hypertension as a blood pressure so you need to look for synonyms mild hypertension may be a high blood pressure so these are the synonyms now you need to connect these with boolean operators right so this is how boolean operators because these are the alternates so or but they should be in combination with all those things in the pie chart so they should be with and so p and i and c in case required so this is how you connect these words using the boolean operator so that you can get your evidence out of it now so this will be the search strategy when you put in your databases mild hypertension or high blood pressure and nutritional counseling and low sodium diet and blood pressure so this will give you a very good search strategy <coughs> now also when you start acquiring your evidences you need to think of what is your clinical questions related to whether it is therapy diagnosis prognosis or you looking for the adverse events and accordingly you should look for the various parameters like for therapy 
Randomized controlled trials or meta-analysis of RCTs is important. For diagnosis, it should have sensitivity, specificity, predictive values, address. So these domains should also be looked for when you are acquiring the evidences. You can just narrow your uh, search of evidence based on date of publication, because we know the medical science is changing very fast. So date of publication remains important, type of study, the language, the age group that you're looking for. So this means these domains should be looked for when you are acquiring the evidence. Also scan the articles and look for whether it is a clinical study, is the research current, is the journal well-regarded, are the research questions similar to my PICOT. So we scan the articles, always look that these are applicable and then select an article for application. Remember, the level of evidence changes, the meta-analysis at the highest level, and the case reports, case series are the, on the lower side of evidence. So when you are following your clinical practice, try to understand this level of evidence also. Now, once you have acquired the evidence, it's a time for appraising that. Now, how to appraise? Now, you need to evaluate for quality and usefulness, and this can be done by assessing validity, reliability, relevance, and clinical importance. So I'm using four heavy terms. I'll explain them now to you. Now, when you say appraising, uh, you should be asking, is the literature which I've retrieved is valid? Are the results of the study relevant? How can I assess the literature? So these all questions will help you to look for that what kind of study design will be used for this literature. So this will have you to appraise literature and these are the headings in which you can appraise your evidence. The validity, is the aim similar? The sample population adequate is done in a recent time? Has any major change happened? Reliability, whether the study has reproducibility, the issue of bias, whether study appropriate, Relevance, whether it is applicable to your population, your demographic profile of your population, and the clinical importance. So this will help you to appraise the evidence for it. And when you do it, you need to look for whether the sampling that you have done, uh, this the appropriate population has been selected, which is comparable to your population. The randomization has been done appropriately. The step of various methodology of uh, the RCTs has been done appropriately, including the allocation concealment, including blinding, masking, which has been well done and taken care of. The bias from various aspects has been taken care of and avoided as far as possible. So these all bias, blinding, and validity needs to be appraised in the evidence that you've searched for. So evaluating validity is just avoiding confounding or avoiding bias that will ensure that the study that you have appraised is, is appraising is having proper validity. So you look for the design of the study, the disclosure, how the patient enrolled, recruited in the study, blinding, how the unblinded studies uh, were taken care of uh, in the study and they found that the unblinded studies or treatment have effects an average of 40% larger than the blinded study. So all these issues becomes important in appraising. When you talk about the internal validity, look for all those trends in your study, whether sample size was appropriate, Randomization was done appropriately. The groups were comparable at baseline. The treatment, the equal co-treatment was given to these patients, the compliance, the dropout rate, the fall-off, the blind assessment, equal assessment, the intention to treat analysis in patients with a loss of high, a lot of uh, drop and post-hoc analysis. That needs to be looked for. For external validity, how relevant is the study? Were clinically meaningful and point studied? What is the magnitude of treatment effect and is it clinically significant? will help us to understand the relevancy of that study to your patient population. How generalable are results? Are these pragmatic studies or very focused one? So that also needs to be taken care of. And once you've appraised it, try to apply for the best evidence. And this is what we are looking for. When you apply the evidence, it is by clinical experience and the personal priorities, socioeconomic status of the patient. That comes into combination. That remains pillars of the evidence-based medicine and allows you to make a medical decision. Now, how you do apply it? Once you have uh, you know, appraised your evidences, you need to think of, is my patient similar to participants of the study? If not, are the results transferable? Do the benefits predominate the harms of intervention? What are the costs of interventions? Will the outcomes in the literature be the best for the individual patient that I'm looking for? So based on this, now you can come back to your patient and then say, the result of my investigations are, and you can explain to the patient that it meets your expectation. And this way, you can always allow the implementation of intervention based on the literature and you're applying to the patient so that the patient gets benefited. Now, this is not the end. 
you have to assess your performance, right? Whether you have achieved your expected clinical outcome, your patient recovery, patient follow-up is getting better. It's easy to apply to patient. It's applicable to your clinical practice and how to further improvise. So you need to look for these performance and these performance uh, uh, will help you self-reflect in providing better patient care. What did I exactly do? What were my values and expectations for a particular case? Was my PI code question appropriate? Was my search well structured? Was the validity and relevance of the evidence well assessed? Did I met the values and expectation of the patient? What would I do different next time? So these all clinical experience and expert opinion can be incorporated into such a way that the best patient care is being provided considering the uh, various pillars of the evidence-based medicine. And the performance of uh, evidence-based practice can be by the way of competency and proficiency, which comes with time. To summarize, <clears throat> once we have a clinical problem, we need to look for an uh, answerable question. We have already searched how to search and obtain relevant articles, critically appraise them, make a decision, and then self-reflect yourself so that you can provide better care to a patient. So this is what is required for uh, evidence-based practice by the anesthesiologist in various domains. To summarize, an evidence-based process results in prescribing decisions that led to predictable improvements in a patient care with improved outcome. There are numerous sources for high-quality systematic reviews, and that can be used for uh, providing the evidence-based medicine. medicine. Using any agents, drugs, techniques that have the best evidence for, best, for benefits versus harm and provide good value can help address some of the problems associated with their use in our clinical practice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Uh, you have very well summarized, and I hope uh, the candidates have understood what was said of this. So if they have some questions, I think we can open it up for them. I don't see any question in the chat box. Shobit? No, ma'am, there are no questions. No questions, ma'am. But Dr. Klesh would like to say something. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Aklesh, yes. Aklesh, you need one. to unmute yourself, sir. Unmute yourself. Good morning, Dr. Aklesh. Morning, how are you? We have any more now. The editor for most of the journals. Uh, when we talk about this, sir, can you summarize in two, three lines that uh, how it is useful for the post graduates? One is an example. And, uh, right. So I'll give an example for post graduates because uh, uh, when you join as a post graduate program, uh, if you see your curriculum, the curriculum by the universities and by your medical colleges, they have been very nicely framed. So uh, if you see, go through the curriculum, they will mention that in the first six months or first year, you will be learning these skills. And then when you go into the second year, then they will be asking you to integrate those skills into the clinical management. And when you go in the third year, they will be asking from the curriculum and your teachers will all be asking that what is the recent update? So this means what I have explained in this evidence-based medicine has been very nicely made by our teachers transferred into curriculum. Say for example, uh, you want to use the spinal anesthesia for say lower abdominal surgery. So the first year you will go ahead and do a spinal block. So you will know how a preparation needs to be done, how a cleaning and draping needs to be done, what needle will be using it, what position patient will be requiring. So this is the first aspect of an evidence-based medicine because I shown you the four steps. When you go ahead and do it, then you will start learning the more clinical aspects. So you will asking the, whether the patient can lie supine, whether the patient can make a position. So this means you are integrating the patient preferences here. And then you can start asking that why I am using VP vacaine, why not ropey vacaine? Can I use ropey vacaine for this patient? If I add on fentanyl, should I add fentanyl to it? Should I add dexmatomid into it? Fentanyl is better or dexmatomid is better? This means the third step which I am doing is I'm assessing the published literature. I'm acquiring them. You will go ahead and acquire. Now for postgraduates, the acquiring of uh, this type of uh, information will be from multiple sources. Primarily, it will be your teachers. 
who will be helping you to uh, know uh, give you an opinion that fentanyl is better or dexmethorphan is better for this but as you grow to your third year you will start looking for the literature and will start assessing that whether dexmethorphan for this patient would be better so how to acquire it you will go ahead on the various uh, databases i show you and then start thinking of that yes both the agents can be used but for this patient this drug will be better for this patient this will be better and for the third patient none will be better we need to think of other technique so this means the curriculum is well structured so you need to understand and update and similarly not only for post graduates when we say the senior residency senior residency is further to improve your skill and knowledge what you have acquired during the post graduate program so when you do a senior residency senior residency does not mean that you will get the cases done and then go away it also means that you need to refine your skills and you need to update your knowledge and this ebm practice is very important the other misnomer i can say which even i used to think of evidence based medicine i used to think of is only the base of what has been published but it is not actually only the publications it is also based on your individual patient assessment that is very very important and the center or the setup where you are working because maybe at some point of time each center may not be having all the equipments all the drugs and everything so this means the ebm should be whatever is available based on your domain for example say if i start thinking if i get an a patient who is having a say ejection fraction of 30% and is doing a thoracic surgery i think that pac pulmonary artery catheter would be a best option but if i think my expertise i do not have an expertise of inserting a pulmonary artery catheter so should i go ahead and insert the pulmonary artery catheter in this high risk patient for the first time for the purpose the evidence based medicine or the literature says so so i need to think of my expertise my experience maybe now i now i need to take a decision whether i should go ahead and do this case or i should refer it to some of my colleague and ask them to do so so this also comes under the ambit of evidence based medicine so evidence based medicine is purely not the published literature but the assessment of the published literature in the context of the availability of your surroundings and the patient preferences that what comprises of the uh, evidence based medicine and it is ever changing so if i say uh, i have read in uh, my md anesthesia 15 years back this was the technique and i am happy in the last 15 years doing this technique but then i need to change it if some significant new knowledge has come up in the literature i should be assessing them i should be analyzing them and i should be changing my uh, clinical practice accordingly for the best, betterment of the patient so this is what i uh, think is uh, evidence based practice very well pointed out uh, dr rakesh and that uh, also goes when we talk about any airway management see like in the case of uh, temporomandibular joint ankylosis uh, the evidence says that you have to use a fiber optic fiber optic bronchoscopy but sometimes some places you are not it is not available to you and uh, it may be available to you at some places but you have do not have that expertise to use it so it is as he has rightly said that you need to have resources in your institute you can make evidence for yourself based on those things fine dr rakesh i think uh, emphasizing on that yeah absolutely summarized nicely rakesh thank you thank you dr rakesh no more questions no ma'am so i would just like to say for the sake of the post graduates like you said akhilesh and rakesh we are every day looking for evidence we may not be looking for the article directly but we go to the book whenever we are in the day time we we'll simply apply to our patient in the day we say patients you do your psc you may not know something you go back home consult your books consult today we have google baba we have internet we have so much of things available on internet to search on go to the library and look up for the that is the evidence and we have been doing it since you know whether you did post graduation 15 years ago or i did 40 years ago or 45 years ago even then we were going to the library for everything because google baba was not there internet knows was not there so for us we had to go to the library every day to look for the new evidence or for the books we did not have all the books to our disposal you know you have some basic books for yourself but rest you have to go on keep searching and of course the prime teacher was your teacher they were the ones whose experience of past 15 20 30 40 years which helped us 
there were always discussions there will always be discussions like you know rakesh you said 20 years ago humne ye kara tha fine we did 20 years ago but the pathophysiology remains the same the body pathophysiology doesn't change it changes with the disease pattern with your techniques with your drugs that you are going to use so your pre operative evaluation is most important you know many times what i have seen is residents when they go to do psc they miss out on certain points and we assume that is a correct thing and you know next day morning you suddenly realize oh this has been missed out and you know this is a very common problem and you will lead to what case cancellation in the ot which creates a lot of ill will so pre operative evaluation if you do it very well then you will be able to decide on what what technique to use what drug to use and how it is going to affect the patient's body what result i expect accordingly so you have to set your goals and all this is obviously you know now we have used the term evidence based medicine but it was always there and this can be applied both to most important yes to patient care but also in your research whenever you are planning your thesis projects any research it's very important that you the topic is so important it should not be too ambiguous or too wide that you do not know at the end how to analyze it you do not have you know so there are guidelines as to how you conduct or plan your research like you said the questioning has to be very appropriate so that you can later on it helps you in your research what is your exclusion inclusion criteria now you know what problem i have faced is pgs or residents they read something a case report or something in the literature and they want to apply it to their patient is that right not always so it is very important that you see whatever is published in the literature whether it is applicable to my settings to my patient to my surgery and of course to my expertise if i am not expert i cannot do that i remember long back you know must be more than 20 years ago when lma had just been introduced one of my residents he we were doing a surgery in prone position he said i want to use lma in prone position i said no i can't allow that you see whatever however an expert i am i said not in prone position no ma'am we've seen a case report i said no they must have done it when it was the only indication and they had no other option but in a patient i will not risk it in case it gets mobilized in in case it gets dislodged what will i do so we had a argument on that finally of course i won and uh, i didn't allow that i said intubation and that's it maintain a proper airway and then we'll do it so you know i said why did you discuss with me and are you not worried about the risks you know what he said you are there to manage and you will take the brunt of it i said very smart so as a senior also you cannot always there are faculty members here please do not always give in to the whims and fancies of the juniors and don't think that you are preventing them from doing something new but safety patient safety is very very important whenever you are applying any research any study any case report to your patients aur hamari ek problem hai ki most of the research when we are doing is on western patients there's so much little on our indian patients so can we apply all that to my patient category if you see they will have a hemoglobin of 16 maybe they will have serum protein level of 7 8 or 9 my patients would have a hemoglobin of 8 or 9 so so there are so many factors which are different so whenever you are applying it keep those things in mind and then use your research or your evidence and apply it on your patients anybody else has to say something can say that no ma'am you can proceed with the second one yeah so thank you dr rakesh so now we move on to the second one this is dr uh, good morning dr sunanda gupta she is a professor and head of gitanjali medical college udaipur and her chief area of interest is obstetric anesthesia welcome madam 
So today you are going to apprise us on anemia in normal pregnancy. This is a very, very most common situation or condition that you are going to face uh, in your lifetime, every day, day in and day out. So I am sure this topic is going to be of great help. Dr. Sunanda Gupta, please. Good morning, delegates, faculty, and the EPEC team. Thank you very much for the kind in introduction, Usha ma'am. And I would like to thank all the organizers, and especially Dr. Kaur, for having given me this opportunity to interact with the delegates on this prestigious platform. So before I start, I would like to uh, bring to you greetings from my medical college, Gitanjali Medical College and Hospital from Udaipur. And a quick overview of what to expect in the next 40 minutes, you will find that most of your questions in an obstetric patient would be directed towards anemia, the pathophysiological changes that occur and how best to manage them in different situations. So we'll talk about pathophysiology in chronic as well as uh, Acute anemia, we talk about case reports and uh, case reports for acute anemia, Jehovah's Witness, COVID with anemia, and how best to manage these patients. And then I will wind off with a take home message. So, anemia should never be regarded as an innocent bystander. A very, very important um, statement given by Nissenson et al. from in 2003 holds true till date. And what exactly is anemia? Anemia is a Greek word and it means without blood. So anemia in pregnancy can be defined as a hemoglobin level, which is less than 10 gram per DL with a qualitative or quantitative deficiency of hemoglobin or red blood cells in the circulation, resulting in a reduction in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. The hemoglobin concentration is less than 11 gram percent in the first and third trimester along with the hematocrit, which is less than 0.33. So in the second trimester, it goes down further to 10.5 gram percent. And WHO says that for the low resource countries, the cutoff level should be somewhere around 10 gram percent. Now we need to know the normal iron requirements. It's close to one gram. Uh, for the normal pregnancy. And you'll see in the left-hand box, the fetal growth, the placental development, and the blood loss during vaginal delivery of the mother takes up about 500 milligram approximately. And the uh, one mil of RBC, it contains about 1.1 milligram per ml of um, hemoglobin. And so uh, the total volume of RBC that is increased is about 450 ml. Sorry, that was iron I was talking about. So the total increase here is 500 milligrams. So uh, a daily average of 6.3 milligram per day plus one milligram per day for lactation. This is a very interesting and elegant article which comes from 2019 shock and how best does the RBC act as a transporter of oxygen. Now the average amount of hemoglobin which is present in the RPC is close to about uh, 27 to 31 picogram per cell. And hemoglobin is a tetrameric protein comprising of two alpha, you can see it here, two alpha and two beta polypeptide chains. And uh, they carry the heme molecule which combines with one molecule of oxygen. So, RBC, you can see, is a 7 to 10 micron diameter with a biconcave disc. Now, the oxygen binding kinetics of hemoglobin is positively cooperative, such that a small variation in oxygen partial pressure as blood goes from the lung to the tissues uh, results in a large change of oxygen binding in the lungs and release of oxygen in the tissues. Now the oxygen carrying iron in hemoglobin is in its reduced ferrous state. And when the hemoglobin is oxidized to form methemoglobin, 
then the iron changes to the ferric form and it has it is unable to bind to oxygen now due to this reason in the natural rbcs the oxygen transport mechanism of hemoglobin is closely coupled to redox cycles so that the iron does not change over to the ferric state and it stays in the ferrous state now irreversible conversion of hemoglobin to methemoglobin not only decreases the oxygen binding capacity but it also leads to dysregulated weight to vascular tone and also leads to inflammatory reactions Furthermore, the hemoglobin in RBCs have the unique capability to undergo conformational uh, changes to allow saturation with oxygen in the lungs and then release of oxygen into the capillaries. Now, all this is possible because of the 2,3 DPG, which is an uh, intermediate of the glycolytic metabolism. So, anemia is a transportation breakdown and because you need to transport oxygen from the lungs to the tissues which require it. So we need to know about oxygen levels, the normal blood oxygen parameters in the arterial and the mixed venous blood, 100 is to 40 oxygen, oxygen with hemoglobin is 20% versus 15%, while in the plasma it is 0.3% versus 0.15%. And why do we really worry about anemia? because the oxygen delivery has to keep a very fine balance between the demand of oxygen in the tissues and the consumption in the tissues or the extraction ratio in the tissues. So oxygen delivery to the tissues will be a function of your cardiac output and total arterial oxygen content. And apart from this, it also depends on the degree of affinity of hemoglobin for the oxygen and the tissue oxygen extraction. So uh, the fixed Prince equation uh, gives you an idea about how best this oxygen transport occurs. One gram of hemoglobin will carry about 1.34 cc of oxygen. So this relates to five liters of blood will carry about 980 ml of oxygen. In the anemic patient, if you look, if it's a five gram hemoglobin, just 6.7 ml will be carried in 100 ml of blood. So this reduces the arterial oxygen content drastically. You'll appreciate it much better in the next few slides that I show you about oxygen transport and delivery. Supposing your cardiac output is five liters, your hemoglobin saturation is 15, your PaO2 is 80. This is the most idealistic solution and you have a delivery of oxygen close to 1048 ml of oxygen per minute. Out of this only, 250 ml is consumed by the tissues. Now, look at a situation where the hemoglobin decreases to 4 gram per cent. You'll find there's a drastic reduction in the delivery of oxygen. And if here you increase the cardiac output with a 4 gram per cent hemoglobin, the delivery of oxygen again increases by about 50%. Now, supposing you have a situation where the cardiac output is also low and the hemoglobin is also low, there is a drastic reduction in the delivery of oxygen again. And here, if you manage to, with a low cardiac output, you manage to increase the hemoglobin levels, you'll again increase the uh, delivery of oxygen. So, in effect, what I mean to say is that your cardiac output as well as your hemoglobin are the two main players of how best your tissue will be oxygenated. The oxygen dissociation curve, a rightward shift of this curve is beneficial for the tissues because it uh, helps in release of oxygen. So when it comes from the lungs, goes up to the tissue, there is release of oxygen and up in the lungs, there is binding of oxygen. So in the oxygen dissociation curve also, you find the same sigmoidal type of curve. So what are the compensatory mechanisms that occur here? So one was the shift of oxygen dissociation curve to the right, an increase in cardiac output, an increase in the 2,3 TPG level of RBC, an increase in the P50 levels, a decrease in viscosity of blood so that the tissue blood flow increases. In the kidneys, the decrease in PO2 levels causes 
stimulation of erythropoietin from the bone marrow and produces additional RBC. So these are some of the changes that occur with chronic anemia. So what are the harmful effects on the two lives of chronic anemia? Maternal effects, apart from an increase in the maternal mortality rate, there is fatigue and postpartum depression, a cardiac compromise in labor can occur, increased risk of purpural sepsis and delayed wounding. While in the fetus, there could be perinatal or neonatal mortality rates, premature delivery, low birth weight, increased risk to the developing neural structure and a cognitive decline later in life. So we look at the first case report. This is a pregnant young woman at 28 weeks of gestation, and she's being investigated and counseled for a planned vaginal delivery or uh, LSES at full term. She's lying comfortably in the bed, but looks very pale. So the obstetrician has referred her to you. You need to look at her anemic status, need to uh, decide her management strategies. So the investigation with normal levels, uh, a battery of uh, hematological investigations, will find serum, iron, and uh, transferrin saturation, and the serum ferritin levels will be decreased. But there is an increase in the total iron binding capacity, and this is really not pathognomonic of iron deficiency anemias. Apart from this, the MCV, MCH, MCHC, and PCV, you should know all the normal values and how they decrease. Now, this patient has chronic anemia and needs optimization of her status as she's at present 28 weeks of gestation with a hemoglobin of 8 gram percent. So what are the modalities that are available with you? So the modalities are oral iron. Only if oral iron does not suit her, you go into parenteral or you go in for blood transfusions. So with parenteral, you can give it as injectable iron or you can switch to, along with it, human recombinant erythropoietin. So the oral iron therapy, you need about 100 milligram per day prophylactically. It is the ferrous form which is given and there is a rise in hemoglobin of 0.8 gram per DL per week and you have enough time in this patient. The side effects, of course, are GI upset, which are very, very dramatic, and you may need to switch over to the parenteral iron therapy. So the indications for parenteral iron therapy, if the patient is already on hemodialysis, if um, the patient has been donating blood for an autotransfusion program, or she's severe IDA with presenting latent pregnancy. So in these situations, parenteral iron have to be given. So the total dose of iron has to be calculated. And what we do in our department is we calculate the deficiency in hemoglobin multiplied by 250 and add 50% of the stores. So this gives us an idea of the iron that she needs to be transfused with. Now remember, iron should be given at low uh, trip rates to look for any transfusion reactions, uh, infusion reactions, and this is diluted in normal saline or 5% dextrose, and this should be, the drip rate can be increased later on, and you have to complete it within 30 minutes. Iron sucrose is the best option here because it has less side effects, and what side effects you need to worry about are anaphylactic reaction, chest pain, rigors, chills, a fall in blood pressure, dyspnea, and hemolysis. So the hemoglobin rise is one gram per 100 ml per week. Um, blood transfusion, when do you need to transfuse? So there's a lot of uh, controversy regarding this. Remember, blood transfusion has to be an individual option. It is not indicated if the hemoglobin is more than 70 gram per liter or uh, unless there is significant risk of rebleed or the patient has cardiac compromise. Less than six gram per liter is almost always indicated. Remember, a healthy myocardium will compensate for levels by increasing the cardiac output, seven to eight gram per DL of hemoglobin to optimize the oxygen delivery. So it should be decided on an individual basis. How much volume should be transfused? The normal blood volume multiplied by the hemoglobin uh, percentage rise you need with the percentage of transfused blood hemoglobin percentage. Whole blood will give you 10 to 13 gram percent and that too if it is fresh blood it is much higher. 
packed cells will give you 18 to 23 gram per cent. So uh, if the patient requires a RBC transfusion, always make sure that the patient is shifted to a higher center, which has got management guidelines and protocols. Uh, you should have a very high threshold for uh, blood transfusions and uh, cell salvage intraoperatively, if possible, you should have the option for that and active management of the third stage if she's going into normal labor. So on the right-hand box, if you see every one uh, unit of blood matters, so transfuse one unit, see whether the patient has really any advantages with it. What are the benefits and risks of transfusion? Benefits would be it increases the oxygen carrying capacity, maximizes the oxygen delivery to the tissues, and what should ideally be transfused is the leuco-reduced RBCs because you are also worried about the transfusion reactions. And what we are really worried about is the increase in cardiac load, uh, trolley, the transfusion associated risks, an increase in blood viscosity, a decrease in 2,3 DPT and the P50, which decreases from a normal of about 28 to 16 millimeter mercury in the stored blood. So small volumes of packed cell volume, along with your diuretics, 48 hours before surgery are the best options. BGA comes out with an article in 2011 and gives a query, what is really dangerous? Is it anemia or transfusion? So paradoxically, both anemia and transfusion are independently associated with organ injury and increased morbidity. So your treatment strategies should include optimizing the hematopoiesis, manipulate your physiological responses, which I talked about, and minimize the blood loss. This is going to improve the outcomes in your anemic patients. So patient blood management in obstetrics, um, another important article which came in 2018 and gives a concise report of the NATA consensus statement. It says that oral iron, if hemoglobin is more than or equal to 80 gram per deciliter in the first and second trimester, if your serum ferritin is less than 30 nanogram per mil, and in mild and moderate anemia, you should supplement it along with folic acid 400 microgram per day. For parenteral iron, hemoglobin should be low than uh, less than 80 gram per liter, severe IDA, a newly diagnosed more than 34 weeks gestation and intolerant to oral iron. Your recombinant erythropoietin, if no response to parenteral iron, you can add it to the parenteral iron. And blood transfusion, less than 70 gram per liter with late gestation more than 34 weeks. So these are the guidelines which came out in 2018 from the British Blood Transfusion Society. Now her hemoglobin at full term is nine gram percent after oral iron and parenteral iron. And since she did not have a previous history of LSCS, the obstetrician plans a vaginal delivery. How would you manage the labor in these patients? So in the first stage, you have to make the patient very comfortable, provide epidural pain relief if there are no contraindications, give Supplement oxygen, keep a check on the fluid infusions because you're worried about pulmonary edema and steroids, antibiotics and digitalization as and when required. In the second stage, ideally it should be shortened by application of forceps. And in the third stage, active management, that means you have to clamp the umbilical cord early on, gentle traction on the umbilical cord as the placenta is being delivered and the infusion of uterotonics. So you need to be aware of your postpartum hemorrhage. Yeah. In the puerperium, rest, iron, folic acid for three months are the management strategies. The second case, this is a patient of chronic anemia, 38 weeks gestation. She has a previous history of cesarean. Unbooked case with a hemoglobin of eight gram percent. Now the obstetrician uh, decides that she needs to take her for a cesarean section in the next 48 to 72 hours. And in a preoperative assessment, what we need to look at is whether the compensatory mechanisms are fully activated. And we especially want to look at the oxygen delivery to the tissue along with the underlying risk of decompensation during anesthesia and surgery. So again, we do a battery of tests and first look at signs and symptoms. 
what specifically we need to focus is so any history which is suggestive of poor transfusion, uh, tissue perfusion. So this can manifest as tiredness, easy fatigability, mild anemia to breathlessness, dyspnea, palpitation, angina, and the more severe or moderate forms of anemia. Uh, signs of high card, uh, compensation, cardiac output compensation is tachycardia, white pulse pressure, and systolic ejection murmur. These are essential for planning the mode of anesthetic management. What preoperative assessment would you be doing? The investigations, again, you need to do a complete hemogram, reticular site count, peripheral smears and blood grouping, along with serum ion, ferritin, hematological profile, B12 and folate. Some of the other investigations need to focus on the renal function tests as well as the liver function tests. And apart from this, the ESCG will give you a cardiac status and the USG and the color Doppler, how good the fetal circulation has been. The choice of anesthesia will depend on the severity and type of anemia, the extent of physiological compensation, concomitant medical conditions and the anticipated blood loss. So for monitoring, you need to aim at assessing the adequacy of perfusion and oxygenation. Non-invasive monitoring, your multipara monitoring, along with your urine output and temperature monitoring. Invasive monitoring, CVP, intraarterial blood pressure, ABG, your SVO2 and SCVO2 with a special line in the central line. You can find out the surrogate marker for transfusion requirement and serial hemoglobin and hematocrit values to monitor the ongoing blood losses. What should be your choice of anesthesia? Both can be given, but you need to have some precautions. The regional anesthesia, advantage is lesser interference with the hemodynamics, decrease in blood loss, intermittent epidural low-dose spinal with educated whenever feasible. For general anesthesia, major blood losses with comorbid medical illnesses uh, are preferred. Unstable, symptomatic, severely anemic party rent, you go in for general anesthesia. However, you need to be more careful when you're giving this. Regional anesthesia, once the effect of sympathetic block wears off, remember there is a return in vascular tone. The patient can go into hypotension, hemodilution, heart failure, and pulmonary edema. So, and if there's a vitamin 12 deficiency with neurological symptoms, you need to avoid because of chances of subacute degeneration in these patients. Now, oxygen is an important um, supplement we need to give. Pre-oxygenation with 100% oxygen should be given both in the peri and post-operative period. Maintenance of airway is important to prevent any fall in FiO2, maybe because of airway obstruction or difficult intubation. Hence, the measures and expertise to secure a definite airway should always be immediately available. Spontaneous ventilation uh, can only be used for short procedures, but remember, a high FiO2, um, controlling the ventilation is a much better option. High concentration of volatile agents will again depress both the myocardium as well as the ventilation, resulting in an undesirable decrease in the oxygen flux. Minimize the drug-induced decreases in cardiac output. Intravenous induction of anesthesia should be slowly tri-treated to prevent any precipitous fall in cardiac output. Carefully position these patients to minimize any uh, positional changes on the volume shifts. And mild tachycardia and white pulse pressure need not be uh, path pathological and it should not be confused with light anesthesia. Now the factors which lead to a left shift of ODC should all be avoided. Avoid hyperventilation, there should be normocapnia and hypothermia needs to be avoided because your coagulation factors work best at normothermia. The third case report, this is a 28 year old primee 36 weeks gestation for LSCS. She has had two bouts of bleeding at home. And at present, she is not bleeding, but she complains of breathlessness, fatigue. For the last 20 days, she has pelor, pedal edema, and generalized edema all over the body. 
Her pulse rate is 110 per minute. Blood pressure is 110 by 70 millimeters mercury. Uh, there is a soft systolic ejection murmur on auscultation. Uh, rest is all normal except the investigation of hemoglobin, which shows 5 gram percent. So uh, in 2017, BMC came up with this article, why women bleed and how they are saved. And they say that preoperative anemia, uh, over half of them have a hemoglobin of 11, less than 11 gram per DL. And previous cesarean section are one of the important reasons why women bleed. And this is one of the reasons for calls to prevent the first cesarean section in women. And women with anemia, are twice as likely to bleed during cesarean section and after cesarean section. So what should be your priority? Improve the hemoglobin levels through transfusions and prevent any tissue ischemia. So what are the adaptations in acute anemia? If you look at the respiratory system, there's an increase in minute ventilation, increase in ventilation, perfusion matching, and increase in the PaO2 and the saturation of oxygen. In the cardiovascular system, there is an increase in sympathetic nervous system activity, which leads to an increase in venous return, a decrease in the systemic vascular resistance, a decrease in blood viscosity, and an increase in cardiac output. And third important point is there is an increase in tissue extraction of oxygen because the peripheral tissues, the demand is increased. Right shift of ODC, an increase in tissue blood flow, and an increase in the capillary recruitment and density. So to support cellular survival during uh, acute anemia induced tissue hypoxia, there are oxygen sensors which come into play. And these are present in these three structures. In the kidneys, the decrease in the renal PO2, it causes release of renal erythropoietin. Aortic or carotid chemoreceptors increase in sympathetic activity, increases the cardiac output. And also cellular responses that optimize the tissue oxygen delivery. Ox hypoxia and disable factor from cells are really special in the brain. We'll talk about it. So if you look at this example in the rat brain, there is a continuous oxygen gradient from the arteriole to the uh, capillaries, to the interstitial tissue and to the cells. And here, the PO2 in mitochondria is much higher, allowing mitochondria to generate ATP and under aerobic conditions and also act as primary oxygen sensors. While in the anemic patients, you'll find that this gradient is reduced from five to less than eight to less than four and inside the cells, it is less than two. So this causes, uh, um, expression of hypoxia inducible factor alpha resulting in transcription of a number of uh, hypoxic genes, adapt hypoxic adaptive molecules and um, this increases the glucose transport and more of uh, glycolytic metabolism causes release of ATP. So any evidence of increase in H1F alpha shows that this is an evidence of anemia-induced tissue hypoxia. Thus, this is an adaptive mechanism of the hypoxic brain to protect its cells, and this is known to lead to cognitive decline. So why is it important to maintain the systemic oxygen delivery? It improves the microcirculation, and this can only be obtained after there is an increase in the systemic oxygen delivery. So we talked about oxygen sensors and erythrocytes are mobile sensors. The entrance of erythrocytes into tissues which where the demand is high, it leads to a diffusion of oxygen into the tissues and a decrease in the oxygen saturation occurs. When there's a decrease in the oxygen saturation, this leads to increase in ATP production, though it is through glycolytic metabolism. And this ATP comes out and it combines with the pruronergic receptors here. This releases, uh, this initiates vasodilatation and this vasodilatation is a retrograde vasodilatation. 
and uh, the RBC intracellular ATP is decreased in hemorrhage and this can be corrected when transfusion occurs. So perturbed vasoregulation, non-release of ATP occurs with aged RBCs also. And uh, there's an increase in vascular resistance if ATP is not released. The pruronergic receptor combination does not occur. There is an increase in vasoconstriction and this prevents oxygen to be carried into the tissue, uh, tissue cells. So the compensatory mechanisms in acute anemia are uh, hyperdynamic circulation, which increases the velocity of flow. The sympathetic stimulation, uh, which includes vasoconstriction, tachycardia, increase in stroke volume, and uh, increased venous return, increase in cardiac output. There's a redistribution of blood to the vital organs. There's constriction of the uh, capillaries and in the skin and the splanchnic area. Water and electrolyte conservation and increase in osmotic pressure by uh, release of uh, fluid shifts into the uh, from the intracellular to the intravascular compartment. Anaerobic metabolism leads to acidemia and hyperventilation. So in an acutely hemorrhaging patient, uh, when they receive large amounts of uh, stored blood with an increased affinity for oxygen, then uh, simultaneously they have a diminished circulating blood volume with the loss of cardiac output. And so uh, there's an extremely tenuous balance between the supply of oxygen and the uh, demand by the tissues by oxidative phosphorylation. Therefore, the cardiovascular system of the patient should be healthy enough to compensate for increases in cardiac output. Otherwise, they are liable to go in for cardiac failure, pulmonary edema, and multi-organ dysfunction syndromes. So be very careful when you overload the circulation of a pregnant mother. So what are the changes? In short, in chronic anemia, compensatory mechanisms may be active to varying degrees. The severity of anemia will decide on these compensatory mechanisms. In acute anemia, there may be sudden decompensation, which is superimposed on physiological compensation, which is already present, and the patient may collapse. In the fetus, you'll find that in, sorry for that, in the fetus, you'll find that uh, fetal oxygenation uh, is reduced. There is non-reassuring fetal heart rate and uh, cerebral vasodilatation and fetal death may occur. While in the chronic cases, there's an increased risk of low birth weight, preterm delivery and perinatal mortality. So general anesthesia is the preferred mode if you expect a massive hemorrhage here. So you need to activate the hemorrhage protocol send your blood for CBC, cross-match, and coagulation profile. Monitor, as we discussed about the elective surgery, keep ready six units of blood products, especially the RBCs and FFP, IV lines and intra-arterial line, and your cardiovascular resuscitation should include crystalloids, colloids, as well as inotropes. A left uterine displacement, urinary catheter, a high flow of oxygen, aspiration prophylaxis, uh, rapid sequence induction with ketamine, ABG, mixed venous, PO2, uh, PVO2 as um, investigations, perioperative investigations. Remember, you need to avoid hypothermia and give warm fluids. And don't forget that these patients may stay aware and may have go into postpartum depression. Now, the fourth uh, case report what if the hemoglobin is less than 2.5 gram per deciliter and um, no blood is available? It's a Jehovah's Witness and uh, aloe antibodies and hemolytic or hemolytic anemia may be the cause. So here you need to sedate the patient, paralyze her on neuromuscular blockers so that you reduce the oxygen demand. You need to stimulate the erythropoiesis by giving intravenous erythropoietin, iron sucrose, folate, and vitamin B12. Delivery of high oxygen concentrations. And if you have the facility of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you need to increase the level of oxygen dissolved in the plasma. 
2.4 atmospheric pressure for 90 minutes. You can give 11 sittings here and it improves. Artificial oxygen carriers like Hemopure are um, about 10 units may increase it by 0 0.63 grams per deciliter. So the hyperbaric oxygen, how does it act? It basically increases the amount of um, oxygen that is dissolved in the plasma and increase, it can increase it to nearly 20 times. So that is one of the advantages of hyperbaric oxygen. And the last case report, this comes on worsening the anemia and inducing cytokine storm in the COVID patient. So supposing she's pregnant as well as she's anemic, the low hemoglobin she has will already be decreasing the transport of oxygen to the peripheral tissues and this uh, to the important organs and this may cause multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. Now the SARS-CoV-2 virus can interact with hemoglobin molecules on the RBC especially through the ACE2, CD147, and the CD26 receptors. The virus interacts with the hemoglobin and it acts on, attacks the heme on the beta-1 gene of hemoglobin and this hemolysis is increased. And it can mimic the action of hepcidin, which normally increases the circulating ferritin levels, leading to increase in circulating and tissue ferritin and this induces a serum iron deficiency and increases the anemia. So this is a win-win situation for the COVID uh, virus. So finally, a take-home message here. You need to evaluate the extent of activated compensatory mechanisms. You need to monitor the adequacy of tissue perfusion and the oxygenation, anticipate and prevent any decompensation that can occur in the perioperative period. Remember, no single value of hemoglobin can trigger need for blood transfusion. You need to have a very high um, threshold for transfusing blood. An aesthetic choice depends on the individual clinical and hematological conditions. So, as I said earlier, anemia should never be regarded as an innocent bystander. This is my beautiful Udaipur. Thank you, Dr. Sunanda, for your excellent lecture. And already there are some questions. Already there are some questions for you. Number one is the choice of anesthesia technique. I think there's some confusion regarding whether GA is the option of choice, technique of choice or regional anesthesia. Can you elaborate for the postgraduates, Dr. Sunanda? Now, it all depends on how anemic is your patient. Supposing it is severe anemia and it is around five gram percent, you need to look at how well she is compensated or is she decompensated? What is her cardiac status there? Because always remember if she has got a very strong cardiovascular system, she'll be able to compensate between seven to eight gram percent hemoglobin. She'll be able to compensate for the fallen uh, oxygen levels or the hemorrhage that occurs. But somewhere around 5 gram percent, I would always prefer giving general anesthesia. Now, why we should resort to general anesthesia is we are worried about the decrease in blood flow and the delivery of oxygen that occurs to the tissues. Remember, these patients go in for multi-organ dysfunction syndrome very fast the moment they start bleeding. And as you all know, the blood supply to the uterus, that is phenomenal and it can really bleed. Your patient can really bleed. So any decrease in the circulating blood volume and the decrease in cardiac output will drastically reduce the oxygen saturation. So these patients, though they are already in acute anemia, they are not used to the decreased supply of oxygen. So I would always prefer a general anesthesia. And what you need to be very careful is the pre-oxygenation. So pre-oxygenation here, you need to have a very tight fitting mask and the amount of oxygen that you give 
Ideally, it should be by pap. And this should continue throughout the perioperative period. And this, there are a lot of uh, literature which is coming up about HFNO as a mode of uh, oxygenation in these patients. And what you need to be careful of is the position that you give while oxygenating these patients. And the intubation apnea should be taken care of because you should always give them oxygen through the nasal cannula. Uh, so that is right. We all practice general anesthesia for really low hemoglobin levels. And another reason why we use general anesthesia is we can have control over the fluid administration. With regional, either co-loading or preloading is a standard practice. And this leads to further cardiovascular uh, compromise and risk of pulmonary edema. So we really have to be very careful. But one thing is there, there's a difference in patients who are chronically anemic and who are acutely anemic. Chronically anemic patients are all compromised. So my question and my worry is, they have been living with that hemoglobin of five, six or seven. You know, in our hospital, we get a lot of patients with very low hemoglobin. Why should any sort of anesthesia be a problem? Is anesthesia more risky? or is the surgery more risky? And these patients usually are leaving their normal life with that low level of hemoglobin and continuing on with their pregnancy till full term. So if we can take the precautions of preventing a decrease in oxygen hypoxemia, managing oxygen supplementation to the patient, tissue delivery of oxygen, Maintenance of hemodynamic parameters, avoidance of further tachycardia, I think that should help, Dr. Fernando. Yes, definitely. If the patient is chronically anemic and she has a compensated cardiovascular system, the patient from our side would be very safe. But we cannot predict an acute hemorrhage in the intraoperative period. So any patient who has a hemoglobin levels of close to 5 gram per cent should ideally, precautionally, prophylactically be given general anesthesia. Yes. But yes, I agree if she has a hemoglobin of 6 gram, 7 gram per cent, and it's a chronic anemia, she is well compensated, and you can go in for regional anesthesia, and it all depends and how best you manage the patient, like you said. Yeah. So as this is the usual teaching also, severe anemia, give general anesthesia, avoid regional anesthesia. So we have everything under control when you are, we, we are giving regional That is what we were taught at, as PGs even 40 years ago. With general anesthesia, everything is under control. How much FIO to give, how much ventilation you give, how much blood pressure you maintain. That control is lost the moment you give subarachnoid block. Then everything is with the, once you give the drug, you can't withdraw it. So I think that still holds true. Yes, very true. Very true. Now, another question which has come is uh, digitalization. You said something about digitalization, which the PGs want to be clear. Yeah. The digitalization I talked about is the decompensated heart. When you digitalize these patients, you are treating uh, an impending CHF and you are increasing the blood flow, you are decreasing systemic vascular resistance, you are also causing venodilatation. And apart from this, you are decreasing the central venous pressures, you are decreasing the heart rates. So that is all beneficial for this patient if she is going for impending uh, decompensation, cardiac decompensation. Madam, we can't hear you. Ushama, please unmute. Okay. So, digitalization is done not regularly in all anemic patients, but only who are at a risk of developing or going into the heart failure. Yeah. So, remember that we do not digitalize all patients. Very important aspect of digitalization will be reduction in the heart rate because that is one of the compensatory mechanisms and we do not want further increase in heart rate 
which would again compromise the cardiovascular system. Now, another thing is, another question which has come is, why oxygen concentration is 40 to 50 percent given in general anesthesia? So much, how much? Okay. So I think they want they want to ask why you're giving such high concentration. Okay. I think this so, has really been answered in a lecture, and uh, how, what will a higher FiO2 do? And this is a part of your oxygen carrying capacity in the blood because in anemia that is the most forte important point. As a postgraduate, you should go into your, you know, the first few chapters of your standard books, which tell you how to, uh, what are the oxygen carrying capacity, how dissolved and of hemoglobin combined. So, but I think Dr. Sunanda can elaborate on the, this a bit more. Yes, you have given me, uh, given the 50% answer there. Uh, now, yeah, our concerns here is the hemoglobin levels are low. So now those four molecules of oxygen they are also decreased there. And the only option left now is the 0.3 ml that normally your plasma carries. So when you are increasing the concentration of oxygen, you are trying to increase the amount of oxygen that is present or uh, will be bound to hemoglobin, will be present in the plasma. And you're just increasing the oxygen delivery to the tissues. Now, apart from this, uh, high concentrations will also increasing, increase the driving pressures of your oxygen. And so the advantage here is that they are coming up with different techniques apart from only your face mask. They say that you deliver your oxygen with BiPAP. That is really going to increase the delivery of oxygen to the tissue. So our main concern when we give 40 to 50% of oxygen is that you need to increase the delivery of oxygen. You are taking care of multi-organ dysfunction syndrome there. So remember, normally air contains about 20.9% of oxygen. During routine anesthesia, even in a non-anemic patient, non-pregnant patient, how much oxygen are you using during general anesthesia? At least 30% or 33%. And nowadays, some of them are advocating even 40% which I don't think is right, but 30 to 33% FiO2 is anyway used in non-anemic, non-pregnant patients undergoing any elective surgery. So what we are doing here by increasing the FiO2 is, like she said, increase in the dissolved oxygen because hemoglobin would already be probably saturated. It's a dissolved oxygen component we are trying to increase so that that blood which is reaching the tissues and the uterus is better uh, equipped with oxygen to be supplying to the tissues and preventing tissue hypoxemia, right? So severe anemia, yes, you need to increase the FiO2 to 40 to 50%, at least till the delivery of the baby, it has to be done. So that fetal hypoxemia is also prevented and perinatal uh, fetal morbidity or mortality can be reduced. And remember, as I told you, erythrocytes act as your mobile sensors. So when erythrocytes receive their oxygen levels, they go in for ATP productions and not as glycolytic byproducts. So they are very important when they com combine with the prurinergic receptors on these uh, endothelial cell walls they also cause retrograde dilatation, vasodilatation. And so that vasodilatation is really important in an acutely anemic patient because that is going to improve the flow of oxygen. And thus, the, because whenever oxygen levels are low, the extraction of oxygen also increases. Normally, the tissues will take up only 25%. But here, in an anemic patient, this extraction ratio goes up to 75%. And so there's such a imbalance between the supply of oxygen and the extraction by the tissues. So that another important point you need to remember. And remember why the extraction increases is because the tissues are already hypoxemic. So there's a greater gradient. So extraction has to increase to maintain the tissue oxygenation and prevent anaerobic metabolism to occur. Now the question number, another question is, 
in severe anemic patient coming for emergency cesarean should we administer blood prior to surgery in trop or post op slow infusion <clears throat> anemic patient you want to transfuse blood pre operatively now remember how does your oxygen how is your oxygen carried in the blood now in a stored blood always remember the 2 3 dpg levels are reduced now 2 3 dpg is really important for the carriage of your oxygen molecule and that is why we always say that your blood transfusions and this 2 3 dpg in the stored blood when it is transfused into the patient it takes some hours to be repleted so that is why we always give them a leeway of 24 to 48 hours because that is when your 2 3 dpg becomes functional and it is able to carry your oxygen in the blood so pre transfusing these patients is not going to help because you are going to take this patient for surgery it is always intraoperative transfusion pre operative transfusion only if fresh blood is available but intraoperative transfusion even the intraoperative transfusion is just going to improve the volume of blood it is not going to provide you with any increase in oxygen carrying capacity yes that is right and as the 2 3 dpg increases the hemoglobin dissociation oxygen dissociation will increase and tissue delivery of oxygen increases so remember that and for that all pgs you need to read changes in stored blood and how and when it is useful and benefit to us also remember since if it's not going to help me in the need that is delivery of oxygen to the tissues or in the blood what's the point so you still need to take precautions preventing any complications relating to anemia anesthesia and surgery how then is others how much to be given in pre oxygenation i think this question has been answered okay how much to be given in pre oxygenation remember pre oxygenation is standard which is 100% oxygen already madam said you need a tight fitting mask so that you are trying to give 100% oxygen pre oxygenation is the standard which we use in our routine standard practice that is pre oxygenation 100% oxygen for at least 3 minutes and in anemic patients you can go up to 5 minutes also that gives you a safety feature during your induction and your intubation apnea another is in severe chronic anemia transfusion of blood doesn't it shift the odc to the left yes in severe chronic anemia transfusion of blood doesn't it shift the odc to the left yes dr sananda and why would it shift the transfused blood uh, stored blood why would it shift the odc to the left so it increases what does it increase it decreases your uh, sorry um, there is hypothermia one important cause why the left shift occurs there is alkalosis and most importantly your 2 3 dpg levels are also reduced so these are some reasons why in severe chronic anemia the stored blood that you give causes the oxygen dissociation curve to shift to the left side and shifting of odc to the left means greater binding of oxygen to the hemoglobin and poor delivery to the tissue so we do not want that normal compensatory mechanism to anemia is as already stated in the odc curve is shift of odc to the right that is increase in p50 value so remember again stored blood low 2 3 dpg greater binding of hemoglobin oxygen to hemoglobin and shift of odc to the left we don't want that for the tissue hypoxemia now the only indication for digitalis at present is af 
with CCF, with congestive heart failure? So yes, that is the only indication now we use. But on the other side, we also get the advantage of uh, decreasing the systemic vascular resistance and decreasing the heart rate, which we are really worried about in these patients because tachycardia is a huge problem here. So it is just one of the methods they use, digitalization. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, need for digitalization, you have to go in consultation with the obstetrician and with the cardiologist, and then only it is done. It's not done as a routine as we've already said. And of course, congestive heart failure is one of the indications for need for digitalization. No more questions, it seems. Okay, then a few comments that I would like to make. And one of you questions to you, Dr. Sunanda. One is, I haven't seen a pregnant patient and dialysis combination. Have you? Or has anyone seen? Um... Post pregnancy, yeah, after caesarean. Yeah. So we have it is been, very common that they go in for acute renal failure. And most of the time, either their pregnancy patients who are of renal failure may not conceive, or if they conceive, they may not be able to fulfill, go to the term pregnancy. They have so many, so much of problems. I, I don't know. So I have yet to see. Or you try to continue what till whatever and premature deliveries and then sort of go on to dialysis. Um, another thing is, you said invasive monitoring for cesarean section in anemic patients. How frequently, since you're practicing of anesthesia, how frequently you think you've been using invasive monitoring because we do not teach them to use invasive monitoring for cesarean section because it's generally a short procedure, half an hour, 40 minutes, and why uh, subject the patient to so much of central venous monitoring and uh, intra-arterial monitoring if you want to do ABG, you can do arterial puncture and take sampling and keep a line and take, take sampling. So we per se never advocate or teach them to do invasive monitoring. And even the most important invasive monitoring, urinary catheter is only kept you know, till a short while and taken away. So your experience and your uh, yes. presence on... Uh, uh, these situations are when your hemoglobin levels are less than 5 gram percent, it is close to 2.5 gram percent. You have a bleeding patient coming in with APH and that is where an arterial line helps in an accurate measurement of your vasopressors that you're giving and the acidemic status of the patient. That is the only reason that we do. And because we expect a lot of hemorrhage in these patients, especially placenta previa, placenta accreta, those patients are the only indications where we give intra -arterial. Okay. You say ketamine for induction in anemic patients. Ketamine for induction in anemic patients if she is hypotensive and her cardiovascular system, um, you feel that with ketamine, uh, because our concerns are propofol is the only induction agent we have, and it can cause drastic hypotension. So ketamine or etomidate, both of them, whichever is available. Etomidate is still not available, so... Yeah, it's not very really frequently so available. Mm -hmm. And we generally we are using thiopentone still, and it is a time tested drug. It is safe. We do not have thiopentone now. Uh, I'm surprised you still have thiopentone. Yeah, we use yeah. thiopentone and propofol. Yes, we do not. I per se am not very fond of propofol. I still prefer mm -hmm. thiopentone. My experience of 40, 45 years says thiopentone, I can jiggle with it, you know, with whatever way I want. I know. <laughs> but now it's not available in Odepur. We do not get thiopentone okay. at all. So we are using thio and we do not advocate ketamine for induction in anemic and cesarean, for cesarean. Because there's no option then. Um, we do see a lot of patients with, we have seen 4 grams hemoglobin, 3 grams hemoglobin, but uh, maybe 2.5 like you showed in that case of Jehovah's Witness, we have not seen. I'm amazed and wondering how did the fetus survive? One is how did the patient survive with 2.5 yeah. hemoglobin and 
how did the fetus survive to pre full term pregnancy it's yeah. about 2.5 it's and plus a jehovah's witness yeah jehovah's yes. managed yeah she managed to survive and even a fetus survived but the question is how much would be the fetus neurocognitive dysfunction yeah. in later life that is what you need to look at one thing i would like to say you have covered the management of anemia in the pregnancy very nicely but we as anesthetists are never a part of that team but we as post graduates as doctors we need to know how to manage anesthesia when ever we are faced with pregnant patients near term when they ask us for labor anesthesia a patient goes into pih or eclampsia or needs intubation and ventilation shift to icu for cesarean sections problems after uh, normal delivery when patient goes into pulmonary edema or problems relating to um, post operative after surgical thing so generally we are hardly ever there when they are giving iron transfusions or managing throughout those nine months of pregnancy they never consult us we are not a part of their team <laughs> i don't know whether they do that in your But, hospital uh, dr uh, sun yes because we have a very cohesive obstetric team so they do you know all management if they feel those patients are going to come to us after the four or five months we do get these patients that's But I think that's basically put it in because when we take exams for these postgraduate students, we ask them each and everything about iron. We ask them everything about oral iron, the values yeah, they okay. ask. So okay. yeah. No, yeah. So no. that is why I included all that in you. No, but you've given uh, you know for the rest of the faculty, like uh, many patients, you know, they come to us three four months. We build them up. for surgery maybe this is a very good thing we can have in the of department yes. that by the second trimester they should refer the patients to the anesthesia in case they have problems already i think it's a very good uh, because uh, in that yeah. case uh, we can yes. look out for comorbid conditions and these are yes. really helpful when the patient suddenly yes. comes to us for cesarean sections actually yeah. uh, uh, just a note actually uh, dr usha ma'am this yeah. is a just a pg discussion in which i think it is very relevant uh, the way dr sunanda has uh, yeah, presented yeah. her talk and this uh, I, i think whatever setups are different in at every place like in our setup we have a tomidate we are using propofol so you know it's different with lady harding and it is different at every place so most of the it should be aligned to the pg yeah. kind of our yeah, pg should be for discussion yeah that is what the pg should know the advantage and disadvantage of this yes, ma'am that's fine and but uh, and everything they have to know the background of the management of yes. anemia and that's very relevant yeah it is relevant of course it's relevant yes but what i'm trying to say is in those nine months of pregnancy we are never consulted We are highly And wherever the critical care facility is there, we almost are a part of it. Yeah. And um, so, maybe, maybe it's different at different places, ma'am. Yeah, but I guess the postgraduates need to know each and every aspect. Yes, they need That's to know everything. The moment they get a pregnant patient, uh, the child is asked everything on iron and yes ma'am totally blood transfusion and true true and in anemia i think cardiac condition heart failure management digitalization yes blood transfusion related problems uh, stored blood and changes odc oxygen carry you know anemia in yes, the physiology of anesthesia yeah, it's uh, really entire anesthesia entire anesthesia will come into that yes. so pg is you cannot take it think and uh, this is just a byline condition it actually involves a lot and now you should also know about covid pregnancy yes. and anemia that's why i included that case report so you know you need to be yes it is very pertinent yes. mm -hmm. ready with all your answers thank you dr sunanda mondeep it was Great. a pleasure thank you, thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Sunanda, for being a part of the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We have had a very illuminating discussion. Thank you. And I request Usha, ma'am, to kindly conclude the session. Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh, Dr. Sunanda Gupta. These topics were very well discussed. You covered all the aspects, and I am. I hope teachers will benefit from these. I am sure they will. The second topic. There were so many queries. Just shows how interesting a clinical discussion is for them because this is they face it every day, and they are going to see it every day. But remember, please. EBM is also going to be a part of your life, day in, day out. So keep on learning, keep on studying. Google Baba is there. Everything is there for you to learn more. Good luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Best of luck to all the postgraduates. Thank you. So before proceeding further, let's have a brief quiz. The questions will be displayed on your screen and you can answer them on the comment box. These are the two questions. Uh, I think we got the answer, so we can proceed with the next session, Dr. Devan. Yes, sir. For the next session, I invite Dr. Nisha Kachru, Professor, ABBIMS, and Dr. RML Hospital. Her area of interest is quality and geriatric, her is transplant anesthesia and pediatric anesthesia. I request you, ma'am, to kindly begin the session. Our next session is going to be on labor analgesia, and I welcome Dr. Pradeep Jain, who is professor and senior consultant at Sir Gangaram Hospital. He will be giving the talk on labor analgesia, which is a very important component uh, of, anal of uh, obstetric care, but unfortunately has not gained much popularity in India. So over to you, Dr. Jain. Good morning, everybody. I am going to present about the labor analgesia. And this will be a little bit, uh, I'll, I'll put it the case scenario form. So I start the proceeding. A 22-year-old primary gravida is admitted with full-term pregnancy and labor pain with 3 cm cervical dilatation. Patient was diagnosed to be suffering from rheumatic heart disease at two months of pregnancy. And now she has got her pulse rate is 90 permanent, blood pressure is uh, at present 125 or 78 because she is only 3 cm dilated and her peripheral oxygen saturation is 95%. What should be done? Should we provide labor analgesia or not? Or the normal the delivery should be conducted? What are the beneficial effects of labor analgesia? What should be the plan of action? 
the intensity of pain in labor if we go from 0 to 50 then we can say only the traumatic pain and the amputation stand higher than the labor pain so the labor pain is one of the most painful experience in woman life and with the pain comes the effect on the fetus also so when there is a pain there is a sympathetic stimulation there is a and that leads to various effects on the body like in the, in the cardiovascular system there is increased cardiac output increased peripheral resistance increased blood pressure there is a delayed gastric empty time on and the humoral aspect there is a increased adrenocortical output it increases the lactic acid free fatty acid leading to maternal metabolic acidosis which in turn lead to fetal acidosis and on the other end also, there is a lot of anxiety. Patient hyperventilate, increased oxygen consumption is there. There is a hyperventilation, hypocarbia, which decreases the uteroplacental blood flow. So with the increased catecholamine release also, there is an impaired uterine contraction. So these are the various effects on the mother and the fetus, which occurs if the labor pain is there. And when the, when the compensation is not there, or the patient is having rheumatic heart disease or some other, uh, other comorbidities, then the effect is more pronounced. So the harmful effect of labor pain are increased plasma hydrox hydroxycorticosteroid or the catecholamine excretion leading to decreased uteroplacental blood flow. There's a hyperventilation and leading to alkalosis and the oxygen dissociation curve lift, uh, shift to the left. Decreased oxygen transfer to the fetus and the fetal metabolic acidosis, increased cardiac output and blood pressure. There is anxiety, fatigue, and increased catecholamine, leading to dysfunctional labor and the fetal metabolic acidosis. So, so ultimately, it is the fetal who suffers, like fetal oxygenation is impaired, and the fetal metabolic acidosis there. So the beneficial effects are it prevents the dysfunctional labor. It decreases the catecholamine and the other things, and it prevents the decrease in the uteroplacental blood flow. So it is maintained when the liver pain is provided, decreases maternal oxygen consumption, prevent hyperventilation, and eliminate fetal acidosis and hypoxia. That is the reason the liver pain is really beneficial to the uh, pregnant patient. And the, what are the requirements when one provides the labor analgesia? There should be adequate analgesia. The safety of the mother and fetus is of paramount importance. There should be minimal effect on the progress of labor. Allows the mother and patient, the labor, the, the analgesia what we provide should allow the mother to participate in birth experience. There should not be no weakening of muscle power and there should be capability of extension for emergency LSCS. If you take in labor pain, according to the uh, labor analgesia, they are divided into two stages. There are first stage of labor, beginning of uterine contraction to 3-4 dilatation of the cervix. Then there is a second stage of labor from 3-4 dilatation cervix to the delivery of the fetus. The difference in first and second stage is that, that there is a dual uh, pathway. In the first stage of labor, from the beginning of the uterine contraction to the 3-4 dilatation cervix, there is a, it is a visceral pain mechanism. There is uterine contraction, there is cervical dilatation, dull aching pain, which is in the abdomen groin, goes to the back, and it is mediated by slow conducting unmyelinated C fibers traversing from T11 to T12, and of course, the T10 and the L1 may be involved. The second stage of labor is, is uh, uh, basically the somatic component is involved, and the pain arises from the in the first, uh, first and the second stage of labor incorporate both visceral and somatic component arising from uterine contraction, cervical stretching, stretching of the vagina, pelvic ligament, and pelvic flow. And it is conducted by malignant A delta fiber carrying impulses via S2, S4 sacral nerve root. So it is very important. Visceral component, basically, mainly it is in the first stage. And it is, uh, it is by the T10 and T11, maybe the L1 and the T10 may be involved. And the somatic component is by the uh, S234 segment. But also, the peripheral branches of the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh, somatic fibers from the cutaneous branches of the iliogonal and the genitofemoral nerve also carry the afferent fibers from L1 to L2 and the iliogonal nerve. And of course, when the, in the late stage, the posterior cutaneous nerve of thigh with the, via the S2S3 may be involved. So it is very important and it pertains to how, what should be the treatment, what, how you can provide the labor pain during the different stages of labor. At what stage the patient is, then the treatment is designed. 
a 34 week pregnant executive in the private firm diagnosed a case of uh, diagnosed as a case of pih presented to the psc clinic for consultation and she had a lot of queries about the liver analgesia she she want to understand what is liver analgesia then so how you are going to tell her then what are the she asked how how can i be provided the liver analgesia so there are non pharmacological pharmacological method and the pharmacological method in the non non pharmacological method it is a specialized technique and the non specialized technique and the pharmacological method systemic drugs inhalation agent and the regional analgesia the non pharmacological methods include acupuncture transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation intradermal saline injection there is another trial therapy hypnosis and then there is a hydro bath hydropack massage then there is a yoga breathing and relaxation technique and the prenatal classes are there the modern approach is the psychoprophylaxis approach and this approach teaches normal anatomy and physiology of labor and pregnancy to the parturient uh, to the pregnant patient and there is a training in relaxation uh, methods and the breathing technique by dick and beat what about the pharmacological techniques there are three pharmacological techniques and this is how you are going to provide depends upon the stage of labor in the first stage of labor it is a non volatile agents that we can use and the second stage of labor we can use volatile and the gaseous agent the nuraxia technique can be used either in the first or in the continuity from the first stage to the second stage so irrespective of the stage the epidural block or the nuraxial technique would be uh, helpful but for the first stage the non volatile technique and the second stage volatile and gaseous technique are helpful in the in the sec, uh, in the first stage we are providing the systemic medication which includes the opioid non opioid and of course ketamine dexamethasone benzodiazepine so many drugs are being used nowadays as a, as a, as a, as a, as a systemic medication providing liver analgesia in the first stage of labor the fentanyl is the most commonly used drug it is a potent short acting opioid you know the onset of action in 3 to 5 minutes peak effect come in 5 to 15 minutes uh, it has got the half life of less than an hour the advantage is it is no active metabolite as compared to morphine it is suitable for pca the bolus doses are given 25 to 50 mics every hour continuous infusion is 0.25 to 0.5 microgram per kg per hour the the the, the advantage is over morphine is there is less nausea sedation vomiting than morphine but it can cause hypotension bradycardia and the muscular rigidity and the, uh, is sometimes seen with the fentanyl so fentanyl is the most commonly opioid uh, drug used in liver analgesia then recently the remifentanil has come the advantage is it is ultra short acting synthetic opioid it acts rapidly rapidly metabolizes the plasma and uh, tissue esterases the effective analgesic half life is only 6 minutes so it is given as an infusion and the moment you stop the infusion the effect goes up the dose is 0.25 to 0.5 microgram per kg bolus dose is 20 mg local interval is 3 minutes and the continuous infusion 0.025 microgram per kg per minute is given with a maximum of 0.15 microgram per kg per minute it is a promising solution this should be used when nuraxial techniques are contraindicated or cannot be done so if the if the patient has to be provided liver analgesia nuraxial techniques contraindicated cannot be done then the remifentanil infusion is a, is a alternative uh, technique for providing good liver analgesia ketamine some as, as you know we are using ketamine for the immediate vaginal delivery patchy epidural anesthesia it is a good it is in the sub anesthetic dose it is a very good analgesic agent but it has to be used in a very low doses the bolus dose is only 10 my 10 10 to uh, 10 to 15 mg infusion is 0.25 mg per kg per hour aspiration prophylaxis has to be maintained we have to uh, titrate the dose and maintain verbal contact and monitoring tramadol it provides satisfactory energy for first stage of flavor but not for second stage there is a uh, there is a because it is being used nowadays because of minimal maternal, maternal depression but the limitation is about the nausea and vomiting and the dose is 1 mg per kg where 2 ml per hour infusion of 0.75% solution up to a maximum 400 mg is being given pca patient control epidural uh, patient control analgesia iv is never stable this is not a technique of choice but it enables mother to tailor her analgesic meat and it is only used where regional contraindicated or technically difficult so if there is no option available then one can use the pca uh, to to provide the liver analgesia 
Now, inhalation analgesia. When, when one should use the inhalation analgesia and what are the different inhalation agents that are being used? The Antonox, Sevoflurane, Isoflurane, Desflurane. And people, you, uh, people were using phthalene, but nowadays it is a, it is a Antonox, Sevoflurane, Isoflurane, Desflurane are being used as an inhalation agent for providing labor analgesia. Antonox is a patient-controlled intermittent inhalation analgesic. It is safe, self-administered. Onset of action comes in 30 seconds. Maximum analgesic effect is 45 to 60 seconds. And this is due to, and, the, and the short onset of action, and the, this is due to the low blood gas solubility. It is, there is a rapid diffusion, induction recovery, advantages, ease of use, self titration, and, uh, but it does cause giddiness, uh, nausea, dysphoria, and the patient should be cooperative while using the Antonin. So this is another thing that can be used in the, uh, this is in the second stage of labor. Inhalation analgesia, desflurane, enflurane, and isoflurane. Effectiveness is comparable to that of nitrous oxide. Recent studies suggest sevoflurane in spite concentration of 0.8% to be acceptable and effective. Provides superior pain relief, but more intense sedation. Isoflurane has been used in concentration of 0.2 to 0.25% with nitrous oxide, which is known as isonox. And the desflurane is 1 to 4.5% with nitrous oxide, but use is limited by drowsiness, unpleasant and smell and high cost. So we have seen, we can use IV medication, which, can, which may contain opioids, non-opioids, dexamethylene, uh, uh, ketamine, etc. And on the other hand, the inhalation analgesic agent can be used in the second stage. And the third method that is used to provide labor analgesia is the neurexial technique. What neurexial technique can be used for providing labor analgesia? If we see, we can use the, you can see there's a epidural technique, Lumbar sub spinal, whether it is a bolus dose, single bolus dose, or the continuous spinal in the and the caudal epidural block, we can use the uh, not not use common levers. Uh, it has been mentioned uh, theoretically it is possible to get the paravertebral block or the lumbar sympathetic block, but it, since it is given, it has to be bilateral. It is not practical solution, but only regional block where the, the where the where the neurexial block cannot be used. Uh, we can uh, in local block we can use the pudendal nerve block and the Parasurvical nerve block. How the neurexial anatomy differs in normal to the pregnant patient? There is a lumbar lordosis, there is a widening and rotation of the pelvis, which reduced, which leads to the reduction in the intervertebral gap. Toughest line tosses spine at the higher level in the L3-4 space, so there can be enhanced dorsal space. We have to keep in mind the volume of the drug to be engorged. There's the engorgement of epidural uh, veins. And difficult identification of the ligamentum plebum due to the laxity and increased sensitivity to local anesthetic. So there is a narrow epidural space, enhanced dorsal spread can be there, and reduction in intervertebral gap can be there. The epidural methods of providing are intermittent bolus doses, continuous fusion, dural puncture epidural technique, patient controlled epidural analgesia, which can be computer integrated, PCEA. Programmable intermittent epidural doses and the variable automated mandatory bolus administration. And the combined spinal epidural analgesia can be the other methods. So these are the methods that by which the epidural uh, analgesia can be provided. What are the indications? Whom to give the labor analgesia? If the maternal request alone can is a sufficient indication. And there's a preeclampsia, diabetes, morbid obesity, non reassuring fetal heart, maternal cardiovascular disease, the obstetric indication of the incoordinate uterine contraction, dystocia, and the fetal indication can be premature, multiple pregnancy, IU, intrauterine growth retardation. Contraindications are patient refusal, uncooperative patient, coagulopathy, hypovolemia, epidural site infection, deformity of the back, and well, we should have the resuscitate equipment at our side. If they are not available, then one should not give epidural analgesia. The prerequisite are we have to take the consent. Intravenous access is very important. Monitoring is important. Should be done in all aseptic precautions. And the resuscitate equipment should be available at the bedside. Nowadays, the low dose epidural regime is there. Initially, people were using high concentration to begin. That would leading to more hypotension and the and the uh, and uh, instrumentation delivery, but traditionally bupivacaine was used in a concentration of 0.2 to 0.25 percent. But now, it is the method is minimal local anesthetic drug and the minimal local anesthetic volume. So the low dose of local anesthetic is being used. 
bupivacaine levobupivacaine in concentration of 0.0625% to 0.125% is being used ropivacaine 0.1% to 0.25 0.2% is used so 0.025% bupivacaine is equivalent to ropivacaine of 0.1% and 0.125% is equal to 0.2% of ropivacaine there is a, there is a decrease in the total dose of bupivacaine and and that leads to decrease in side effects such as motor blockage another thing that has come is the addition of opioid with the advent of fentanyl and the remifentanyl the low dose mixture of local anesthetic and opioid are being used so generally the 2.2 to 2.5 max of fentanyl is added uh, in the in the 0.0625% or 0.125% of bupivacaine or the lipivacaine or ropivacaine in 0.12 to 0.25 percent patient control epidural analgesia I is attached to the patient after giving a bolus dose. There is a feeling of control. Advantages are there is feeling of control, immediate access to additional doses of epidural. There is a less motor block because you are not using continuous infusion. There is a lower drug use, minimal sympathetic block, and lower staff per clause. So PC attaching PCA uh, when the epidural catheter has been inserted after giving a low uh, bolus dose is it has got the various advantages which I have just enumerated. There is a call received from obstetrician. There is a case in another third call received from obstetrician to anesthesiologist about a primary gravida with five centimeter cervical dilatation, labor pain. Patient is very uncooperative with very low threshold for pain. Which neurological technique to be used in this patient? So the technique that is that is should be used is the combined spinal epidural analgesia. It has it is it differ because it has a subarachnoid component component. That's why the name is combined spinal epidural means there is a spinal component also. And the epidural component also. So, so the subarachnoid component and the epidural component. It is the most important new technique in obstetric analgesia, which is also dubbed as walking epidural. The advantages are it has got the rapid onset of pain relief, better perineal analgesia, high ambulatory potential, and the lower drug use. So basically, the idea was allow the patient to ambulate, which decreases various, uh, which has got the certain advantages. The dose regime for combined spinal epidural is initially the fentanyl bolus dose when the spinal is being given. Once the epidural catheter is passed, then the spinal needle through and through needle is passed, and the fentanyl 25 to 50 microgram bupivacaine in concentration of uh, in doses of 1.25 to 2.5 milligram is given. But generally, it is 1.25 milligram is given. Followed by the epidural catheter inserted, the continuous infusion of 0.025-625 percent bupivacaine with two mics of uh, per ml of fentanyl. Is given in the rate of 8 to 10 ml, or if one can use PCA, either PCA or continuous PCA plus uh, continuous infusion can be done with local interval of 15 to 20 minutes. Then the alternate approach to det uh, is the computer integrated patient control epidural analgesia. It is, it is an approach to determine the background fusion rate during PCA, is the use of computer program to automatically adjust the background fusion rate according to the amount of local anesthetic used in the previous hour. So it decreases the amount of total drug to be used. And it 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 basically incorporates the uh, patient uh, requirement also. So that this the dose can be titrated. The program intermittent epidural process is a novel technology in which boluses of epidural mixtures are delivered at predetermined interval. Criteria for walking epidural when you use the combined spinal epidural or the epidural in the low concentration of local anesthetic one can only allow the patient to walk when there is no obstetrical contraindication, no change in orthostatic hypertension, means there should not be any orthostatic hypertension, the ability to perform SLR should be there, and the modified Bromage score is used to assess whether the patient can walk or not, and it assesses muscle power. The Bromage score is 0 to 4. In Bromage 0, the subject is able to move the hip, knee, and ankle and is able to lift his leg against gravity. So we desire the Bromage yeah. zero uh, score should be there and we allow the patient to walk. And if we go down from stage uh, Bromage one to Bromage four, then the, uh, then the, there's a gradual increase in the muscle weakness. And in the Bromage three, the subject yeah. is unable to flex his hip, knee and ankle, but able to move only his toes. And Bromage four leads to complete paralysis. So the assessment, before the patient is allowed to walk, is very, very important by the Bromage score. The paracelvical nerve block and the pedantal nerve block, these are the two now frequently used by the obstetrician. And 
when the when in the in the very late uh, late stage, then it is not possible to go neuraxial or the neuraxial block is uh, is 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 not being given, and the patient is having pain. The paracyclical nerve block is given is an alternate technique. Who cannot receive neuraxial block? The pain relief is provided in this during the first stage of labor. No somatic or motor block is there. It hosts transmission of visceral afferent impulses from uterus and cervix to paracervical ganglia. 5 to 10 ml of local anesthetic are deposited in left and right present cornex. The side effects are, of course, we have to keep in amount the volume of the local anesthetic to be used, like local toxicity can be there, and the hematoma formation can be there, and the bradycardia. Fetal bradycardia is very common during the paracervical nerve block. The pudendal nerve block is used in the second stage of labor. Uh, it is it is denervate the sensory innervation of lower vagina, vulva, perineum, motor to peri perineal muscle, external and sphincter. The root views are transvaginal or transperineal root. Seven to twenty ml of local anesthetic on each side are deposited to the uh, uh, middle and uh, posterior facial spine, and basically this uh, this helps uh, help this type of this uh, perineal nerve block help when there is a forcible delivery and the physical stitch has to be done but the chances of infection and the hematoma are there. There are a few myths associated with liver analgesia, which uh, with the, with the, in the last decade, a lot of research have become, which are not there. There are increased chances of LSCS, prolonged labor, increased intervention delivery, backache, headache, and effect on the baby. So what is new is the maternal request alone is an indication, ultrasounded guided block, Minimal local anesthetic drug and minimal local anesthetic volume, fentanyl and refentanyl, propivacaine, lipopropicane, combined spinal epidural technique, and the more awareness is there about liver anesthesia. Thank you for the patience hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jain, for your very illuminating talk. Uh, I can't see any questions in the chat box. Are there any questions? No, ma'am, no questions. I think it has not been understood or completely understood. <laughs> As I said, if questions have come up, I'll just share with you. Yeah. Uh, what is the cutoff time beyond which we should not try norexial labor analgesia? See, the uh, initially when the this is this is the depend upon the stage when the patient is coming. Suppose there is a imminent delivery is there, then there is no no point in giving the this new axial block. But if but even if the time is there, then the CSEA technique is the most optimal because it provides immediate pain relief. So because epidural will take time, so it is not indicated. But CSEA technique can be used where I already mentioned the case three where there was a five to seven five centimeters of dilatation was there. Patient was very uncooperative. Patient has low threshold for pain, and patient uh, uh, this uh, and this CSEA technique only because end point is there. One is sure okay, that we have this the proper uh, position is there and giving uh, CSEA technique the immediate labor pain is provided. And then, of course, one can use the epidural catheter uh, and go, go on giving uh, with, by the epidural rule. So, CSA technique is the preferred technique of choice. Uh, I think this also but answers the question, uh, what is the ideal time to put epidural analgesia? Uh, there is, initially, it was thought that we should put the late stage, but now there is no ideal time. One can use it uh, before, uh, uh, approximately 3 centimeter dilation of cervix, we should put the epidural catheter. And we can always top up the dose and when, when, when the epidural catheter in situ is there then one can always, uh, whenever requirement is there, one can top up the dose, one can use the PCA, etc. We generally attach the PCA and the patient can take, depending upon the pain, um, uh, the uh, local anesthetic volume. And now the chances of local anesthetic toxicity, etc., or the, that is not there because so much low volume is used. So there is no issue of any uh, paralysis or prolongation of labor or something like that. So... Any time the epidural catheter can be placed, and then whenever the requirement is there, whenever the patient feels pain, then the dose can be taken. Uh, okay, so there are certain concerns regarding the use of spinal anesthesia. Uh, they say that spinal anesthesia can cause topolysis. So, is there delayed propulsion of uterus? Definitely, definitely. 
if if only is by come in you are you asking about combined spinal epidural analgesia disadvantage or this ss spinal analgesia i think they must be talking about combined spinal epidural no, see the amount uh, that's what i've told you there is no 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 problem in that because the dose that is used now in combined spinal epidural analgesia where the spinal root is only 1 mg less than 1 mg of the bupivacaine is able to relieve the pain completely and when less than 1 mg is used there is no effect on the this thing uh, uh, this thing um, on the mother okay uh, one more question uh, onset and duration time of bupivacaine and fentanyl is different then how yes. how it effects in combination see the combination is a summation effect is there so whenever there are there are different method of prolonging the uh duration of action of this thing uh, bupivacaine whether you add the local nest uh, uh, adrenaline or you give increase volume or you combine with fentanyl so summation effect of fentanyl plus bupivacaine is definitely more than the bupivacaine alone and we are always using it to prolong the uh, duration of action of the, this thing and because less volume less dose is used both of bupivacaine as well as fentanyl so side effect also minimize uh one thing more sir uh someone has asked that in a patient on anticoagulant uh, like we see in the patients with pregnancy with ms uh, yeah could 4 hours be sufficient for placing epidural what what i have not understood so they saying ki there are sometimes patient on anticoagulants as yes. in of, uh, uh, pregnancy in mean, case of ms so when should we put epidural in them see we already know the patients are anticoagulant and patient is go- patient is going in labor so the anticoagulant should be with it and giving csc initially we should not uh, we, we should we can put it we should give the time factor time factor should be given to the anticoagulant but nowadays epidural should not be done i think one can only give the uh, uh, give the don't put the epidural catheter the csc technique on the spinal good and the effect will be there for 6 to 8 hours is easily there Sir, so one the- can prevent the complication of uh, passing the, uh, this thing so in the continuity of that uh, one uh, has one delegate has asked in a patient with mitral stenosis which method is ideal and is there any preference for different as based on the basis of stenosis see whether whatever technique is used yes the regional technique should be used for providing labor analgesia it is definitely it help it helps the patient regarding the stress is concerned because there is a lot of cardiovascular stress is already during pregnancy and on top of it the labor pain so if we provide labor analgesia definitely the the, the cardiovascular stress is reduced first thing that should be used definitely second thing yes yes sir and second thing whether you one one i think if it is a plant thing then epidural epidural is the uh, good good method because it controls the, you can give the titrated doses and you can provide the segment analgesia also in that way uh one more question sir uh they say that ideal level at which epidural catheter to be inserted in labor analgesia the yeah, ideal level is initially in the you if if you are doing it see it depends patient positioning in the first stage of labor when the patient up to the uh, full dilatation cervix is there then you you provide want to provide at that t10 to l1 level so putting the putting the catheter putting the catheter up to the you start with the l4 and then uh if you give the drug in the normal supine position then that will be able to it uh, if you are giving uh, 8 to 10 ml of the drug that it, uh, then it will be able to in, uh, include the all the label what is needed for providing the uterine service dilatation but in the second stage of labor you can make little bit head up so the drug is due to the gravitation proof the s 2 3 4 segments are also affected so it is just the positioning little bit alteration can be done in the second stage of labor uh so someone has asked what is to be given in second stage of labor as you have pointed out uh some books advocate use of 1 to 2% of lignocaine for second stage so is it routinely practiced no with the see, there's no 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 added advantage no added advantage if you are using 0.125% since uh, uh bupivacaine or 0.065% bupivacaine that is sufficient to provide analgesia so and it is for longer duration which is not going to hamper in any way with the movement and anything of that like then why to use the lignocaine fine sir so i think that answers most of the questions uh, back to dr nishan ma'am please unmute yourself
there is a question I see uh, which says, what can be done uh, with COVID-19 patients uh, with G2P2 L1 in first stage of labor, hemoglobin less than 7 gram percent, shall we go with CSC? In the first stage of labor? No. Uh, I, can you repeat the question, please? The question says, what can be done with COVID-19 positive patient in first stage of labor, hemoglobin less than 7 gram percent, shall we go with CSC? CSC technique? Yes, but I don't uh, think they need... See, the, the COVID prophylaxis treated that, there are, there are three, two, three components in it. The one is the what is the COVID prophylaxis should be done, what should be done in the COVID positive patient, then RTPI. If, if the time permits, the one can do it, the test. If it is not possible, then one take all the precautions and then one has to do it. So that, that, that's one thing. If it is mandatory, it is very, which is never the case, which is never, labor and GSA is not an absolute indication for anything in that way. So one can use, I think one should go for IV in the first stage of labor. And then the endonuts, why to use the interventional technique in the, in the, in the, in the patient who is COVID positive. There is a question asking the dose of LA for walking epidural. This is, this is retirement. Dose of LA for walking epidural, generally 1 to 1.25 milligram of bupivacaine is being used. Or devobupivacaine. And but if one is using the this rupivacaine, then 0.1% uh, of rupee begin is used approximately one ml. That is our one. And there are a couple of questions related to actual timing or ideal time to place the epidural catheter, which I think you have already. I think profilic epidural can be put or if when the three centimeters of dilatation is there, when the patient starts feeling pain, that is the best time to put the epidural catheter. I think that is all. I, I don't think there are any other questions. Dr. No, no further questions. Okay. Uh, then, then shall we conclude the session? Yeah. Please, ma'am. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on this and uh, best of luck to all the postgraduate. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jane, for sharing your expertise in pain with us. And Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Best of luck to all the postgraduate. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Nisha, ma'am. And it's quiz time again. I'm displaying a few questions. Please answer the questions in the chat box. These are the two questions. Okay, well, now it's time for a very brief tea break. The next session will begin sharp in the next 15 minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back, respected faculty and delegates. I now, I now invite Dr. C.K. Dua, former director, professor, and HOD, Maulana Zad Medical College, Delhi, to chair the next session. Her area of special interest is airway resuscitation, ICU, obstetric and pediatric anesthesia, teaching and training. I request you, ma'am, to kindly start the session. Uh, good morning, everybody. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. Okay. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, Dr. Mohan Deep Kaur and her team at RML Hospital to have organized such an extensive academic event for postgraduate exam going students. And I am sure it will be of great help to the postgraduate students and they will be fully satisfied once the course is finished. And I wish this course a grand success. I would also like to thank the organizers for having invited me to be part of this program. Now in this session, we have two speakers who are experts in the field of obstetric anesthesia. Our first presenter is Dr. Angelina Kumar Gupta. She is a senior consultant at the Department of Anesthesia at Sajangaram Hospital and her fields of interest are obstetric analgesia, anesthesia for obstetric and gynecological surgery, minimal invasive surgery, difficult airway management, and ambulatory surgery. Now I invite Dr. Angelina Kumar Gupta to please give her presentation. Dr. Angelina. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for, for the kind invitation. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this session. Get me the earphone, please. Morning, everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Akhilesh for inviting me for this PG assembly. I would be talking about obstetric patients for non-obstetric surgery. The overall incidence of an obstetric patient present for our non-obstetric surgery is about 2%. 42% of these patients present in the first trimester, 35% in the second trimester, and 23% present in the third trimester. The common procedures for which they are present are appendicectomy, cholecystectomy, adnexal diseases like torsion of the ovarian cyst, neoplasm, trauma, breast or cervical disease, cardiovascular or neurological emergencies, in vitro fertilization, or ex utero intrapartum therapy. Let us consider a case, a 25-year-old primary gravita who presents to us at 28 weeks of gestation with severe pain in the right iliac fossa. On examination, her pulse is 106 per minute with a blood pressure of 96 by 68 millimeters of mercury. She has rebound tenderness at the McBurney's bound. And on investigations, there is leukocytosis, TLC of 16,000, neutrophilia, neutrophil counts of 84%, CRP is raised. And also on ultrasound abdomen, there are features suggestive of acute amelocytosis. So our dilemma is, when do we do the surgery? According to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, a pregnant woman should never be denied an indicated surgery, regardless of the trimester. Since ours is an emergency surgery, so we need to proceed with precautions. However, if it was an elective case, it needs to be postponed till after delivery. If in case it's a non-urgent surgery, then it should be considered in the second trimester when the preterm contractions and spontaneous abortion are least likely, as can be evident in this chart. The elective surgery should be postponed for about six weeks postpartum till the, there is return of the normal physiological function. And in essential surgery, if there's more than minimal risk to the mother, then you should proceed with precautions, else you uh, delay the surgery into the second trimester. What is the problem in this condition? Here we are dealing with two lives. There are maternal as well as fetal concerns. 
In the maternal concern, there is the effect of the disease process. If there is an inflammation near the uterus, they can, it can lead to uterine irritability and into preterm labor. Also, if in case the patient has been vomiting, as in our case, if she has acute appendicitis, it can lead to electrolyte disbalance. Also, there are going to be anatomical and physiological changes of pregnancy under the hormonal effect of progesterone produced from the placenta from first trimester onwards. There's going to be an increase in the metabolic demands of pregnancy. There is altered drug pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. From the second trimester onwards, there are going to be mechanical effects of the enlarging uterus. Also, there are maternal factors which can lead to fetal compromise like hypotension, hypoxia, hypercarbia, etc. There is going to be effects of teratogenicity, which would depend on the exposure, dose, and duration of the drug exposure. There are effects on uteroplacental blood flow, fetal oxygenation, and there is a risk of abortion and preterm delivery. The risk of abortion is in the range of 5.8%, which increases to 10.5% in the first trimester. Looking at the physiological changes which occur during pregnancy, there's a 50% increase in the cardiac output. We know the uterine perfusion is not auto-regulated. Also, there is a decrease in the systemic venous return and the peripheral venous return and the arterial pressure decreases. So there are increased chances of hypertension under regional and general anesthesia. From 18 to 20 weeks onwards, there is going to be aortic cable compression resulting in a supine hypotension syndrome. Regarding the respiratory system, there is an increase in the minute ventilation. There's going to be a faster inhalational induction. There is a possibility of respiratory alkalosis, so one has to maintain the PCO2 at normal pre-pregnancy levels. There is also a decrease in the residual volume. The function residual capacity goes down because of the upward displacement of the diaphragm. There is an increase in the VQ mismatch and the oxygen consumption increases. All this leads to potential hypoxemia in supine and trendinen position. There is increased mucosal edema during pregnancy, which makes laryngoscopy and intubation difficult. Also, they could be bleeding during the intubation attempts. There's increase in the epidural vein engorgement. As a result, there could be a bloody tap, which is common during regional anesthesia. The epidural space volume gets decreased, so there could be extensive local anesthetic spread. It is advisable to use a lower dose. There's increased sensitivity to epidural opioids and sedatives. When we look at the hematological system, there is a 30% increase in the red cell volume. However, the plasma volume increases by 50%, which results in dilutional anemia of pregnancy. There is increase in the coagulation factors and the platelet count, which increases the chances of thromboembolic complications. There's a decrease in albumin and the colloid on cortic pressure, resulting in edema. Also, the, there is a decreased protein binding of drugs. The gastric emptying does not get uh, altered till about the onset of labor. But however, there's an increase in the intragastric pressure and the barrier pressure decreases second to a decrease in the lower esophageal sphincter tone under the effect of the progesterone. So that there's an increased chances of aspiration of gastric contents. The renal plasma flow and the glomerular filtration rate increases. So if there is a normal urea and creatinine, then it may mask the impaired renal function seen in pregnancy. Also, the maternal factors can result in fetal asphyxia. We need to avoid these. What are the effects which can occur? With maternal hypercarbia, there can be fetal respiratory acidosis. There's a vasoconstriction of the uterine artery, which causes a decrease in the uterine blood flow. Hypocarbia can result in shift of the maternal oxygen dissociation curve to the left, so that there's a decreased release of oxygen to the fetus. Hypotension can cause a decrease in the uteroplacental perfusion. Mild maternal hypoxia is well tolerated, but if it is prolonged, 
then it can lead to uteroplacental vasoconstriction, causing a decrease in the uteroplacental perfusion, resulting in fetal hypoxemia and acidosis. For whatever reason, if there is a uterine hypertosis, there could be an increase in the uterine vascular resistance and a decrease in the uterine blood flow. Now, coming to the placental transfer of drugs, that is an important issue, which depends on the lipid solubility and the protein binding. According to the uh, way the, uh, the drugs are transferred across the placenta, they are categorized into three types. Type 1 drugs are like the thiopentone, where the, there is a complete transfer of the drug, such that the concentration in the maternal blood is equivalent to that in the fetal blood. In type 2 drugs like the ketamine, the concentration in the fetal blood is much more than that in the maternal blood. And the type 3 drugs are like succinylcholine, where there is a minimal concentration in the fetal blood. When we look at this chart uh, regarding the anesthetic drugs, we find that pethidine is a drug which causes a prolonged neonatal depression because of the increased half-life of its metabolite norpethidine. Also, neostigmine can cause fetal bradycardia. So if we are giving a neostigmine, it is better to give atropine along with it to negate the effect as it crosses the placenta, while glycopyrrolate being a fully ionized quaternary ammonium compound will not cross the placenta and it will not negate the effect of uh, neostigmine, fetal bradycardia. Local anesthetics can result in iron trapping if the fetus becomes acetotic. Regarding the anesthetic agents, which we routinely use, we need to use low doses of IV induction drugs. The MAC value of the inhalational drugs decreases by about 30%. The plasma cholinesterase levels in pregnancy are decreased by 25%. However, the succinyl choline effect is not prolonged because of the increased volume of distribution, secondary to increase in the blood volume. The non-depolarizing muscle relaxants have a prolonged effect, so small doses need to be given. With regards to local anesthetics, since there is a hypoalmenia in pregnancy, there is a increased refraction, there's decreased plasma protein binding, so you need to give smaller doses. Also, there's an increased sensitivity uh, to the local anesthetics, so it can increase the chances of toxicity. We need to avoid non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs in the uh, third trimester because of the risk of premature closure of fetal ductus arteriosus. Also, if the fetal renal um, function is uh, compromised, it can result in oligohydramnios as well. There have been concerns with nitrous oxide. It is an inhibitor of methionine synthase, which affects the fetal DNA synthesis. Although there is no evidence in humans, but if it is given for more than 50% for more than 24 hours, there has been chances of congenital anomalies. So it should be preferably be avoided in the first trimester. Ketamine can cause an increase in the uterine throne and result in fetal hypoxia in uh, first two trimester, although it is considered safe in the third trimester. Again, benzodiazepines, there are concerns with cleft palate in the first trimester. A single dose, if it is given, is considered safe and non teratogenic If we talk about teratogenicity, we need to know that human embryo is most vulnerable from the 15 to 56 day of gestation. In the first two weeks, there is an all or none phenomena, which says that either the embryo is completely lost or completely preserved. From third to eighth week of gestation, the organogenesis gets affected. And beyond the eighth week, there is no organ reform abnormality, but the fetal growth retardation or functional changes are seen. There's a background incidence of congenital anomalies in humans of the range of 3%. Even the secondary physiological functions like hypoxia, uh, maternal hypotension, hypercarbia, hypocarbia, they may be teratogenic themselves. 
FD has classified the drugs into five categories. Category one being the safest. Then there is category B, C, D, and category X with the known danger. But now the new regulation requires that the label should contain a complete summary of the risks during pregnancy and lactation, and also the relevant data supporting it. So just to highlight some of the drugs with known teratogenicity, these are the ACE inhibitors, antithyroid drugs, carmamazepine, warfarin, lithium, streptomycin, etc. Now regarding the anesthetic agents, no currently used anesthetic agents have been shown to have any teratogenic effects in humans when using standard concentration at any gestational age. According to the ACOG Committee Obstetric Practice Guidelines 2017, there has been no evidence that in utero human exposure to anesthetic or a sedative drug has any effect on the developing fetal brain. And there's no animal data to support that an effect with limited exposure less than three hours duration is of any harm. So what is the anesthetic we need to give to these patients? Well, it will depend on the indication of surgery, the nature and the site of surgery. If we consider our own patient uh, who has come for appendicitis, it is a lower abdominal surgery, which can very well be done under a regional anesthesia. Then we need to ascertain what is the nature. Is it going to be an open or a laparoscopic surgery? If we, can, if we think it's an open surgery, then obviously regional anesthesia is the mode preferred anesthesia. It will minimize the fetal drug exposure. You do not need to deal with the airway. There's a decreased blood loss and overall risk to the mother and fetus is less. But however, there are certain disadvantages. In pregnancy, there could be obesity and edema, which can obscure your landmarks. Also, there is going to be hypertension. So you need to give good attention to the fluid volume and the blood pressure. On the other hand, if we consider doing a laparoscopic, the advantages, it will give us a magnifying operative field. There's going to be a minimal uterine mammary ablation, smaller incision, decreased pain, less need for analgesics, and a more rapid recovery and mobilization. But, however, there are going to be concerns with carboperitoneum. There's an increased risk of hypoxemia, hypercarbia, hypotension, which can cause a decrease in the uteroplacental perfusion. There's a potential irritation of myometrium by the electric artery. They could be uterine or fetal trauma. In both the cases, we need to, opti whether we give a general anesthetic or a regional, we need to optimize and maintain the normal maternal physiological function. The uteroplacental blood flow and oxygen delivery has to be maintained. So coming to the preoperative preparation of the patient. Apart from the regular preoperative assessment, we need to do a detailed airway assessment. We need to discuss the possibility of abortion and preterm labor. The routine investigations need to be done. We have to be aware of the specific symptoms and signs which are considered normal during pregnancy, like dyspnea, resting tachycardia, physiological murmur, edema. Also the ECG changes like the left axis deviation, premature beats, and non-specific STT wave changes. It is better to give a verbal reassurance to the patient as a part to giving the drugs, give aspiration prophylaxis, especially after the 14th week of pregnancy, preferably transport the patient in the left lateral position. You have to look at your drugs, the machine, the difficult airway cart, which is mandatory in these patients. You have to be ready with the suction and the monitors. Apart from all this, you have to take an obstetric consultation to ensure the fetal blood flow. If the time allows and you can give prophylactic glucocorticoids, it is preferable to decrease the fetal morbidity and mortality. It should be given 48, 24 to 48 hours prior to surgery between the gestation of 24 to 34 weeks, except 
when there is presence of a systemic infection like sepsis or ruptured appendix. In cases of infection, if you give glucocorticoids, then the maternal immune response will not be able to contain the infection. We should also consider uh, prophylactic tocolysis, although it is controversial with no proven benefit. But however, if there is a possibility of intraoperative uterine manipulation, like in a low abdominal or a pelvic surgery, it could be of benefit. The drugs which can be given for tocolysis being inhalational agents, magnesium sulfate, if it is being given, you have to be aware that it can increase uh, the duration of the non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. Calcium channel blockers like nifedipine, beta mimetics like terbutalin, or glycerol trinitrate. You need to put your standard monitors like pulse oximetry, non-invasive blood pressure, ECG, entitled carbon dioxide, temperature. Up, along with this, it is uh, essential to do a cardio tocography. You look at the fetal heart rate and the contractions simultaneously. It should be done before and after the surgery. Fetal heart rate uh, can be practically uh, of benefit from 18 to 22 weeks of gestation. And the fetal heart rate variability is seen from 25 fifth week. We need to be aware that our anesthetic drugs decrease the fetal heart rate and the fetal heart rate variability. So when you are interpreting the data, you need to be aware of the drugs you have administered. Apart from that, you can also do an intraoperative electronic fetal monitoring. But there are certain guidelines which should all be applicable when you are considering intraoperative fe electronic fetal monitoring. The fetus should be viable. It is physically possible to perform the uh, intraoperative electronic fetal monitoring. There should be a care for a uh, healthcare provider with obstetric surgery privileges. Whenever possible, the woman ha should have provided an informed consent that allows for emergency cesarean delivery for fetal indications. And the nature of the planned surgery will allow the safe interruption or alteration of the procedure to provide access to perform emergency delivery. Now coming to certain general anesthesia considerations. Apart from the general principles, we need to have an antibiotic with good safety profile like cephalosporins, penicillins, erythromycin, azithromycin, or um, clindamycin. Always be ready with a smaller size endotracheal tube because of the presence of a difficult airway. Avoid aortic cable compression by either uh, doing a 15 degrees left lateral tilt or placing a wedge under the right hip. A meticulous pre-oxygenation should be done with 100% oxygen for at least five minutes because in pregnancy, there's a threefold increased chances of uh, going into uh, hypoxia. Ensure a rapid sequence intravenous induction and intubation. And during this time, it is better you maintain a slight head up tilt that will increase the functional residual capacity, decrease the gastroesophageal reflux, and decrease the breast interference during intubation. Avoid lighter planes of anesthesia because it will cause a catecholamine surge, which will decrease the uteroplacental perfusion. Avoid excessive positive pressure ventilation because it can cause maternal hypotension, increase the intrathoracic pressure, and decrease the venous return. Use a positive pressure ventilation to maintain entitled carbon dioxide. During pregnancy, there's a very good correlation between entitled carbon dioxide and PaCO2. There's increased sensitivity to inhalational agents. Uh, the MAC values are slightly reduced. Up to a MAC value of 1.5, there is a dilatation of the uterine artery. But beyond that, the effect is offset by a decrease in the maternal blood pressure and decrease in the cardiac output. Always ensure lowest pressure carboperitoneum, maintaining the intra-abdominal pressures less than 12 millimeters of mercury. 
change the maternal position slowly because it is going to have a profound hemodynamic effect. In case there is a hypotension, you use liberally the IV fluids to maintain the utroplasm circulation, except if there is a presence of a cardiac or a renal disease. Vasopressors uh, like ephedrine, phenylephrine, norepinephrine, all safe and effective. Since there is a risk of thromboembolism, ensure early mobilization, maintain adequate hydration, dead stockings, car compression devices can be used, and in some cases, pharmacological subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin can be considered. Always extubate the patient in an awake condition and preferably in a lateral position. Postoperative analgesia is important because pain can itself lead to an increase in the preterm labor. Paracetamol is the analgesic of choice for mild and moderate case pain. Regional and peripheral nerve blocks will avoid the opioid-induced hypoxemia. Avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, especially after the 32 weeks. Um, as I explained, it could cause a, a premature closure of the ductus arteriosus. Just a few points uh, about if you're going for a major surgery, then it is advisable to deliver the baby by cesarean section, which can first be done under regional, and then you can convert to general anesthesia for the definitive surgery. In this case, discontinue or use small doses of inhalational agents with MAC less than 0.5 post-delivery, and you can supplement with oxytocin to minimize the risk of uterine autonomy and hemorrhage. To conclude, I would say that it has to be a multidisciplinary approach to management involving the obstetrician, surgeon, anesthesiologist, and the neonatologist. There has to be an expert management of both the surgical disease process and anesthesia. Consider regional anesthesia whenever possible. Thank you. I would, uh, if there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. Uh, thanks, Angelina. It was a very nice, clear, concise, and illuminative talk. And I think postgraduates must be having questions. Are there any questions in the chat box? Deva? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. No questions. <laughs> no question, Angelina. It's very clear. <laughs> Your talk. Okay. No one's understood anything, <laughs> or, it's, or probably I have explained it then. I would like to get some information from you since you have presented this topic. Are there any studies available in the literature regarding the long term effects of getting non obstetric surgery during the obstetric period on the neonates later in life? There are studies available where they have studied whether uh, a child is delivered by anesthesia, whether general or regional, and compared to the normal delivery, there may be some long-term effects on the neuter behavioral changes in the neonate later in life, although there are no conclusive evidence. So I would like to know whether you have come across any such uh, information regarding uh, this topic. Ma'am, there are studies where they've seen uh, the long-term effects but most of them say that uh, uh, these anesthetic agents do, do not really have a, um, any major side effects. But for neurobehavioral uh, changes, you have to really do a very long studies. And uh, most of our Indian data does not correspond to that. And moreover, it is not possible in the obstetric, obstetric patients yes, to have controlled studies. That yeah. you have the same type of anesthetic human and the obstetric obstetrician decision to have the operative surgery or same anesthesiologist. There are so many factors. Yes, ma'am. It is not possible to control. Yeah, ethically, it is very difficult to get yes. ethical approval for that. Okay. Uh, shall we conclude yeah. this talk, Deva? Yeah, there are a few questions, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay, okay. One I of the delegates asking. Yeah, one of the delegates, uh, delegate is asking the role of prophylactic corticosteroids. They are, the point they're trying to make is that 
there is a role the prophylactic corticosteroids are of great benefit to the fetus should it still be avoided in sepsis uh yes in sepsis why they ask you to avoid it because if uh, the patient is uh, in sepsis then the immune response of the mother goes down if you are giving gl glucocorticoids and the containment of the disease may become a very big issue so uh, the sepsis will become really profound so it is better to avoid in that condition but rest of the conditions yes between 24 to 34 weeks of pregnancy uh, it is advisable to gluco give the glucocorticoids just in case the pre birth uh, preterm birth occurs then also it is better for the fetal maturity of the lungs and it should be uh, given another question is ma'am why first regional and then ga for major surgery why not in a single ga both the procedures can be done see uh, whenever possible regional is the method of choice for the delivery so if it's a major surgery and uh, uh you are um, trying if there is no reason of giving a general anesthetic then preferable is to give a regional only and moreover in the major surgical procedures and it depend will depend upon the urgency of the procedure and the site of the surgery and the other in, uh, effect of the disease itself on the mother so if you give a ga if the time does not permit or there are other issues and then if you get, get the regional then it will help you in the long term post operative pain relief also and it will reduce the requirement of your general anesthetic agents also so combined uh, will help in certain situations depending upon the nature of the disease and the requirements at that time another delegate wants to know that by which trimester should the doses of inhalational and other drugs be need to be altered see inhalational drugs uh, generally if you are giving so uh, they will cause uterine dilatation to, to some extent so they are not harmful as long as you are maintaining your mac values between 0.5 to 1 it they are going to be all right another one ma'am a delegate wants to know the uh, the dose of drug which should be administered in spinal anesthesia supposing that the patient is for appendicitis for appendicectomy so he wants to have an idea that in second trimester and third trimester how much drug should be given no uh, the the dosage as such is not going to be altered if it's uh, uh, yes if it uh, you are uh, comparing the non pregnant with the pregnant state yes but in a pregnant state whatever doses like we are giving for a uh, say for uh, during pregnancy for the delivery the same sort of dose you would be giving for the spinal uh, in the third trimester another question cleared it yes ma'am another question is someone is asking what is the best time to operate in first trimester first trimester definitely you need to avoid at all cost unless it is a real emergency and then you have to make uh, the uh, the parent aware that there is a very high risk of them going into preterm labor and there are chances of abortion or even teratogenicity might occur and ma'am one person wants to know whether rsi should be done in all trimesters or only in the third trimester no uh, the rsi has to be started from 14th week onwards so in the second trimester and the third trimester it has to be done just to avoid the gastric aspiration another question ma'am is about the monitoring of fetal heart rate in abdominal surgeries during the intraoperative period they want to ask how to monitor fetal heart rate see if you are doing a uh, abdominal surgery then uh, obviously doing intraoperative uh, cardio tocography monitoring might be very difficult so it is better to do before and after the procedure and also you have to interpret the results according to the drugs which you have given intraoperatively because all these drugs they decrease the fetal heart rate and also the fetal heart rate variability goes down but if you do have the uh, uh, available obstetrician and she has given the consent the mother has given the consent that if need be you can go ahead with the surgery then yes you can do intraoperative monitoring but most of the times it is not feasible we generally do it before and after the procedure 
another person wants to know ma'am the role of nitrous oxide as they say that it's a known teratogen in the first trimester they say it, it is better if you can avoid it and more so now most of our in our practice we are using the nitrous oxide less and less um but in second and third trimester it is considered safe and also the fetal anomalies are generally bound to happen if you are giving for a very long period for uh, say more than 24 hours and that is not the case in our uh, anesthesia practice we are just limiting to the surgical duration so it it is not going to cause much harm but preferably still avoid in the first trimester right ma'am and lastly ma'am someone wants to you to comment over the dosage of uh, local anesthetics in epidural analgesia during the pregnancy yeah uh see what in our practice we do is for uh, labor analgesia uh, we uh, give a epidural preferably in some as in the previous lecture dr pradeep jain said we can use combined spinal epidural in uh, when it is really imminent otherwise we prefer giving a uh, epidural and what we practice is give a 0.1% of bupivacaine bb along with fentanyl to mix per ml and we give a bolus dose of it between 8 to 10 ml and then give a continuous infusion or a, a pca pump and ma'am someone has asked about the role of tocolytic therapy during these surgeries uh tocolytics do have a role but even our inhalational agents if we are using they would act as tocolytics but in case uh, you find that um, the, uh, the there are some evidence of patient going to mild contractions then you can even give uh, inhalational um, terbutalin or uh, uh, sinifedipine can be given or even tng can be given for that instance i guess these are all the questions ma'am okay thanks angelina very well answered questions and i'm happy that the participants have lot of questions that is very encouraging thanks angelina good luck to all the participants uh all the pros graduates and thanks one so again thank you ma'am thanks thank you now shall we move on to the second presentation deva please ma'am please ma'am okay now our the second presenter is dr savita saini she is senior professor and head at department of anesthesia pgi ms rotak and has areas of special interest at airway management obstetric and pediatric anesthesia she is a great academician and uh, i think students are going to be benefited and good morning uh, savita good morning madam and thank you very much for the kind words good morning so uh, now you may present your uh, talk shobit has to start my slides yes ma'am good morning everyone <clears throat> thank you madam i would Am like I... to thank the organizing team for making me part of this academic program coming to the topic i'm going to talk about management of obstetric emergencies obstetric emergencies are amongst the commonest of the emergency surgical procedures which we undertake every day obstetrical emergencies are life threatening medical conditions that occur in pregnancy or during or after labor and delivery these can be grouped into three major groups major obstetric hemorrhage preeclampsia and eclampsia and fetal dyspnea incidence of cesarean section is around 17% as reported by national family health survey 2015 and 16 7 to 8% of the decisions are taken after onset of labor that means the emergent indication emergency anesthesia has high maternal and child morbidity and mortality improving anesthetic care therefore is one of the key areas of action for better outcome cesarean sections formerly were classified as elective or emergency but the classification has drawback that all non elective cases were grouped under emergency indication emergency cesarean section whether or not there was an urgency of indication depending upon urgency route at all in 1997 described classification as per time available for cesarean delivery into emergencies 
when delivery is required within 15 to 20 minutes, urgent cesarean section and planned emergencies. Emergency within 15 to 20 minutes may have indications like fetal distress, abruptio placenti with viable fetus, scar dehiscence or uterine rupture, placenta previa with profuse bleeding, cord prolapse, and delivery of second pain. In urgent indications, there may be meconium staining of liquor, unfavorable fetal heart, or obstructive labor. Planned emergencies like pregnancy induced hypertension and planned elective cesarean section in labor. Leucos in 2000 described classification of cesarean into four categories depending upon the urgency available, urgency of indication or time available for uh, delivery of the fetus. So category one are those with immediate threat to life of mother or fetus. Indications for this are placental abruption, uterine rupture, acute profuse bleeding, severe fetal distress and cord collapse. Category two and three fetal distress are those with maternal uh, and fetal compromise, which is not immediately life-threatening or there is no maternal or fetal compromise, but needs urgent labor. And indications for these can be breach presentation, previous cesarean scar, non-reassuring fetal fetus. And so category four cesarean sections are those which are totally planned and at a time to suit the mother and the maternal team. So choice of anesthesia or technique of anesthesia would depend upon the time available for delivery. So with immediate threat to life of mother and fetus in category one cesarean section, usually general anesthesia is chosen. In 10 to 15 spinal anesthesia or general anesthesia, more than 20 minutes are available, even epidural can be used. Urgent cesarean sections may be associated with anesthetic and surgical complications. Anesthetic complications are like failed intubation, pulmonary aspiration, awareness during anesthesia, failed neuroaxial block or extensive neuroaxial block, and allergic reaction to multiple drugs used. Among the surgical complications, there can be hemorrhage, thromboembolism, neurotic fluid embolism, delayed extraction of fetus and the, the life of fetus, maternal collapse. So seeing all this, when obstetric emergencies are in three major groups, major obstetric hemorrhage, preeclampsia or eclampsia, and fetal distress. Coming to major obstetric hemorrhage, normally with normal delivery, the hemorrhage is a blood loss is around 500 ml. With cesarean section, it is around 1000 ml. Massive obstetric hemorrhage is defined when there is loss of more than 1500 ml during delivery, decrease in hemoglobin more than four gram percent, and transfusion requirement of more than four units. The gravid uterus receives up to 12% of the cardiac output, thus hemorrhage can rapidly become life-threatening. This can be antepartum hemorrhage and postpartum hemorrhage. Per vaginal blood loss after 20 weeks of gestation is APH, Causes are placenta previa, accreta, placental abruption, uterine rupture. In postpartum hemorrhage, the causes are uterine inversion, uterine atony, but trauma or laceration. In placenta previa, this is defined as a placenta which is implanted in lower segment of the uterus, presenting ahead of the leading pole of fetus. This can be of a variable degree, low lying, marginal, partial, or complete. Depending uh, upon this, the severity is graded from one to four. Incidence of placenta previa is around 1 in 300. Perinatal morbidity and mortality are primarily related to the complications of prematurity because hemorrhage is maternal. There are certain risk factors for a placenta previa, and these are advanced maternal age, multiparity, multi-fetal gestation, prior history of prior cesarean delivery, prior placenta previa, or history of smoking. The most characteristic feature in placenta previa is painless vaginal hemorrhage. This usually occurs near the end of or after the second trimester. The initial bleeding is never so profuse to prove fatal. However, it comes in, in repeated episodes of bleeding, which may ulti ultimately be finally very profuse. 
placenta previa may be associated with uh, other abnormalities of placenta like placenta accreta, increta, or percreta, the commonest of which is placenta accreta. For diagnosis, placenta previa or abruption should always be suspected in a woman having vaginal bleeding towards the later half of pregnancy. The possibility of placenta previa should not be dismissed until uh, proved otherwise, that is appropriate evaluation, including sonography, has clearly proven its absence. Diagnosis of placenta previa can seldom be established firmly on clinical examination, and such examination of cervix is never advocated or recommended or permitted unless woman is in operation room with all the precautions and uh, things ready for immediate cesarean delivery. Because even the gentle examination, most gentle examination of this sort can cause torrential hemorrhage. So patient should be first prepared with everything required for this kind of uh, management of bleeding. The simplest and safest method of diagnosis for placental localization is by abdominal ultras uh, ultrasonography. However, transvaginal ultrasonography is of much more uh, diagnostic accuracy. MRI can also be used for confirmation. At 18 weeks, 5 to 10% of the placenta are low lying. However, most of them migrate with development of lower segment of uterus. For managing placenta previa, patient should be admitted in hospital. No vaginal examination is permitted. Good IV access should be available. Placenta localization should be done periodically as these patients are admitted well in advance of delivery. For managing placenta previa will depend upon the degree of severity of bleeding, mild, moderate, and severe. All severe bleeding, patient should be resuscitated and subjected to cesarean section. Very mild bleeding, if gestation is more than 30, again, cesarean section should be performed, while with moderate bleeding, decision to perform cesarean section will depend upon period of gestation and stability of the mother. If uh, uh, mother and the fetus, if anything is jeopardized, then patient should be taken up for cesarean section. Anesthetic management in placenta previa involves team of anesthesia care provider well in advance of the surgery because patients are admitted well in advance. So uh, a prior examination of the airway in case emergencies general anesthesia is required and provide aspiration prophylaxis. Ask the obstetrician about previous cesarean scar on ultrasound for risk of accreta. Place two large bore IV lines and have uh, fluid warming devices available. Ensure blood is typed and cross matched. The type of anesthetic. Studies have not shown any difference uh, between general or regional anesthesia in anesthetic or operative complication. Study by Parekh et al. observed decreased estimated blood loss with regional uh, versus general anesthesia, decreased transfusion with regional anesthesia, no difference in incidence of hypotension. Now coming to placental abruption, this is defined as premature separation of normally implanted placenta. This occurs in 1 to 2 percent of all pregnancies. Perinatal mortality rate associated with placental abruption in one study has been found to be high, uh, to be very high to the tune of 120 per thousand lipers compared with 8 percent per thousand for all other causes. Abruptio placenta can produce external hemorrhage or concealed hemorrhage. These factors for abruption are hypertension, pregnancy induced or chronic, advanced age more than 35, multiparity, history of smoking or cocaine use, abdominal trauma, premature rupture of membranes, history of previous abruption. For diagnosis of abruption, vaginal bleeding with abdominal pain are the presenting symptoms. There is uterine hypertonicity, fetal distress, and retroplacental clot on ultrasound examination. For managing these patients, evaluate maternal stability as far as vital signs are concerned, coagulation studies, evaluate fetal well-being and maturity. If severe fetal distress is present and or maternal Circulatory instability is there, urgent cesarean section is required. 
if stable mother and fetus function, induction of labor and vaginal delivery may continue. For anesthesia management, ensure good IV access and availability. Regional techniques are appropriate if maternal volume status and coagulation status are normal. So basic rules are the same that there should be good volume status and hemodynamic stability and coagulation status, which is normal. So one can go ahead with regional techniques. If general anesthesia is indicated in these patients, then consider induction with etomidate or ketamine. Oxytocin should be used if, for treatment of uterine uterinary to prevent PPH. Coming to uterine rupture, this may be more common in patients who are having previous uterine surgery or abdominal trauma, uterine trauma, those who are multiparous, having large size fetus or fetal malposition, uterine abnormalities, presence of fibroid, abnormal uh, placentation and use of uterotonic drugs. Uh, diagnosis of uterine rupture is during labor, patient is in fetal distress. There is cessation of uterine contraction, vaginal bleeding and abdominal pain. So the difference between APH and other causes of vaginal bleeding, uh, abnormal vaginal bleeding, uh, would be the in placenta previa, we have painless hemorrhage while in rupture uterus and in uh, placental abrasion, it is associated with abdominal pain. Rupture uterus requires uterine repair and if not successful, then hysterectomy. Anesthetic management depends upon ease of repair, but usually general anesthesia is required after appropriate volume replacement. Coming to postpartum hemorrhage, the mean blood loss in vaginal delivery is 500 ml and 1000 ml for cesarean section. When blood loss is greater than uh, these, then it is considered as PPH. Another proposed definition of PPH is 10%, more than 10% drop in hematocrit. Causes of PPH, uterine atony, because of over distended uterus, uterine muscle exhaustion, infection, distortion of uterus by fibroid detractor, retained products of conception and genital tract trauma. Clinical findings in postpartum hemorrhage are related to degree of shock, which is related to amount of blood loss. If, because these patients are young, and in good health, they compensate well for initial uh, small degree of blood loss. And they exhibit no changes in blood pressure and symptoms and signs may be only just a tachycardia or palpitation. When there is mild degree of shock because of the blood loss, which is between 1000 to 1500 ml, there is slight fall of blood pressure and patient may exhibit weakness, sweating and tachycardia. With moderate degree of blood loss, 1,500 to 2,000 ml, that is 25 to 35% of the volume is lost. There is marked fall in blood pressure, 70 to 80 millimeters of mercury. Patient may exhibit restlessness, paler, and oliguria. In severe loss, when it is more than 2,000 to 3,000 ml of loss, or up to 45% of volume is lost, there is profound fall of blood pressure, 50 to 70 millimeters of mercury. Patient may collapse, show air hunger, and anuria. For management, although many, uh, although women can experience PPH, the presence of risk factors make it more likely. For women with such risk factors, consideration should be given to extra precautions such as IV access, coagulation studies, cross matching of blood, anesthesia backup, and referral to tertiary care hospital. The first step in management of PPH is by manual uterine massage. Patient should be moved to OT. Bimanual uterine compression and massage should continue. Infusion of oxytocic drugs. Evaluation for retained placenta. Use of other oxytocic drugs. Resuscitation should be continued. Large bore IV cannula should be inserted. There should be monitoring monitor attached and fluid warming devices should be attached. Analgesia may be provided to the patient by existing epidural or use of ketamine. And if some surgical procedure is required, the general anesthesia should be given. The various oxytocin drugs which are used are oxytocin, 
methogen and prostaglandin F2 alpha. However, one should be uh, well aware about the side effects which they can have, like vasodilatation with uh, oxytocin, diffused vasoconstriction and pulmonary hypertension, and coronary vasospasm with methogen and bronchospasm with prostaglandin F2 alpha. <clears throat> Preventive measures for major obstetric hemorrhage. Avoid prolonged labor. Decrease trauma during assisted vaginal delivery. Detect and treat anemia during pregnancy. Antenatal ultrasound for placenta previa. MRI for placenta accreta and percreta. Active management of third stage of labor by cord, cord clamping and uterotonics. Meos is modified early obstetric warning system, which is a useful tool to predict morbidity and includes signs like tachycardia, hypotension, decreased urine output, pallor, lower abdominal pain, and cold peripheries. So this patient should be monitored for all these. And if these are there, then morbidity can be predicted. Rule of 30 is also useful. That is a drop in systolic blood pressure by 30%, increase in heart rate by 30%, increase in respiratory rate to more than 30 per minute, hematocrit drop by 30%, and urine output less than 30 ml per hour. These indicate patient likely to have lost 30% of the blood volume. So these major obstetric hemorrhage could be anticipated or unanticipated. For anticipated, we have causes low-lying placenta, placenta previa, an accreta, low-lying placenta, and uterine scar. For these, one must have two large bore IV cannulas, cross-matched blood, rapid infuser devices, blood warming devices, invasive monitoring, cell salvage technique can be used, consider interventional radiological procedures. For unanticipated, Bonar five-step plan has been Describe, organize multidisciplinary team approach, rapid restoration of blood volume, correction of defective coagulation, evaluate response to treatment, and treat underlying cause of bleeding. Allocate roles to team members, alert blood transfusion services, ensure type specific or O negative blood two to four units, assess ABC as per, that is airway breathing circulation as per ALS guidelines. Attach monitoring devices, ECG, BP, SpO2, and temperature. Provide oxygen to the patient by high flow uh, mask, high flow. Head down tilt to increase venous return. Intravenous access with two large bore cannula. And this uh, will be repeated time and again in management of obstetric patient that two large bore cannula should be in place for managing any untoward eventuality. Put in urinary catheter, consider central line and arterial cannulation for invasive blood pressure and blood gas analysis sampling. Fluid resuscitation um, using warm crystalloids, colloids, and blood. Avoid hypothermia as it impairs coagulation. Coagulopathy can occur in obstetrics, which may be dilutional, consumption, DIC, and because of increased fibrinolysis. Causes are abruptia, placenta, preeclampsia, bleeding disorders. Fibrinogen levels less than 2 gram per liter indicate severe PPH. Risk is there. Viscoelastic method for test of coagulation are useful like rotational thromboelastometry and thromboelastography, which monitor whole blood coagulation, clot strength, stability, and lysis. Protocol for managing major PPH. There are four components. Communication with the team members, adequate resuscitation of the patient, monitoring the investigations, and arrest of bleeding. Arrest of bleeding may require surgical procedures. The cornerstone during management of PPH are restoration of blood volume and oxygen carrying capacity. Second sample, uh, send the samples and arrange for four units of blood. Transfusion of blood and blood products. British Committee for Standards and Hematology aim to maintain hemoglobin more than 8 gram per cent, platelet more than 75,000, prothrombin time and activated PT less than 1.5 of mean control, and fibrinogen level more than one gram percent. 
transfusion protocol includes shock giving of shock which are giving of shock packs as red cells ffp and platelet in ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1 or in red cell ffp in ratio of 1 is to 2 even have been advocated advantages of these are to decrease mortality and multi system organ failure while disadvantages is transfusion associated acute lung injury circulatory overload cryoprecipitate contains fibrinogen 10 times than the ffp to raise fibrinogen level by 1 gram per liter it need 30 ml of ffp while 3 ml of cryoprecipitate so circulatory overload is avoided fibrinogen concentrate is also available as powder at room temperature which is, there is no need to thaw or blood typing other measures which should be utilized are intraoperative cell salvage techniques as adjuncts, which provides only RBCs. A recombinant activated factor 7 controversy in its use, but may, and may result in thrombotic complication. Tranexamic acid is a drug shown to decrease bleeding and transfusion requirement in non obstetric settings. However, role in obstetrics still under review, most beneficial in increased is settings of increased fibrinolysis. Invasive management of PPH, intrauterine balloon tamponet, uterine compression sutures, interventional radiological procedures like angiographic arterial embolization, uterine and ovarian artery embolization. Surgical ligation of uterine, ovarian and iliac, uh, internal iliac artery and these should be tried before embarking upon hysterectomy as a definite treatment for PPH, the incidence of which is 0.8 per 1,000 deliveries. Choice of anesthesia technique depends upon the indication and urgency of delivery, maternal hemodynamics and coagulation status. As we have already seen with this table, the category one usually requires general anesthesia, two and three can be done under spinal anesthesia. Coming to hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, these are grouped under preeclampsia and eclampsia with elevation of blood pressure, proteinuria, with or without edema, and with uh, precipitation of seizures, become, um, culminating it into eclampsia. Risk factors like obesity, chronic hypertension, diabetes, collagen vascular disease, increased circulating testosterone, previous preeclampsia may be there. Pregnancy, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are multi-organ system involving disorders, so they can result in complications related to all the organ systems like neurological in the form of headache, visual disturbances, seizures, intracranial, hemorrhage and cerebral edema. In pulmonary, there can be upper airway edema and pulmonary edema, cardiovascular. There is decreased intravascular volume, increased arterial resistance, hypertension and heart failure. There may be impaired hepatic function, impaired renal function, hematological abnormalities, microangiopathic hemolysis. There is thrombocytopenia and platelet dysfunction. And severest form of PIH is HELP syndrome which is defined by all the three criteria, presence of hemolysis, elevated liver enzyme, and low platelet are uh, found in this. The causes, exact etiology is unknown. However, widespread endothelial dysfunction leads to placental ischemia and multi-organ dysfunction. Synthesis of many substances like nitric oxide and PGI2 which are vasodilators may be decreased in preeclamptic patient, which leads to smooth muscle reactivity and platelet addition. Definitive treatment of preeclampsia is delivery. Whether or not to deliver the fetus would depend upon the gestational age and maternal and fetal condition severity of preeclampsia. If patient near term should be delivered, if remote from term, conservative approaches to be applied till the time mother and fetus are fine. Delivery at any gestational age should be considered if there is maternal end organ dysfunction or non-reassuring fetal well-being. 
These patients are put on drug therapy of antihypertensive and anticonvulsant the, in the form of methyl dopa, labetalol, nifedipine, and anticonvulsant of choices, magnesium sulfate in pregnancy induced hypertension patients. It is given in the dose of IV bolus 4 to 6 grams and then infusion of 1 to 2 grams per hour to keep serum magnesium in therapeutic range of 2 to 3 millimole per liter. However, it has a narrow therapeutic uh, margin, so one should keep a close watch on magnesium sulfate toxicity, which ensues in the form of ECG changes, loss of deep tendon reflexes, respiratory depression, cardiac arrest, depending upon increasing levels of um, serum magnesium. Anesthetic considerations in these patients, proper pre-anesthetic assessment, fluid balance and hemodynamics, hypoalbuminemia, increased capillary permeability and increased hydrostatic pressure leads to risk of pulmonary and pharyngolaryngeal edema. Estimation of cardiac output is required if there is oliguria, pulmonary edema, hypertension resistant to usual antihypertensive therapy. Coagulation assessment of coagulation um, status is essential before giving regional anesthesia in these patients. Anesthesia for cesarean section in eclampsia, regional versus GA controversy, avoidance of hypertensive risk. GA is, when regional uh, is utilized, there is avoidance of hypertensive response to laryngoscopy, which is exaggerated in preeclamptic patients. There is blunting of neuroendocrine response to surgery and there is prevention of transient neonatal depression associated with general anesthesia. While guidelines for use of regional anesthesia versus general are same as in patients with severe eclampsia, patient con present consensus on use of regional anesthesia is that if platelet counts are more than 80 to 100,000, it is usually safe for the patient to receive regionals. The ABCD of seizure control should be remembered as airway, breathing, circulation, and control of BP with drugs. Epidural analgesia. Early citation of epidural is an ideal form of pain relief in preeclamptic patients. It helps to control exaggerated hypertensive response to pain and can improve placental blood flow. A functional epidural may be utilized for cesarean section. Advantages of spinal versus epidural are quick, are in onset and more reliable uh, in its effect. There is less potential trauma in the epidural space. Disadvantages, theoretical risk of more abrupt hypotension in a patient who may be relatively hypovolemic and with a fetus who may be compromised by placental insufficiency. Alternatively, combined spinal and epidural can be used. Small dose of local anesthetic in spinal anesthesia and option of utilizing the epidural as necessary. There is a term rapid sequence spinal anesthesia, which is used to emphasize the idea of performing spinal with bare essentials and limiting the number of attempts at insertion. The drug of choice would be 0.5% bupivacaine heavy and adjuvants like fentanyl may be added. The sequence in a rapid sequence spinal that the mm, minimum time is wasted. Deploy other stuff to secure intravenous line. Pre-oxygenate during the attempt. No touch technique should be used. Use only gloves, chlorex, and swab to paint and use glove mm, packet as a sterile surface. Local injection is not mandatory. Add 25 microgram fentanyl if time permits. If not, then consider increasing the dose of bupivacaine. Only one attempt at spinal, unless obvious correction allows a second successful attempt. Start surgery once sensory level is more than T10 and ascending. Be ready for general anesthesia at any time and inform this to the mother in advance. Now, when we come to general anesthesia, because widely regional anesthesia is practiced, more so the spinal anesthesia for obstetric patients. So the practice of general anesthesia is much less in the clinicians who are giving um, inclinations for obstetric patient. So one has to be really careful. General anesthesia, when it is necessary, the main concerns are mucosal edema of upper airway, severe hypertensive response to laryngoscopy and uh, intubation. Patients on magnesium sulfate may be very sensitive to the effects of non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. Difficult obstetric intubation trolley should always be kept ready. 
for GA prophylaxis against acid aspiration using pentaprazole, metoclopramide, and sodium citrate, which is non particulate antacid, uh, should be used for its instantaneous action. Patient position to prevent neonatal depression, induction of anesthesia is carried out after the patient is catheterized, abdomen is draped, and surgeons are scrubbed. Left lateral tilt is given to avoid aortic aval compression. A 30 degree head up tilt is useful in improving maternal well being because of an increased FRC and reduced gastroesophageal reflux. This also will cause reduced breast interference to the intubation. As FRC is reduced to 40% uh, at term gestation and oxygen consumption is increased by 20%, oxygen reserves get rapidly depleted. Pre-oxygenation with 100% oxygen using tight-fitting face mask by tidal volume breathing for three minutes or four to eight vital capacity breaths are important. Para-oxygenation by high-flow nasal cannula should be given to the patients. Intravenous induction rapid sequence techniques is preferred for induction of general anesthesia using cricoid pressure. When general anesthesia is given, tracheal intubation is the choice. Availability of video laryngoscopes to improve chance of success. Supraglottic devices come as rescue devices. Second generation supraglottic airway devices with gastric channel are to be preferred. Monitoring of antidal carbon dioxide is as per as ASA standards. Isofluorine, sevoflurane with antidal monitoring are the agents which, which should be used. Nitrous oxide can be used. Opioid analysis should be given after delivery of baby. Coming to the last, fetal distress is defined as depletion of oxygen and accumulation of acid uh, because of carbon dioxide and leading to the state of hypoxia and acidosis in the intrauterine life. The causes of fetal distress during labor may be umbilical cord compression, prolapse, and uteroplacental insufficiency. At delivery, there may be shoulder dystocia. For managing fetal distress, change maternal position to left lateral tilt, administer supplemental oxygen, maintain and improve maternal circulation, give a tocolytic for hypertonicity, and delivery should be hastened by forceps or by cesarean. So seeing all this discussion, again, we come back to the uh, indication or category of cesarean section. All category one cesarean section, general anesthesia. Category two and three can be given spinal or general anything which suits the patient that, as per hemodynamic status. To summarize, anesthesia team is integral part of care team for obstetric emergencies. Management of obstetric emergencies involve rapid resuscitation and improved tissue oxygen delivery. Rapid delivery of fetus is a goal in category one of cesarean section, rapid maternal stabilization and in utero fetal resuscitation should be continued. A quick pre-op assessment of medical history, fasting status, risk of difficult airway, risk of aspiration and obstetric hemorrhage should be done. Preoperative preparation for acid aspiration prophylaxis, difficult airway, and blood grouping and cross matching is required. Preop oxygenation and rapid sequence general anesthesia with intubation is choice in hemodynamically unstable patients. Otherwise, spinal anesthesia is choice. Choice of anesthesia ultimately depends on indication and urgency for delivery. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Savita, it was an excellent presentation, very extensive topic, and you have finished it in time, covering all the important issues which are involved, because it is not uh, easy to go into, cover so much of topics in a single presentation. And do we have some questions in the chat box? Yes, ma'am, there are many questions. Okay, so let us start with the questions. Akhilesh? Sir, please unmute yourself. Yeah, there is one question. What if bleeding not getting controlled in patient under GA? How to proceed with profuse bleeding on table as per anesthesia point of view? Patient has to be volume resuscitated 
as we uh, do for any other major hemorrhagic surgeries, instituting central line uh, that we have already done, prepared in these patients, then use of blood and blood products, which uh, uh, it is indicated that you use in one is to one is to one uh, ratio, mainly for FFP and for uh, whole uh, the packed cells. That is what is to be given. And uh, these days they also advocate if uh, uh, really uh, fibrinogen is required. I mean, the coagulation studies are, have to be done simultaneously. If available, if available then uh, thromboelastography is a best guide these days, but it is not available at every place. But then one can go ahead with cryoprecipitate and other uh, fibrinogen replacement uh, agents. Yeah, I mean, continuity. From the anesthesia point of view, one more, the drugs they might be giving, like tranexamic acid I have mentioned, and the other procedures which, is to, uh, which are done by the surgeons. Like they can uh, continue doing those and before embarking upon hysterectomy, it is suggested that one should try to do interventional radiological procedures. So they should be uh, well prepared well in advance. Then intraoperative cell salvage, of course, can be used in these patients. Uh, Ma'am, in continuity to that, uh, one question has asked by the PG student. Uh, in acute hemorrhage, my consultants told blood transfusion to be avoided till the cause of bleeding is controlled. Uh, till then, they try to maintain BP with fluids and vasopressors. Is it so? Uh, maybe in the only in the initial part, one has to go see for the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. If there is very little oxygen carrying capacity, it is not going to be very helpful. We only do, the, we uh, suggest these things so that the whatever blood is being transfused is not getting wasted into the hemorrhage. But obviously one has to maintain the tissue oxygen delivery at every cost. Uh, if we are suspecting placenta previa, should we go for TBS? Should we go for? TBS, transvaginal sonography. I think that doesn't... Uh, actually not. They say uh, these things can be diagnosed by abdominal uh, uh, ultrasound only, but that would be the decision of the obstetrician. Okay, ma'am. Uh, because in placenta previa, it is very much advocated. Even the gentlest examination should be done inside the OT rather than in anywhere else, where the preparations for cesarean section and immediate anesthesia and surgery are available. Uh, shall I? Shall I? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, can I comment on this? Uh, Dr. Savita is uh, right that uh, sonography at that stage may not be possible. But in the present day obstetric management, previously people were not undergoing ultrasound so frequently to know the status of the placenta and the fetus. Now the ultrasonography is being done as a routine and in certain situations it may be possible to diagnose placenta previa even before the hemorrhage occurs. But usually it may not be there. So during at a time when the patient is bleeding, at that time sonography is not uh, maybe of, it will not be of that great help, rather than being prepared for two in one procedure in the operation theater. Uh, thank you, madam. You're right, but uh, what the uh, the question was whether transvaginal examination uh, should be uh, encouraged in these patients. Okay. Okay, ma'am, we move to the next question. Uh, what is the role of cricoid pressure and small tidal volume breaths in current scenario during RSI? See, there is a lot of controversy on use of cricoid. So if we go into that, the entire full one lecture would be required. That's the reason I have not included that, uh, that into presentation. And it is mainly the conventional recommendation. Yes, you should uh, apply uh, cricoid pressure as far as PG teaching goes these, uh, up to these days. However, evidences are coming that it may not be really useful. And sometimes it may cause distortion of esophagus and maybe more harmful. So that uh, still is not, the issue is not resolved yet. So man, we can uh, give it a point that yes, cricoid pressure should be applied. And uh, if they are not applying then in my institute as an institutional protocol, we are not applying it. Okay. So that may be institutional protocols coming up or the further evidences are uh, being reported on which the guidelines can come for this. Okay, ma'am. Uh, I think ma we are done with the questions. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Akhilesh. Thank you, Madam Dua. It was a real pleasure to have you as chairperson in the session. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks, Akhilesh. Thanks, Savita. It's so nice to see you after a long time.
yeah thank you <laughs> because of the covid we are unable to yeah yeah so more than a happens. year now more than yeah. a year now the thank you to include me that in is. this and be part of this participation yeah. thank you everyone and best of luck and best wishes to the exam going post graduate students i'm sure they will all do very well thank you everyone and my many thanks to the team of rml including uh, madam and dr akilesh and everyone who so ever has worked so hard really good academic program thank you uh, i like to announce winners of stimpe winners of quiz of uh, yesterday uh, roshan uh, dr roshan from rml hospital and dr chanchal so they will be given the fee refund of 2000 rupees it will be credited in their bank and uh, regarding the results of this uh, quiz uh, the winners are dr surbhi sharma dr sarita dr sheetal and dr lopa mundra so they will be given the food vouchers thank you over to dr devang thank you sir and thank you ma'am this was a very comprehensive overview now we'll move on to our next session which is the case presentation on the topic of pregnant patient with preeclampsia for emergency lscs the external examiner for this case is dr maitri pandey she is director professor in hod lady harding medical college new delhi internal examiner is dr shubhi singhan assistant professor abvims in dr rml hospital and the case will be presented by dr prashant a third year post graduate student over to maitri ma'am Good morning, dear students. Uh, are you awake? Mm. I know it's uh, slowly getting to the, but bear with me for one more, one more hour. So over to Prashant. Please present the case. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, a very good evening to all my faculty members and my delegates. Today I'm going. Am I audible? Hello. am i audible yes you are audible prashant okay please start the case okay a very good good morning to all my respected faculty members and delegates today i am going to present a case of nisha 33 year old female resident of kirti nagar teacher by occupation who is primary gravida came to the medical casualty of dr rml hospital with the complaints of amenorrhea since 8 and 1/2 months headache and abdominal pain from last two days history of present illness patient was apparently well two days back men but from last two days patient had developed complaint of headache which was sudden in onset throbbing like sensation severe in intensity localized to bilateral frontal areas it was not referring to any other side non pulsatile in nature it was slightly relieved by rest and not relieved by analgesic patient said it was aggravated by exertion it was no history it had no history of difficulty of speech or any uh, limb muscle weakness also no history of any abnormal body movements few hours after the onset of headache patient also experienced abdominal pain which was sudden in onset dull constant aching in nature progressively increasing intensity it was initially started in right upper side of abdomen and not referring to any side it has no any aggravating or relieving factors also patient had no history of blurring of vision nausea vomiting perovaginal bleed or leaking no history of fever yellow discoloration of sclera skin or urine and no history of pruritus as well patient had no history of decreased urine output or pedal edema no history of difficulty in uh, breathing or cough present patient also gave a history of elevated bp recording at the time of presentation and multiple times later and started on some bp lowering tablets later patient was admitted to obstetric ward for further management on her obstetric history her lmp was 5th of may 2020 just and... yes ma'am Prashant, 
can I ask you some questions? Yes, ma'am. So, why did you take history of blurring of vision and abnormal body movements or any problem with speech and cough? Ma'am, because this present a patient who was previously normal, who, who came to with complaints of abdominal pain and uh, headache, which was uh, suspected, or, and she was in uh, 35th week of pregnancy, had suspected of elevated blood pressures. So it can be a, a elevated blood pressure, which can be associated with C CNS symptoms, which are which include visual deficits such as blurring of vision, and patient may also have. Because of increase in uh, CNS symptom, patient may have nausea, vomiting. So I took a history of a headache. Okay. And uh, why did you take history of cough? Ma'am, the history of cough is particularly important because, because of hypertension, patient may have uh, onset of pulmonary dysfunction or it can be a pulmonary edema. In that case, patient may have dyspnea or cough. You continue, Prashant. Okay, ma'am. On her obstetric history, her LMP was 5th of May 2020. Her expected date of delivery was 12th of February 2021. Present pregnancy. Uh, in first trimester, she presented herself to a doctor after 15 days of her missed periods. No history of excessive nausea or vomiting. No history of fever or rashes. Her pregnancy was confirmed by urine dipstick test and ultrasound. She complained of tiredness and increased frequency of maturation during first trimester. No history of PV bleeding. Her BP was normal. She was advised for tablet folic acid 0.5 mg once a daily. She was following regular ANC visit checkup during, our, uh, during first trimester. In second trimester, she observed fetal movements around five, fifth month of pregnancy. Her second ANC visit was at 16th week when she was advised on tablet ferrous sulfate 100 mg and tab tablet calcium glucose 500 mg twice a day. And she was compliant to the treatment. Second ultrasound was done at 20 week of gestation, which was normal. No history of excessive weight gain and her BP or blood sugar was normal during the examination. In third trimester, fetal movements were well felt. She received tetanus immunization as per schedule. No history of leaking or bleeding per vaginum. Her BP and blood glucose level were normal till she presented to the hospital. And patient had no previous history of pain abdomen. On menstrual history, she uh, attained Minak at 13 years of age and her menstrual cycle were normal with no history of any menstrual irregularities. On past history, patient had no history of previous diabetes mellitus hypertension or chronic renal disease and patient had no history of any seizure disorder or any type of particular headache. On personal history, patient belongs to middle class family according to modified Kupuswami scale. Patient is married since two years. Patient is non-alcoholic, non-smoker, no history of any Prashant, substance. Prashant, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Prashant, so what is Kupuswami scale? What is what you do in Kupu Swami scale? Kupu Just Swami, in brief, yes, what things you see? In modified Kupu Swami scale, we see the three parameters. It consists of occupation, profession, uh, education, and the head of the total uh, income of the uh, income of the total family. In a original uh, Kupu Swami scale, it was just had a income of head of the family, but in according to the new criteria. And it is used for the... Uh, it is per uh, capita divide, uh, Okay, per capita continue. In... Continue. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. On family history, no history of diabetes, hypertension, TB, asthma, or malignancy. No history of multifetal gestation in family. No history of pregnancy-induced hypertension, gestational diabetes mellitus, or hypothyroidism in family. Treatment history. She was on a regular supplementation tab of tablet folic acid since eight months and iron and calcium tablets since five months. From last two days, she was started on tablet labitolol 300 milligram three, three times a daily, along with four hour, uh, hourly BP monitoring. 
from last 24 hours she was started on injection magnesium sulfate 4 gram iv over 15 minutes followed by 5 gram intramuscular in each buttock and maintenance of 5 gram intramuscular in alternate buttock 4 hourly was given patient had no history of any known drug allergy no history of any anesthetic drug exposure or any surgical intervention in the past and patient had no history of transfusion as well on physical examination that's all for the, just a minute prashant yes, is this all for history yes ma'am so what is your provisional diagnosis diagnosis based on the history ma'am um, based what on what do you history, think the patient has ma'am based on the history my diagnosis will be a 33 year old female primary gravida likely to have a gestational hypertension or or it can be a uh, ma'am uh, Uh, it can be because essential uh, or more likely or likely or have uh, preeclampsia can it be preeclampsia uh, ma'am based yes. on the she clinical can be having preeclampsia with severe yes ma'am she is giving history of headache right upper quadrant this is the clinical picture yes ma'am okay Now mm-hmm. you proceed for the examination. On physical phys- examination. On physical examination, patient was conscious, oriented to time, place, and person, lying comfortably on a bed uh, in left lateral position. She was having average build and with good nutritional status. And patient's height was one fifty five centimeter and weight sixty six kg. Her oral hygiene was good. Pallor, cyanosis, ectorus was absent. No clubbing or lymphadenopathy was seen. Bilateral pedal edema was present, which was mild pitting in nature. Neck veins were not dilated. No thyroid enlargement. On face, it was having uh, uh, plasma gravidarum. Neck, her neck motion was full neck of motion and no lymph node enlargement. On vital parameters. patient was having temperature of 36.9 degree temp uh, degree celsius which was technically o- oral temperature her pulse rate was 84 per minute symmetrical regular having normal volume and no radio radial or radio femoral delay her respiratory rate was 16 per minute which was regular and having thoraco abdominal pattern of breathing her bp at the time of examination was 166 by 94 mm of hg on right arm and it was taken in a sitting position on airway and spinal examination on visual examination no facial deformity was seen her mouth opening was 5 cm modified malum patti grading was 2 thyromental distance was 6.5 cm and sternomental distance of 13 cm neck range of motion was full her neck sum circumference was 38 cm at the level of thyroid cartilage and on systemic examination after taking consent from the patient and in presence of female attendant systemic examination was started and patient was exposed from middle to mid thigh level on abdominal examination uh, on inspection abdomen was distended all quadrants were moving uh, moving well with the respiration no dilated veins or scar marks everted umbilicus seen all hernia sites are were free on cuffing striagramidarum and linea nigra were seen on palpation it was normal local temperature and right upper quadrant tenderness was palpit uh, was observed on grips examination her fundal height was corresponding to 36 weeks of gestation on fundal grip examination yes, prashant how will you what is the landmark for 36 weeks gestation Ma'am. How will you know that it is thirty-six weeks or thirty-eight weeks yes, or twenty weeks? Yes, hmm. ma'am. Landmark for the gestation it depends on the fundal grip examination. And in the fundal grip examination, when uh, 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 fundal height starts to increase more than twelve weeks, first it is palpated at the level of pubic symphysis. Then at the level of umbilicus, it is twenty-four. And then uh, from the pubic symphysis to pubic um, uh, uh, pubic symphysis to the umbilicus, it is divided into two equal parts, and that will correspond to the sixteen week, twenty week, and at the umbilicus twenty four week. Then above that, 
there will be then we have to de- uh, at the level of zipoid process first at the uh, 36 week of gestation it will be just below the zipoid process then again from the pub uh, umbilicus to the zipoid process again we divide it into two equal parts and that will be corresponding to the 30 week 30 uh, 32 weeks and then 36 weeks uh, at the 36 weeks it reaches to the uh, p- level of pubic symphysis but after fetal engagement it comes little bit down so at the uh, from the uh, from the 36 weeks again it comes little bit normal to the zipoid process below the zipoid down process comes to the level of 32 weeks when the patient is 40 weeks Yes, yes, okay. ma'am. Because of the fetal engagement of head. Fetal engagement. So, is there any condition in which fetal uh, in forty weeks also it is at the level of thirty-six weeks? Ma'am, it is the condition when uh, there are differential diagnoses. One, the engagement is not there, or it can be a polyhydramnios will be there, or it will be a multiple pregnancies will be there. In that case, there will be a uterine distension will be there. So oh, anything for this uterine large baby breach? Yes, yeah. yes, ma'am. Large baby breach. Anything which is associated with the enla- uterine enlargement, we have to think about that. Okay. Thank you. Proceed. Okay. On fundal grip examination, hard, round, globular mass were felt. It was suggestive of head. On right lateral grip examination, multiple knobby structures on right side. It was suggestive of limbs. on left lateral grips smooth curved structure on left sides it was suggestive of back on pelvic grip soft broad regular mass were felt suggestive of breach a breach during all grips examination uterus was relaxed and no tenderness was seen on auscultation fetal heart sound were felt at the left spino umbilical line and it was 140 per minute on respiratory system examination patient was inspect uh, on inspection thoraco abdominal pattern of breathing was seen normal shape size symmetry of the chest centrally placed trachea no audible wheeze or stridor was seen no di- visible dilation of veins swelling or supraclavicular bulge on palpation trachea was midline on auscultation vesicular breath sounds were present bilaterally and no added sounds her vocal resonance was normal on cardiovascular system examination uh, her chest was normal in size shape size and symmetry precordium normal in shape apical impulse was not appreciated uh, no engorgement of superficial veins on palpation apex beat was present at fourth intercostal place just lateral to left mid clavicular line no parasternal heave was seen on auscultation normal s1 and s2 were present and s1 as loud at mitral area her rate was 84 per minute regular and no miss beats just no plural... just a minute prashant uh, yes ma'am what are the other uh, changes which can occur in pregnancy regarding cardiovascular examination ma'am in cardiovascular examination you said examin- that uh, during uh, during auscultation what uh, else can you find and it is a normal finding Yes, ma'am. Uh, during cardiovascular examination, due to in uh, due to uh, increase in the uh, uterus, it causes displacement of heart little bit upward and leftward. That's so, all right. Have you have said so? Huh? Yes. Second, due to physiological okay. changes, there is increase in the plasma volume. So it causes increase in the blood volume and it causes flow murmurs, which can be heard at the, and which uh, which yes. is considered as normal, ma'am. So where will you hear it most commonly? Flow murmurs. Where will most you hear it? Most commonly at the level of mitral area because of increase in blood because volume. Right so right. increase in blood volume. Okay. It is on the right parasternal. Okay. Fourth or okay, fifth intercostal space. Okay. Okay, ma'am. And you can also have a S two loud and wide splitting can be there. in the pulmonary yes, area at the level of p2 at okay. the p2 area ma'am p2 area okay so these may be so how will you say that this uh, if there is a murmur what kind of murmur will it will it be if there is a flow murmur which type of murmur will it be ma'am uh, it will be uh, at the level of p2 area it will be uh, systolic uh, ejection murmur because of increase in the blood volume 
ट्राइकस्पिड एरिया में होगा बेटा पहले ना मोस्ट कॉमनली इन द ट्राइकस्पिड एरिया कैन बी हर्ड इन दिटिक एरिया सो इट विल बी इजेशन सिस्टोलिक मरमर एंड ग्रेड क्या होगा मरमर का वट विल बी द ग्रेड ऑफ मरमर Ma'am, it will, it be... will be not be not be more than two, grade two. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any murmur which is more than grade two, any systolic murmur more than grade two, ejection systolic murmur, or any diastolic murmur, maybe because will be because of any organic cause, any cardiac disease in pregnancy. Okay. Yes, ma'am. On on central nervous examination, uh, her higher functional status was normal. On cranial nerve examination. it was uh, not uh, within normal limits her bilateral pupils were normally in size and reactive to the light no sensory or motor deficit were seen on reflexes bilateral upper limb and lower limb dig tendon reflexes were normal on examination of back what do you can just a minute what do the deep tendon why do you want to do the deep tendon reflex you don't yes, do in other patients no yes ma'am really you don't do in other patients why are you doing deep tendon reflexes Ma'am, because in a, a patient with the preeclampsia, there is suspected of the CNS involvement, and so it can manifested as the CNS uh, because of there is increase in intracranial pressure. First, we have to see the patient clinically, which may have patient have altered mental status, patient may have headache, patient have nausea, vomiting, and hyperreflexia. It is more suggestive of a pre, um, uh, signs of impending eclampsia. So, if there is a hyperreflexia is present, then we can assume that uh, he, it she severe, uh, so, um, which features of severe preeclampsia. So, what will you do, ma'am? If the patient is having hyperreflexia, sorry, ma'am. Okay. What oh. other what other things can uh, DTR tell you? Deep tendon reflex. Uh, ma'am, uh, deep tendon. You tendon said one thing that patients are starting bad. You know, you said that patient treatment history. Me, you said that patient. Second thing, my so patient. You are examining that patient only, right? No? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Second thing. What treatment was given? What treatment was given? Yes, ma'am. Second. The Sec casualty. So, uh, second thing was patient had started on the uh, uh, magnesium sulfate therapy so also in that case we have to see the signs of uh, signs of overt magnesium toxicity in which uh, we have to check the deep tendon reflexes and most commonly it is checked at the level of knee level patella reflexes are seen so what other things will you check for uh, magnesium toxicity Ma'am, for the uh, magnesium What toxicity. Yes, ma'am. For the magnesium toxicity, we have to first check the patient clinically. In a clinical symptoms, patient may have uh, excessive uh, uh, respiratory depression. Patient may have dizziness, or patient may have hypotension. On uh, when we go uh, apart from the clinical system, we have to check the patient for the reflexes. In the reflexes examination, we check the uh, bilateral uh, patella reflexes. <laughs> Patient just bit about the bush. You have to check three things. You you have to see for respiratory depression. Urine. You out. have to see for the urine output and mm. deep tendon reflexes. Yes, ma'am. ठीक है यही तीन चीजें देखते हैं. Yes, ma'am. जब patient management तो होता है. ठीक है. Yes, ma'am. Okay, continue. Hmm. On examination of continue. back, apart from exaggerated lumbar lordosis, mild pitting sacral edema were present. and all other findings were normal so uh, summary of my case would be 33 years so as a anesthetic what will you see in the back question just a minute as an anesthetic what will you examine the back for you are not a gynecologist you know as an anesthetic ma'am back mein aur kya dekhoge Ma'am, first of all, we have to do a visual examination. On visual examination, we should look for. नहीं है एक ही चीज़ और देखना चाहते हो. Yes, बोलो. Any signs of infection is there or not? So we can uh, contraindicate. मतलब any signs for the neuroaxial anesthesia contraindication is there? Local site infection or is there or not? Or any uh, spine deformity is there or not? So we have oh, to check. You will palpate the spines or not? Okay, you will palpate yeah. the spines and see whether the spaces are hmm. adequate or not. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, चलो. 
so summary of my case would be a 33 year old female prime gravida with 36 week of gestation present to a casualty with a sudden onset of headache and abdominal pain since 2 days on examination found that patient was having elevated blood pressure not responding prashant, well it's all right hello prashant it's all right now what is your provisional diagnosis now after examination ma'am based on my uh, examination my provisional diagnosis will be a 33 year old female uh, with 36 week of uh, pregnant uh, gestation who is having li- most likely to have severe preeclampsia oh, okay and is the are there any chances of gestational hypertension how will you differentiate severe preeclampsia from gestational hypertension ma'am uh, severe preeclampsia it includes blood pressure more than systolic blood pressure more than 160 or diastolic blood pressure more than 100 mm of hg uh, on two different occasions four hour reports and associated with uh, protein urea first and second patient may a uh, patient always have uh, clinical features after which would be weeks of gestation after 20 weeks of gestation yes ma'am and uh, apart from that the clinical features which will differentiate from the gestational hypertension then patient may have protein urea in a preeclampsia with uh, without severe features it will be more than 300 mg per 24 hour or 1 plus on urine dip- stick test in severe preeclampsia it will be more than Uh, two plus on urine dipstick test or more than 1 g in 24 hour urinary protein additionally my patient uh, s- severe preeclampsia may so what is the more specific for protein hello prashan more yeah. specific anything specific for protein you can see any ratio yes ma'am it is a protein to creatinine ratio and it should be more than 0.3 yes for the very diagnosis good. and it is on spot urine if you don't have 24 hours urine collection and you want to clinch the diagnosis you can this or do this on the spot urine yes theek hai mm-hmm. aage chalo uh uh ma'am should i continue with differential yeah, diagnosis mein kya kya aayenge what are there for severe features in preeclampsia in ma'am severe features of preeclampsia patient have uh, मतलब एज वी प्रीवियसली डिस्क्राइब सीवियर प्रोटीन मोर प्रोटीन यूरिया मोर देन वन ग्राम पर ट्वेंटी फोर आवर पेशेंट में हैव थ्रम्बोसाइटोपेनिया पेशेंट में हैव एक्यूट लिवर एक्यूट इम्पेयर लिवर डिसफंक्शन और मे इंक्रीज इन डिसफंक्शन डिफाइन लिवर डिसफंक्शन यस मैम लिवर डिसफंक्शन इज डिफाइंड एज वेन देर इज एलिवेशन ऑफ बिलियोरबिन मोर देन वन पॉइंट टू मिलीग्राम पर डेसी लीटर और ए एस टी लेवल्स मोर देन सेवेंटी इंटरनेशनल यूनिट पर लीटर एंड एल डी एच विच इज मोर देन सिक्स हंड्रेड इंटरनेशनल यूनिट पर लीटर एंड एल डी एच इज ऑल मोर बोथ सजेस्टिव ऑफ हिमोलाइसिस प्लस लिवर डिसफंक्शन सो माई माई पेशेंट विल ऑल्सो हैव ऑनसेट ऑफ न्यू ऑनसेट ऑफ पलमोनरी डिसफंक्शन and new onset of uh, renal dysfunction which is characterized by increase in the serum creatinine more than 1.1 mg per dl or more than two times from the baseline and it is uh, can also have increase in serum uric acid levels more than 5.5 mg per dl so this includes the features of severe preeclampsia okay very good so this our the patient goes in favor of severe preeclampsia isn't it yes preeclampsia with severe features so yes. so my question is how will you differentiate from gestational hypertension ma'am gestational hypertension it is the, uh, the onset of new onset of hypertension that is bp more than 140 by 90 mm of it's all the same except them, After, there will be no proteinuria without just protein a minute urea. Prashant, yes ma'am proteinuria will not, not without protein without proteinuria and even theek uh, hai and it will resolve 12 weeks after delivery just usually if it is not resolved then yes, you sir. label it retrospectively as preeclampsia okay yes ma'am it, Yes. Can you get me? Retrospective diagnosis. Do you get me? Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay. Oh, chalo. Oh, what are the other hypertensive disorders in pregnancy? Ma'am, other dis uh, other hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. It can be chronic hypertension or chronic hypertension superimposed with preeclampsia. Uh, in chronic hypertension, okay, it is a uh, uh, elevated of uh, blood pressure more than one forty by ninety right. before right. twenty. Okay. Ah, okay. huh. just proceed. Yes, ma'am. 
So uh, after uh, making a provisional diagnosis uh, and I have excluded my differential diagnosis, then uh, mm -hmm. I would like to go for an investigations. You you want to look for the investigations. So uh, according, uh, seeing your case, so are there any risk factors in your patient which goes in favor of preeclampsia? Risk factors for my patient, it was uh, it is a uh, late onset of preeclampsia, which was thirty week uh, after thirty four weeks of pregnancy, and but there are no uh, identifiable risk factors because in after thirty four week pregnancy, it is mostly commonly associated with the uh, maternal uh, conditions like diabetes, hypertension, or previous history of preeclampsia or advanced maternal age. But in my case, uh, it was nothing there was found. This one is this is the first pregnancy. Yes, ma'am. So what Primate. are the other risk factors? Uh, in your is... case, she is the uh, risk factors. But uh, tell me the risk factors for preeclampsia, in which you will suspect that oh, this is preeclampsia. You know? Okay, ma'am. More, the, more the factors, factors. Are more the, if the patient is, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. So it consists of uh, demographic factors that is more common in Asian population. Then uh, age more than 35 years of age, uh, 35 years of oh, then it consists of previous uh, genetic conditions. In genetic condition, previous history of preeclampsia or family history of preeclampsia is there or family history of chronic hypertension is there. Then uh, maternal uh, medical conditions that I previously said like diabetes, hypertension. Go on. Next, next. Autoimmune next, diseases. Ma'am, yes, auto Yes, ma'am. In autoimmune disease, particularly if female is having antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or SLE, okay, okay. then uh, also it is associated with the uh, obstetric factors. It is a nulli nulliparity or primary para female, multiple gestation. It can be there because of multiple gestation and advanced maternal age. So, okay. and what's in your take on BMI? What's your take on BMI? Will you calculate a body mass index in pregnant patients? Ma'am, body mass index in pregnant patient is not recommended to calculate. It is based on the pre-pregnancy BMI. But uh, uh, we should keep look on the weight gain during pregnancy. Okay. And if the pre-pregnancy BMI is more than 30, that is one of the risk factors for preeclampsia. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So now this patient has come to you and uh, they want to carry out and because it's a severe preeclampsia and they want to terminate the pregnancy. So what investigations would you like to see or what you have, will you order in this patient? Okay. For the investigations, I will start with the CBC. In CBC, mm -hmm. I will look for hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, uh, I will particularly look because there can be excessive hemoconcentration or hemolysis will be there. TLC count to rule out any... What happens in normal pregnancy? How it is different from normal pregnancy? Ma'am, in normal pregnancy, there is a physiological dilution, dilutional anemia will be there. But here in our severe preeclampsia, there will be a hemoconcentr severe hemoconcentration is there because of decrease in intravascular volume. So patient may have a, a high, false elevated uh, hemoglobin values because of hemoconcentration. Hematocrit. Yes, ma'am. Hematocrit. You look for yes, the hematocrit. hematocrit. If it is elevated, then... इंडिकेटिवेक्शन Third, I will look for thrombocytes count, total platelet count, because in our case there can be a thrombocytopenia, which will alter our the plan of anesthesia. Then I will look for the liver function test. Yes. In liver, what liver in function. In pregnancy with thrombocytes, thrombocytes. What happens to in, the uh, platelet count in normal pregnancy? Ma'am, there can uh, there can be a normal thrombocyte uh, thrombocyte count or uh, dilutional thrombocytopenia can be there, but it will be more uh, more than one lakh. And when it is less than one lakh, then it is a uh, indicative of our diagnosis. Okay. In, okay. I, 
I would like to get a liver function test. In liver function test, I will uh, also in after CBC count, I will look for a peripheral smear. In peripheral smear, I will get to know about right. the features uh, features of hemolysis. It can be fragmented RBCs or can be a schistocytes, which is more suggestive of acute hemolytic changes. Then after that, I will. Uh, i will like to get a liver function test in liver function test i will look for to, uh, total bilirubin if it is more than 1.2 mg per deciliter i will also look for the indirect bilirubin whether it is more elevated or not second i will look uh, uh, i will look for alt or ast if it ast is more than 70 international unit will be more indicative of liver dysfunction third or twice will, the normal okay pre pre pregnancy it's twice the normal of pre pregnant values okay Yes, ma'am. Then I would like to go uh, for a uh, renal function test. In renal function test, I would uh, if increase in serum creatinine more than 1.1 or increase in serum uric acid more than 5.5. Importantly, I will look for the baseline KFT of the patient to rule out whether there is twofold increase there or not, if it is available. Then uh, uh, after that, what I will look... What are the indications of... Uh... What is the anesthetic implications of raised serum creatinine in these patients? Um, anesthetic implication, if there is increase in serum creatinine is increased, then two factors are there. First, it is uh, decrease in urine output in the patient. So si patient may have a fluid overload. So we have to go with a restrictive fluid approach. Second, because of the excessive uh, flu uh, decrease in urine output, there can be an electrolyte abnormality. And third, we have to avoid nephrotoxic drugs in our analgesia. In this case, what would you like to be careful about if the if the patient is having deranged renal functions? Yes, ma'am. In this case, be because our patient is on uh, magnesium therapy, I would like to uh, uh, be careful about the serum magnesium levels because the signs of toxic uh, impending toxicity can be possible in our patient. In your patient, so uske kya dekho ki kitna hona chahiye fir? Suppose the patient is having oliguria and the creatinine is 1.1, around 1.4 milligram per deciliter, and the patient is having oliguria. Okay. So uh, will be. Ma'am, in this. Ma'am, in this case, I would like to ask for the serum magnesium labels because the serum magnesium labels will tell about the signs of toxicity and first and second. If it is uh, having any uh, clinical signs that we so discuss. what are the normal serum magnesium levels? Yes, ma'am. What uh, are the normal serum magnesium levels? Yes, ma'am. In normal serum magnesium levels are 1.4 to 2.4 milligram per deciliter or 1.2 to 2 milliequivalent per liter. The therapeutic range for uh, magnesium therapy. Milliequivalent is bolo, wait, bolo. Okay. Only one thing. Okay. And what is the therapeutic level? Ma'am, for the therapeutic level, in our case, you we keep above this up to seven, ma'am. Not more than seven milliequivalent per liter. Up to seven. Per liter. Okay. Good. Hmm. Then. Uh, in next investigation. Iske baad, CTR. Okay. Hai, chalo, chalo. Okay. In next investigation. Continue. I would like to go for a serum electrolytes and in electrolytes we'll see for the particular uh, sodium, potassium, calcium and serum magnesium levels as we discussed earlier. Then after this I will go for urine routine microscopy. In routine microscopy I can uh, we can see if there is a presence of uh, RBC or WBC is there. If it is RBC more indicative of glomerular dysfunction because of the hypertensive damage to the glomerulus. Or if it is WBC, it can be asymptomatic uh, bacteriorities can be present in pregnancy. Also, I will look for the uh, protein uh, grading 1 plus or 2 plus or 3 plus. After that, uh, I will also look for the epithelial casts. If there is our casts are present, then uh, uh, particularly tubular casts are present. It is more indicative of acute renal damage because of the hypertensive uh, condition in the pregnancy. Then I will also go for uh, okay. a 12-lead 12 12 ECG because in the 12-lead ECG, we have to rule out any uh, other conditions, whether it is sinus rhythm or non-sinus rhythm or any uh, patient have a other cardiac conditions uh, which, are, which were undiagnosed previously, it can be present. 
then uh, after that uh, uh, if time permits or it if it is previously done fundoscopy examination is also equally important because the fundoscopy will tell about the uh, if the uh, matlab there is a grading of hypertensive retinopathy so if it is the grade 3 or grade 4 then it can uh, tells about the impending uh, epl- uh, eclampsia can be present in the patient then i will go for the uh, at uh, uhg then in uhg i will look for two conditions fetal and maternal in fetal conditions i will look for the uh, it is la- fetus uh, live or matlab uh, uh, live fetus then second uh, what is the engaging part of the fetus then what is the approximately age of the uh, weight of the fetus because it is small it can be the fetus be... maternal we are being tested for maternal complications no okay in maternal conditions i will look for the two organ the target organs one i will look for the bilateral kidneys whether it is any damage to the kidney and second i will also look for the liver uh, texture because because in severe preeclampsia there can be a subcapsular hemorrhages or it can be seen as a punctuate uh, hypoechoic structures on the ultrasound so i will rule out any uh, liver damages there or not Now just a minute you will look for uh, this hematoma there okay subcapsular hematoma may be there which yeah. may be concealed yes, and patient yes, you may not know clinically isn't it and especially yes, in ma'am. patients who are having persistent right upper quadrant pain yes, what ma'am. else can you do with ultrasound you are having ultrasound prashant yes, do ma'am. ultrasound we have in our institute so what else yes, very important for anesthetic this what else can you see with an ultrasound and from the for the ultrasound also we can use it for uh, matlab our neurexal anesthesia then uh, in whole abdomen we can see for the ivc di- uh, ivc diameter most important is the fluid status of the patient so because these patients very are good, having intravascular volume contractions so it will guide us about the fluid therapy more precisely then i'll uh, i'll uh, tell you we can yes. look at the lung ultrasound also so impending pulmonary edema can be known there are more than 3 b lines now you can see the b lines there are many b yes, lines then the patient's lung is fat okay so it's yes, very ma'am. important finding yes ma'am Next. because aur kya karoge aur kya karoge chalo sara ho gaya investigations theek hai yes ma'am so I'm, now uh, history, you want to they want to take it hmm? sorry what do you want to say do you want to say no ma'am the voice aap kuch kehna chahte ho okay no, so now this patient is there and they want you to they want to the do emergency cesarean section in this patient theek okay. hai so yes, how will you plan what is your uh, plan of action what are your goals in this patient what will be your goal for anesthesia in this patient ma'am my goal will be divided it i will divide it into three uh, approaches pre pre and uh, pre operative goals intra operative and post operative in pre operative my goals will be i will do a pre anesthetic assessment thoroughly and i will look for the uh, airway assessment because and his, uh, first i will start with the clinical no, no, history no no these are not goals prashant just a minute just a minute this is the plan of action there are only two goals do i goal hai control of blood pressure and, and control of seizure Thick. yes ma'am see see the there are two, two goals <laughs> and control of blood pressure yes ma'am theek hai she has yeah. come as a severe hypertension so when you are seeing this patient she has come to near the outside just outside the ot and her bp is 200 by 120 how will you manage this case and first of all uh, i will uh, if this is a bp which uh, indicates of severe preeclampsia which can c- c- can continue uh, come become eclampsia at any time so i would like to go with uh, emergency anti hypertensive agents and i will prefer uh, iv so uh, first of all i will uh, take patient in uh, pre op area connect all the monitors uh, start oxygen and anti hypertensive agents i would uh, give i would like to give i will choose uh, labitolol and the first uh, obviously i will secure two white bore cannulas then fluid restrictive fluid and uh, uh, labitolol labitolol i will start with 20 mg then after uh, the onset of action for labitolol 2 to 5 mg then i will wait if it is not resolving then i will give uh, double the dose no. 20 20 ma'am no kitna wait karoge 20 ke baad kitna wait karoge 
my maximum up to 5 to 10 minutes next book. 5 to 10 minutes not more than that 10 minutes yes 10 minutes theek hai 10 minutes then after aage, ten, fir ma'am after 10 minutes if bp is not uh, resolving then uh, i will uh, give the double the dose of initial matlab up i have started with 20 i will give 40 mg then i will again wait uh, for 10 minutes if it is not resolving then we can i can increase dose up to 80 mg like that maximally i can give up to 320 mg only so and my goal for the mg. just a minute prashant up to 300 theek hai pehla 20 wait for 10 minutes then 40 wait for 10 minutes then 80 you can give 83 times total cumulative 300 ho jata hai isme theek hai then okay, even then if the bp is not controlled what will you do man even then if the bp is not controlled then i would like to add a second agent anti hypertensive agent Very good. in that case uh, i would uh, look for if patient is uh, uh, i would go for iv uh, nicardipine or hydralazine hydralazine it is not uh, having commonly nicardipine in your hospital just a minute you are having nicardipine in your hospital no ma'am then what will you do uh, in our hospital the most commonly present is a uh, ma'am uh, ntg ma'am so i will start with ntg ma'am and NTG. yes ma'am i will start the, the guidelines infusion. are to give 10 mg of hydralazine theek hai guideline hai agar if it is not controlled with levetolol maximum cumulative dose of 300 you can after 10 minutes you can give 10 mg of hydralazine and what care will you take when you are giving hydralazine kya care loge Ma'am, hydralazine. It is a being a potent arterial vasodilator. It can cause a reflex tachycardia in the patient. So we have to give in in the slow. Ma'am, it can patient may have dizziness. It can severe. cause a sudden drop in blood pressure. Sudden yes, drop. So ideally, you should give some fluid. Okay. So what does lobetalol? What is constituent? Yes, Prashant. Oh, sorry, ma'am. Voice was breaking. Can you repeat the question, please? But what is it? Okay, ma'am. Labetolol. Labetolol belongs to a third generation beta blocker, which is alpha plus beta blocker. It is alpha one selective and beta non selective. And it uh, prior it when we give the it is a uh, ma'am when we give uh, ratio IV, of alpha and beta one is to seven, ma'am. And I. One is to four, ma'am. It is per oral one is to four. IV is one is to seven, ma'am. Ah, uh, Prashant, what is the uh, this, uh, alpha and beta ratio in the oral tablet? Ma'am, when we give oral tablet, it is one is to four, and when we give IV tablet, it is one is to seven, ma'am. Okay, one is to three. It is in oral. So how how does it? What difference does it make to you? Oral and one is to seven, or one is to three? Uh, will you be careful about something? Yes, ma'am, because it is the it decreases BP more than the heart rate. So if it uh, when we are giving uh, IV, we have to look for the decrease in heart rate also. so we have to careful about the heart rate no in this in iv thing the bp is uh, beta blocker is more no action is more yes, so if their patient is on impending pulmonary edema they can precipitate pulmonary yes, edema in iv which may have not have been with oral okay yes ma'am since the beta blocker activity is more in the iv uh, dose iv drug theek hai So uh, when will you not give levetolol? When will you not give levetolol? Ma'am, there are uh, certain contraindications for giving levetolol. If it is a like a non-selective beta blocker, if patient is having history of reactive airway disease, peripheral vascular disease, or patient may is having history of uh, con- congestive heart failure, but it it is not in our case. अब इफ आवर पेशेंट हैव पल्मोनरी एडिमा साइंस ऑफ पल्मोनरी एडिमा देन सडनली वी हैव टू अवॉइड सबसे पहला तो पल्मोनरी एडिमा ही है ना ठीक है विद पर्टेनिंग टू दिस पेशेंट ठीक है एनी कार्डियोवास्कुलर डिजीज एनी डीकंपेंसेटेड कार्डियो डिजीज 
यानी हिस्ट्री ऑफ एस्मा ठीक है इसमें एस्मा भी प्रोनाउंस हो जाएगा आईवी वाले में ठीक है ठीक है यू फ्राउनिंग एम आई नॉट राइट नो प्रशांत थोड़ा वॉइस ब्रेक हो रही है मैम इट्स वॉइस इज गेटिंग ब्रेक हां तो वॉइस ब्रेक ठीक है ठीक है सो सपोज लबेटोलॉल इज कॉन्ट्रेंडिकेटेड इन दिस पेशेंट व्हाट ड्रग वुड यू लाइक टू यूज मैम वी कॉन्ट लबेटोलॉल इज कॉन्ट्रेंडिकेटेड एंड वी कैन नहीं दे सकते वी कैन गो हाँ वी कैन हाइपर टेंसी हमारे पेशेंट अर्जेंसी है तो वी कैन गो विथ आई वी इन्फ्यूजन ऑफ एन टी जी इफ इट इज हाइड्रोलॉजिन अवेलेबल वी कैन गो विथ हाइड्रोलॉजिन और नाइफेडिपिन इफ इट इज अवेलेबल वी कैन गो विथ नाइफेडिपिन मैम इफ वॉन्ट टू गिव हाइड्रोलॉजी प्रोटोकॉल फॉर हाइड्रोलॉजी सॉरी मैम आई डोंट नो How will you give? How will you give hydrazine? Okay. What are the you... recommendations for giving hydrazine? Ma'am, hydrazine should be given in a doses of five uh, milligram. Then the, we have to wait up to twenty minutes, and then we can give up to increments of of five milligram maximum of up to twenty milligram. And its onset of action will Very be five to ten minutes. on set ha you but you have to wait for 20 minutes for the yes. maximum effect to come okay yeah. and one of the prerequisites is that you should have an uh, intra arterial line when you are using if possible intra arterial blood pressure monitoring should be there when you are using yes. hydrazine theek okay? hai on maximum 20 they if, if the bp still is not controlled so what do you mean by control Ma'am, for the uh, target for our control of BP would be it is uh, our systolic blood pressure yes, should. What is your target? Ma'am, for the target of my controlling BP, it should be systolic blood pressure between one to uh, less than one sixty, and we have to maintain between one twenty to one sixty, and diastolic pressure uh, we have to uh, decrease less than one ten, and we have to maintain up to eighty five, eighty to eighty five. It should not the diastolic blood pressure should not be less than eighty because it can severely affect the uterine perf, uh, uter uh, fetal placental perfusion. So we have to keep diastolic above eighty. Only uterine perfusion. What uh, about brain perfusion? Yes, ma'am. Because hmm? the brain and cardiac perfusion will also affected in the mother. All the end organs, all the. ठीक है. So uh, now you have given this, and uh, if you have given twenty milligram of hydrolazine, then you can give the BP still above one sixty by hundred ten. Then you can give labetalol after waiting twenty minutes, forty milligrams. Okay. am i clear yes ma'am and if the bp is ha huh, if the bp is below 160 110 then you can maintain the blood uh, decrease in blood pressure by giving these drugs in infusion you can because they will be acting for shorter period so when you are taking the patient in the ot then the bp may again rise okay so why do you want to control the blood pressure in these patients why there is a need to control Ma'am, to control the BP, it is important for the two two reasons. One, it is if it is in excessive increase in blood pressure in the maternal, there will be loss of cerebral auto regulation. So it, there will be uh, vasogenic edema, and patient may uh, land up into eclampsia. And okay. second, when a, whenever there is an increase in blood pressure, there is severe uh, splanchnic vasoconstriction that will affect the. Uh, Fetal placental circulation, so patient uh, it can have patient uh, from the fetus side. It can have severe uh, uh, patient may have severe. Uh, See what is the dreadful complication which you want to prevent, which increases the mortality in these patient by decreasing the blood pressure. What is the most uh, dreadful complication which leads to increase morbidity and mortality in these patients? It is the leading cause of mortality. Ma'am, it can lead to acute, but uh, acute left ventricular failure. And second, it's the. Then brain may kya hoga? What will happen to the brain? Ma'am, it can cause eclampsia, and patient may land up into eclampsia and, मतलब. It's all coma. right. There will hmm. be what hemorrhagic? Kya hoga? Okay. Okay. Intracranial hemorrhage can be present in the patient. What can be there? So, in the patient may be having stroke. 
hemorrhagic yes. stroke may be there isn't it so, and yes. this is the leading cause of mortality in these patients theek okay. hai chalo aage aur ki tumne ye kar liya sara theek hai what else will you do in this patient suppose the bp is now 150 by 90 or 95 theek hai bp control ho gaya hai ab kya karoge what uh, your bp is will you right Ma'am, because this is an emergency case, the pre-op orders will be uh, for the case we are managing this patient in a pre-operative area. So I will ensure before taking case mm -hmm. to the OT whether the anti-aspiration prophylaxis is given to the patient or not. Then I will keep the patient in left lateral position, mm -hmm. shift, and I will attach the oxygen. And then after the anti-acid aspiration, what anti-acid aspiration? in the uh, this emergency setting i will go for uh, uh, injection pentaprozole 40 mg plus uh, injection metoclopramide 10 mg iv and that is at least to be given 20 to 40 minutes before the surgery ma'am if then, 20 minutes are not there then will you give if man lo immediately we are taking and there is no time for 20 40 minutes ma'am then also it is recommended to give why uh, because the uh, so exact reason don't know ma'am uh, because the chances of uh, aspiration are equally important during extubation okay, okay. even if it is not there during intubation it will be there by the time you extubate this patient or by the time the patient is being wheeled out okay after even after subarachnoid block yes ma'am so what about h2 receptor blockers will you add in the anti aspiration syndrome uh, the cysting aspiration prophylaxis Ma'am, previously, जल्दी जल्दी बोलो. Previously, it was indicated to give, but nowadays it is uh, uh, not give routinely given because of the risk of the side effects in the long term side effects in the maternal. So we avoid. But the... we are giving only one time. One time we can give. Okay. Isn't it? Hmm. So how does uh, S two receptor blocker and PPI, which you said that pan forty differ? Uh, which is better for this um, patient? Ma'am, for better for this patient will be H2 receptor blocker because they, it will more cause the decrease in acidity by more by the blocking of H2 receptor, so decrease in more acid. Uh, it decreases the volume also. Okay. Yes, ma'am. H2 which does PPI doesn't do. So okay, yes. it also volume yes, is also important in these patients. More volume. Mm -hmm. So uh, why do you want to give acid aspiration prophylaxis in these patients? why there is a need in these patients ma'am because this patient have delayed gastric emptying because of two factors first it is because of the delay uh, decrease in uh, lower esophageal esophageal sphincter tone and increase in intragastric pressure and second because of the mechanical pushing of the uterus that also causes uh, more uh, more uh, intragastric volume so it can cause more regurgitation in pregnant patients Basically, it is the gradient between the intragastric pressure and lower esophageal sphincter. So, yes. if the gradient is more, the gastric pressure is more than esophageal sphincter, then the chances of regurgitation are. For pregnancy, me because of this progesterone, the sphincter is not so tight. Okay, so gastric pressure bar jata because of uterus as well as so the and the gradient is more. So there are chances of aspiration in these patients. Okay. Yes. Yes, ma'am. ठीक तो फिर आपने एसिड एस्पिरेशन दे दिया व्हाट एल्स? मैम देन आई वुड लाइक टू हाँ एंटी एस्पिरेशन देन आई वुड लाइक टू प्रोसीड फॉर द आवर प्लान ऑफ एनेस्टीशिया बिकॉज़ इट इज़ इमरजेंसी केस देन माय प्लान ऑफ एनेस्टीशिया विल बी डिपेंड ऑन द कोएगुलेशन स्टाफ फर्स्ट it is the क्लिनिकल स्टेटस ऑफ द प and second if patient the coagulation status if patient's coagulation status i will first uh, this is the patient the, that you uh, presented this is the patient you presented i am not just a minute prashant the patient is the same which you presented how will you give plan anesthesia a platelet count is 90000 and a liver enzyme yes, is around 60 uh, ast is 60 international units per liter ma'am i will choose Anything for neurox you want to know um ma'am uh, if it uh, uh, coagulation profile in cat apt inr and apttt i would like to know if it is less than 1.4 so what are get... the indications for coagulation profile in these patients what are the indication for doing the other coagulation profile in these patients 
yes ma'am one when it is platelet count less than 80000 second patient when patient have severe uh, liver dysfunction less than 1 lakh prashant platelet count less than 1 lakh okay platelet count less than 1 lakh and second is the uh, acute liver dysfunction is there when there is increase in the liver enzymes so i would like to know for the pt inr before and aptt before going procedure surgery and second dpt is a hemolysis is there and along with thrombocytopenia then serum fibrinogen count is also equally important to rule out the uh, uh, coagulation abnormality so is the single platelet count enough for you no ma'am uh, it is uh, no it was 12 hours back when the patient was admitted it was 90000 So, uh, will you rely on that? No, ma'am. What serial, is more important regarding platelet count? Serial platelet count trend is more important than single platelet count. Okay, the trend is more important. If there's a rapid fall in the trend, then you will be very careful, and you you may not give subarachnoid block in these patients, or you have to be very careful. Yeah. Okay. Or क्या होना चाहिए? Platelet dysfunction नहीं होना चाहिए. कोई acquired या congenital coagulopathy की history नहीं होनी चाहिए. ठीक है? Yes, ma'am. then uh, if uh, my my patient's coagulation status is normal so i will plan for a neurexcel anesthesia as this patient is having a emergency then i will uh, more prefer for the subarachnoid block then after taking patient to the ot all standard monitor will be attached what are the advantages of neurexcel block over ga ma'am uh, yes ma'am because neuroaxial anesthesia will avoid the complications of ga like airway manipulation and second because of the stray hyper hypertensive stress response to laryngoscopy and intubation so this will be avoided second patient will have a uh, uh, single shot uh, technique is given so and less drug is given so there is less drug exposure to the fetus third it is a uh, uh single shot technique and rapid onset so and third is neuroaxial anesthesia is equally important uh antepartum and postpartum because the it decreases the level of circulating uh, catecholamine stress hormones so better and stable cardiac output will be there and so patient will have better intra uterine blood flow so it is more important to have neuroaxial anesthesia in post operative period it is more important for uh, our part is analgesia so patient will have better pain control so lesser hemodynamic uh, lesser uh, hypertensive res responsibility yes ma'am this is that not, not subarachnoid or sub what are the drawbacks of spinal subarachnoid block and um, drawbacks of subarachnoid block is the uh, one it is the single shot technique so it has finite duration of uh, an uh, duration of uh, anesthesia so mm -hmm. and uh, so this is our uh, main drawback of the spinal anesthesia aur kya hai aur bhi to hai what is spinal particularly of spinal anesthesia right single shot finite duration then your uh, neurology uh, well, complications of because of spinal anesthesia can be there ma'am so it can be a because of uh, the uh, difficult spinal is there in the pregnant patient so it can have a uh, chances of pdph are high because of the traumatic uh, that is more so with epidural anesthesia no yes. pdph chances are more high if you do an in inadvertent puncture and mm -hmm. uh, in spinal anesthesia there are incidence of hypertension may be there okay yeah. hypertension so how is uh, hypertension how will you what is your take on hypertension in preeclamptics mom uh, preeclamptics when we compare to the uh, normal female pregnant not patient. normal pregnant patient there is a less pronounced hyp uh, hypotension because there is a increase uh, le basal levels of catecholamines blood in the Increased level of catecholamines in the blood, so they will have less high hy pronounced hypotension. Okay, okay. It's all right now. Which drug will you give? Which drug will you give? How much? Ma'am, I will go for which hyper. Which drug will you give? Hyperbaric bupropion, point five percent, and I will choose a dose of uh, ma'am one point five one point five mL. And as this is emergency, then uh, I would now. Uh, uh, I will add fent uh, fentanyl also twenty microgram along with it. okay so uh, are there any considerations for local anesthetics they are sensitive that's why you are using you know yes, why do you want to give a lower dose of local anesthetic in this patient 
and because lower lower dose of anesthetics because of particularly um, physiological changes in pregnancy because the uh, dose in the local they anesthetic in pregnancy they are more sensitive to local anesthetics no Though they are yes, more sensitive are more and sensitive. for the same uh, this thing uh, they the uh, block is more higher for the same amount of local uh, anesthetic the block level of block is much higher how much block you want in this patient which level of block for cesarean okay okay just a minute uh, i i have 10 minutes from level, dr call <laughs> no ma'am up, ma'am up to t6 level up to t6 level very good so well, if suppose hypotension occurs what will you do ma'am if there is a hypotension occurs first there is a left uterine displacement followed by we have to give 100% oxygen See, then we have to give fluids left till they can give you can left till they can give you can give yes ma'am we can do uh, left left tilt of the table by 15 to 20 degrees celsius which drugs uh, will you use uh, in short fluids uh, you will start on which drugs ma'am. will you use phenylephrine is the drug of choice okay How is it different from ephedrine? Ma'am, it is a pure alpha one agonist, so and it acts more on the. Problem, tell me, fat or fat. Its its problem, what is the advantage? Ma'am, phenylephrine. The advantage is that it is a pure alpha one agonist, so it just increases cardiac preload rather than afterload. Then it causes less fetal acidosis. And okay, phenylephrine. the drawback is bradycardia you cannot use this drug when the patient is having yes, bradycardia in this case okay. ifedrine will be more useful if she is having brad ifedrine will yeah. be more useful and nowadays studies are coming up of use of noradrenaline theek hai noradrenaline has been used there are certain studies of for increasing the blood pressure and it does not cause bradycardia it works like phenylephrine but it does not cause bradycardia yes ma'am okay So, uh, TK. Now you have done this. Now, what uh, uterotonic drug will will you give after Maybe the you, delivery of the baby? Ma'am, uterotonic drugs. Ah, uh, first. Ah, first. Just do. Okay. What? 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 Uh, oh, in post top consideration, our um, two goals will be the same: hypertension control and continuation of seizure prophylaxis, along with the uh, urine output monitoring will be there. Okay, and pain control. Uh, NLGC, yeah, NLGC. Can you give NSAID in this patient? Can you give NSAIDs in this patient? Ma'am, we Post can give. Uh, yes. Yes, ma'am, we can give NSAID. Yes, we can give uh, uh, unless and until there is some uh, renal uh, damage. In the, there is some renal damage. The patient is having. Some renal failure features, then you will not try to avoid it. Okay, and yes, uh, suppose this patient uh, uh, will you continue magnesium in the post-operative period or intraoperative period? Yes, ma'am. We can continue magnesium in intraoperative period okay. and post-operative period up to, uh, ma'am, because it has it help. I mean, uh, it uh, magnesium have effect uh, uh, helps in also blood pressure control. So that is also more important. And there are only blood pressure it, control. Uh, our con- blood consider. Suppose you stop during operation, what will happen? Interop stop कर दिया. Ma'am, uh, मतलब decrease in uh, when the magnesium level falls below the therapeutic level, there are high chances of uh, eclampsia. So we have to maintain the constant the therapeutic level. Okay. Uh, so till when will you continue uh, continue the magnesium in the post-op period? Ma'am, up to twenty-four hours up in post-op period, it is recommended. Very good. Suppose this patient has a throws a fit. Okay. Just before you are wheeling in the patient, then what will you do? How will Maybe you give in this patient to be shot? Ma'am, uh, if patient's uh, seizure seizure is there, then we have to go with the RSI, ma'am. We have to intubate the patient mm-hmm. as soon as possible. And in RSI, we have to maintain three uh, Salix manure and the avoidance of the aspiration. So and. uh we'll do uh, there is a lot of controversy which i am not going into selix are you giving selix maneuver there uh, is yes. now recent literature says there is more harm than good when you are using selix maneuver so you have to do yes, rsi ma'am. fine theek hai and then what yeah. what drugs will you use to blunt the laryngoscopic response to intubation yes, laryngoscopy in this case we have to give, we can give most commonly lignocaine 1.5 mg well just after the end giving induction doses the or we can give esmolol no, 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 0.5 mg per kg what is the time prashant what is the dose of lignocaine and what is the time before intubation laryngoscopy 
ma'am the this- dose of lignocaine can will be 1.5 mg per kg ma'am mm-hmm. before kitne min seconds And, well? uh, six, six. 60 to 90 seconds before 90 the seconds. intubation we have to give like so if you are doing rsi you have to give yes, before sir. the induction agent okay which relaxant will you use for yes, intubation ma'am. ma'am in this case ma'am succinyl choline will be used 1.5 mg per kg for the rsi and because it has the quick onset so it will give the better intubation conditions within 30 to 40 what seconds what is the other reason what is the other reason for giving succinyl choline it has uh, a it also doesn't cross treating effect on the les theek hai jo les in its may uh, the, the effect is less in these preeclampsia and pregnant patient to is tightens the les so that is why scoline is given succinyl choline theek hai yes ma'am ha uh, aur fir aage uske baad kya karo fatafat fir aur kya de sakte hain for blunt uh, response this is very important that's why i'm not i'm not leaving the screen Yes. Ma'am, we can give incre- uh, incremental doses of labetalol, or we can give esmolol. In incremental doses of labetalol, we can give ten or twenty milligram labetalol, or we can give esmolol and labetalol. Problem with labetalol and esmolol. Ma'am, the onset of action. Esmolol has a quick onset of action. They do it. And labetalol. Two point five seconds minutes. Kalle ah. dena hai. It is, has to be given two point five or three, five minutes before intubation. Its main problem is that it will decrease the BP, but it may it will not control the heart rate. ठीक है इट मे नॉट कंट्रोल द हार्ट रेट लोबेटेलॉल सॉरी सॉरी दिस विल कंट्रोल बोथ द बीपी एंड हार्ट रेट व्हिच ड्रग्स विल नॉट कंट्रोल हार्ट हार्ट रेट व्हिच अदर ड्रग्स व्हिच यू कैन यूज एंड दे विल नॉट कंट्रोल द हार्ट रेट बताओ यू कैन यूज एनटीजी 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 बोलस कैन बी 50 टू 100 माइक्रोग्राम बोलस एस कैन बी कितनी देर पहले देंगे Ma'am, it is having everything. a quick onset of action, so we have to give it within one minute b- before the intubation. Fifteen ma'am. seconds, okay. NG yes. or SNP, fifteen seconds before intubation. Okay, you can even give a bolus of magnesium, one minute. Okay, forty milligram, one minute before intubation. So you, uh, my request to all the students, the laryngoscopic response is very important, and you must know which drugs you can use and what you will use and why. ठीक है एंड इसमें देर मे बी यू हैव टू कीप द फेल्ड फॉर दिस डिफिकल्ट एयरवे कार्ड बिकॉज दीज पेशेंट्स आर हैव हाई चांसेस ऑफ फेल्ड इंटूबेशन डिफिकल्ट इंटूबेशन एंड द एयरवे इज ऑल्सो डिफरेंट अनलाइक नॉर्मल पेशेंट्स इवन नॉर्मल प्रेगनेंसी देर इज मोर एडिमा मोर कैपिलर इंगॉजमेंट मोर लाइकली टू बी ब्लीड ड्यूरिंग इंटूबेशन सो फेल्ड इंटूबेशन इज मोर कॉमन इन दीज पेशेंट्स एंड यू हैव टू कीप अ स्मॉल साइज ट्यूब इन दीज पेशेंट्स and it is better if you have a video laryngoscope and a second generation supraglottic airway should always be there on your table and not to and you should also keep a ventilating bougie theek okay? hai yes so suppose the patient you land up in problem and you cannot even ventilate you cannot uh, ventilate this patient you cannot intubate this patient what will you do Ma'am. the patient is desaturating fast Ma'am, then the, we have to start with the uh, CPR. And then, if it is uh, desaturated, and second condition at the same time, we have to think about the perimortem cesarean section. And for the perimortem cesarean section, when perimortem we start the CPR, CPR in the, you have to support the uterus. Okay. When this is done, yes, ma'am. Ho, we have to, have to support the uterus. You can ask someone to lift the uterus, and you can start at four minutes. of unsuccessful CPR. You have to think about perimortem, and by five minutes, the baby should be out. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. As I'm overshooting the time, now I will give uh, some chance to Dr. Shubhi, and she will wind up this session. Thank you, Prashant. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you a lot. thank you matri ma'am let us now quickly revise the topic just summarize it preeclampsia for emergency lscs <clears throat> it is 6 to 10% of pregnancies and it results in 60% of mortality preeclampsia complicate preterm pregnancies hypertensive disorders in pregnancy are classified as gestational hypertension preeclampsia with or without severe features chronic hypertension chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia coming to preeclampsia it is a new onset hypertension with bp more than equal to 140 by 90 mm of mercury 
on at least two occasions, four hours apart, and proteinuria, more than 300 milligrams in 24 hours, in a previously normotensive woman after 20 weeks of gestation and returning to normal after 12 weeks postpartum. The diagnostic criteria for preeclampsia without severe features is BP more than equal to 140 by 90 beyond 20 weeks gestation, proteinuria more than equal to 300 milligram in 24 hours, protein creatinine ratio more than equal to 0.3 or one plus on urine specimen. While the diagnostic criteria for severe preeclampsia is BP more than equal to 160 by 110 millimeters of mercury, thrombocytopenia with platelet count less than one per meter cube, serum creatinine more than 1.1 milligram per deciliter or more than two times the baseline value, pulmonary edema, new onset cerebral or visual disturbances and impaired liver function. It can also be classified as early onset and late onset preeclampsia. In early onset, the onset of symptoms is before 34 weeks of gestation. The placental morphology is abnormal. The risk factor is mainly family history and the risk for adverse outcome is high. Whereas in late onset preeclampsia, the onset of symptoms is beyond 34 weeks of gestation. The placental morphology is normal. The risk factor is mainly maternal uh, me uh, medical conditions like diabetes, multiple pregnancy, increased blood pressure, and cardiovascular disorders. And the risk for adverse outcome is negligible in these cases. There are various risk factors for preeclampsia, like advanced maternal age more than 35 years, history of preeclampsia in previous pregnancy, family history of preeclampsia, various maternal medical conditions like obesity, chronic hypertension, diabetes, chronic renal disease, obstetric conditions like multiple gestation, and nulliparity. Let us see the etiopathogenesis of preeclampsia, genetic factors, immunologic factors, and complement activation can result in incomplete invasion of cytotrophoblast into the myometrial spiral artery. This results in failed remodeling of spiral artery. Now what happens is normally during pregnancy, there is a remodeling of spiral artery, which results in dilated spiral artery and more perfusion to the placenta. Whereas in severe preeclampsia, there is failed remodeling of the spiral artery in which they become small, constricted, so the placental perfusion is compromised and it results in placental hypoperfusion. This placental hypoperfusion will result in release of anti-angiogenic factors like soluble forms like tyrosine kinase and soluble endoglins. These anti-angiogenic factors, as the name suggests, they do not promote vessel growth and they also scavenge the normal angiogenic factors like vascular endothelial growth factor, placental growth factor, and there is a predominance of these anti-angiogenic factors, which will result in endothelial dysfunction, leading to altered vascular tone and hypertension, coagulopathy, and various target organ dysfunction. If it affects the CNS, it will result in headache. At the level of placenta, it causes IUGR, and in the liver, it can result in epigastric pain. Strategies have been proposed for preeclampsia prophylaxis like lifestyle modification, antioxidants, metformin, calcium supplementation, and antiplatelet drugs. Of these, low-dose aspirin has shown an absolute reduction in risk, so it should be initiated between 12 and 24 weeks of gestation in high-risk cases. Preeclampsia affects various systems of the body, namely the cardiovascular system, in which it results in vasoconstriction, hyperdynamic state, increased systemic vascular resistance and increased left ventricular work. In the cerebrovascular system, the persistent high BP will result in loss of cerebral autoregulation, vasogenic and cytotoxic cerebral edema, and raised ICP. This is also the mechanism of seizures in case of eclampsia, which we will be seeing later on. In the respiratory and airway system, it results in pharyngolaryngeal and facial edema, which can also result in a difficult airway. Also, it results in increased risk of pulmonary edema. In the ophthalmic system, it results in retinal arteriolar spasm, retinal detachment, which can lead to blindness. In the hepatic system, it results in peripotal necrosis, subcapsular hemorrhage, and impaired liver function. In the coagulation, it may result in thrombocytopenia and DIC. As far as the renal system is concerned, it results in renal vasospasm, decreased GFR, and patient may land up in acute renal failure and oliguria. 
It also affects the utero-placental system in which it results in reduced intervillous blood flow, placental infarcts, and IUGR. Now, as we have seen that preeclampsia affects various systems of the body, it can result in varied complications. Like in maternal complication, it results in HELP syndrome, cerebrovascular accident, pulmonary edema, renal failure, and eclampsia. In the fetal, it causes increased risk of IUGR and intrauterine death. Let us see one of the complications of severe preeclampsia that is HELP syndrome. It is characterized by hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count. The diagnostic criteria of HELP syndrome is based on various lab tests, namely abnormal peripheral blood smear, increased bilirubin, more than 1.2 milligram per deciliter, increased LDH, more than 600 international units per liter, which is suggestive of hemolysis. Also, increased AST and LDH, which is indicative of elevated liver enzymes, and a platelet count of less than 1 lakh, which is indicative of thrombocytopenia. The mainstay of treatment of HELP syndrome is delivery of the fetus and placenta. However, if the gestation of the fetus is less than 34 weeks, then we can defer the delivery for 24 to 48 hours to allow for corticosteroid administration to accelerate fetal lung maturity. The other modalities of treatment being control of hypertension and seizure prophylaxis with IV magnesium sulfate. Let us come to the anesthetic management of preeclampsia. It begins with the preoperative evaluation with a detailed history examination, airway assessment, detailed cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurological examination while looking for deep tendon reflexes, as we have already discussed in the case. Also, obstetric fetal evaluation, frequent BP measurement, and fundoscopic examination. The investigations include a battery of tests, including complete blood count, hematocrit and platelet, liver function test, kidney function test, serum electrolytes, including serum magnesium, urine analysis, coagulation profile, grouping and cross-matching of blood. The route of delivery can be vaginal or sedated. Vaginal delivery should be attempted in all women with or, with, uh, with or without severe features, assuming no other indications for cesarean delivery exist. And cesarean should be preferred when maternal or fetal condition mandates immediate delivery. In case of normal delivery for labor analgesia, neuraxial anesthesia is preferred. It can be in the form of lumbar epidural analgesia or combined spinal epidural because it has certain advantages like provision of high quality analgesia, which attenuates the hypertensive response to pain, reduction in the levels of circulating catecholamines, possible improvement in the intervillous blood flow, and provision of a means for administering local anesthetic for emergency cesarean delivery. In the preoperative period, our goals will be to minimize vasospasm, appropriate hemodynamic monitoring, choosing the best appropriate mode of anesthesia, management of hypertensive episode, seizure prophylaxis, prevent and treat coagulation abnormalities. Preoperative optimization starts with the bed rest in left lateral position, IV fluid resuscitation at 80 ml per hour with the goal of urine output more than 1 ml per kg per hour. We have to maintain our BP goal with systolic BP in the range of 120 to 160 millimeters of mercury and diastolic BP in the range of 80 to 105 millimeter of mercury. This target of blood pressure control can be achieved by means of various drugs like labetalol, hydrolyzine, nifedipine, nicardipine, and sodium nitroprusside. Seizure prophylaxis, it is done routinely in preeclampsia with severe features by help of magnesium sulfate. In case of normal delivery, it is initiated with onset of labor till 24 hours postpartum. And for cesarean, it is started two hours before the section till 24 hours postpartum. Let us see the mechanism of anticonvulsant action of magnesium. It reduces the cerebral vasospasm by cerebral vasodilating properties. It also causes generalized vasodilatation, decreasing the peripheral vascular resistance. It acts on the central NMDA receptor to raise the seizure threshold. Magnesium also has other effects, like it inhibits the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. It decreases the sensitivity to acetylcholine. These factors result in increased potency and duration of non-depolarizing muscle relaxant. Hence, 
neuromuscular monitoring should be used and dose of non depolarizing muscle relaxation relaxants should be reduced magnesium also results in tocolysis it depresses smooth muscle contraction so there is an increased risk of uterine atony and excessive blood loss there are various uh, regimes for magnesium sulfate administration it is zospan or spy regime in which 4 to 6 g of magnesium sulfate is given iv over 20 to 30 minutes followed by an infusion of 1 to 2 g per hour and in the prechar regime 4 g is given iv over 5 to 15 minutes followed by 5 g im in each buttock with maintenance of 5 g im in alternate buttock fourth hourly the normal plasma level of magnesium is 1.8 to 2.8 mill or 2.4 mg per deciliter and the therapeutic range is 4.8 to 9.6 mg per deciliter with increasing level plasma levels of magnesium various other effects are seen like ecg changes loss of deep tendon reflexes respiratory and cardiac arrest the maternal side effects of magnesium sulfate therapy is flushing chest palpitation drowsiness muscle weakness and in neonatal lethargy hypotonia or respiratory depression in case of magnesium toxicity magnesium infusion and iv administration of calcium gluconate 1 g over 10 minutes is given for monitoring all routine monitors are attached namely non invasive bp ecg pulse oximetry capnography temperature urine output and special monitoring like neuromuscular monitoring continuous fetal heart rate monitoring intra arterial bp and cvp monitoring should be done in special situations plan of anesthesia for cesarean delivery it can be neuroaxial or ga but neuroaxial has certain advantages like it avoids the possibility of difficult tracheal intubation secondary to airway edema also it avoids the risk for intracranial hemorrhage from hypertensive response to both intubation and extubation during ga so neuroaxial is preferred whenever clinical circumstances will permit its use the general anesthesia pose certain specific challenges to the anesthetist like increased risk of aspiration potential difficulty of securing the airway hypertensive response to laryngoscopy intubation and extubation which may precipitate intracranial bleeding and effects of magnesium sulfate on neuromuscular transmission and uterine tone during induction of general anesthesia certain points should be kept in mind like the difficult airway card should be kept ready rsi is done and the pressure response to intubation should be controlled with various drugs which have been already discussed in the maintenance of anesthesia small titrated doses of non depolarizing muscle relaxants like cesetracurium or etracurium should be given and magnesium sulfate should be continued intraoperatively following delivery of the fetus oxytocin is the first line neurotonic and methargen is contraindicated due to risk of severe hypertension at the time of extubation it should be done when patient is fully awake with airway reflexes intact and sympathetic response should be blunted during extubation also special considerations during neurotraction in spinal anesthesia pencil point spinal needles like tackles prefer workies and crystalloid preloading prior to neurotraction is no longer recommended while using epidural or combined spinal epidural assessment of coagulation and platelet count is important treatment of hypotension and avoid use of epinephrine containing local anesthetic as a test dose because unreliable response due to co therapy with beta blocker and it can cause severe hypertension if inadvertent intravascular injection occurs so alternative ways of confirming the catheter position should be used like epidural stimulation test epidurography epidural pulse wave form analysis or ultrasound as we have already discussed treatment of hypotension with iv phenylephrine 25 to 50 microgram bolus is the agent of choice we should provide multimodal analgesia avoid nsaids if hypertension persists for more than 24 hours maintain hemodynamic control with antihypertensives even in the post operative period and seizure control is important in the post operative period also advise the patient about risk of preeclampsia in her later pregnancy coming to eclampsia it is a new onset of convulsion and or coma which occurs during pregnancy or postpartum period for women with signs and symptoms of preeclampsia it exists without a preexisting neurological disorder there are certain pre monitoring neurological symptoms of impending eclampsia and they are 
headache and visual perception deficit, cranial nerve deficit, hyperreflexia, and altered mental status. Coming to anesthetic management of eclamptic patient in the preoperative preparation, IV fluid should be restricted to minimize cerebral edema. Antihypertensive therapy and seizure prophylaxis should be continued during the plan of anesthesia. Generally, general anesthesia is given, but neuralgia may be used in certain conditions like conscious eclamptic women with no evidence of raised intracranial pressure, well-controlled seizures, and normal coagulation parameters. And in the anesthetic considerations, the difficult airway should be entered. Pre-existing neurological deficits must be recorded. Stress response should be avoided. So deep plane of the anesthesia is a must. Magnesium sulfate induced tropolysis and increased chances of PPH should be kept in mind. Methargen is contraindicated due to risk of severe hypertension. Post-operatively, we should monitor the CNS status, watch for convulsion, and diuresis is the most accurate clinical indicator of resolution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shubhi. There are a few questions. Uh, yeah. A uh, yes. few regarding the uh, use of uh, adrenaline in epidural test dose in PIH patients. Uh, recent, uh, according to the recent guidelines, you can use uh, uh, epi, uh, this thing epinephrine in the epidural as a test dose, but you have to be very careful. In severe preeclamptics where BP has not been controlled, it is better not to use it. And what should be used alternatively if we are not using to suspect placement? Alternatively, there are some report, uh, there are some uh, studies about it. It is still not in the books. You can give 0.25 percent of bupivacaine, two ml, four ml. So if it is in the this thing uh, in the uh, subarachnoid space, then a total block will be there till T6. And if it is in the intravascular space, there will be some circanol numbness and some dizziness may be there in the, with this. Or there is another paper which says that you can give 100 microgram of fentanyl. Okay. The patient will have sedation if it is intravascular. Sedation and patient will become drowsy. Uh, one is not in the Should we use Alex maneuver or not? And uh, if, uh, why it is not recommended now? Selix maneuver at the, uh, the, the pressure, it is the main, the pressure which you give is, you said two to three newtons, no? So uh, two to three kg pressure is recommended, but how will you know it is two to three? Blanching of your fingers may not actually uh, indicate this pressure. So if it may be, uh, make it incompetent, still the esophagus may not be blocked properly. And in these patients, there may be edema around the neck also. So the landmarks may be difficult to identify. And these patients are al already, we have difficult intubation and difficult laryngoscopy. They, they may make it more difficult, Selix maneuver. So in the difficult airway algorithm, it is recommended if you cannot intubate on the first go, then you may have to release the Selix maneuver. So in our institute, we are not giving Selix maneuver. Okay, ma'am. Uh, then one of the student had asked, why magnesium sulfate will be continued in intraoperative period? Doesn't it cause PPH? Yes, it can cause PPH. But the other problem is that the uh, half-life of magnesium is five hours. So if you stop in the entrop, it will not the it will not manifest. So the seizure will manifest in the post-op period when the patient may be lying unattended, and she may aspirate in the post-op and may be having even she can have respiratory arrest or she can aspirate and may even have cardiac arrest. So these complications are more important than having PPH. So for PPH also you have to see the magnesium levels. If it is the magnesium level is more than 10 milli equivalent per liter, then there are more chances of PPH. Okay, ma'am. Uh, someone is asking. The therapeutic range is less. Uh, 
मसल रिलैक्सेंट ऑफ चॉइस इन एल एस सी एस आई कैन नॉट हियर प्लीज मैम मसल रिलैक्सेंट ऑफ चॉइस रिलैक्सेंट ऑफ चॉइस इन फॉर इंटीग्रेशन Yes, ma'am. Yes, for LSCS depends on the surgeon also. How fast is your surgeon? Sometimes some surgeons are so fast that even you can complete with the succamethonium. Okay, and some and if you require a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant, then cyst. If you have cyst atracurium, then you can go for it. And if you are doing neuromuscular monitoring, you can use any muscle relaxant. Uh, Ma'am, they are asking what's the lowest platelet count indicated for spinal or epidural anesthesia? Seventy thousand or more. The chances of uh, platelet count, the chances of epidural hematoma are exceptionally low. So, seeing not only the one I said, only not one reading of platelets. The trend is important. If the trend has been stable for last three four hours, and you will take the latest. प्लेटलेट काउंट ये नहीं कि वो तीन चार घंटे का हुआ है आप उसी को ले लो इट मे बी इट हैज डिक्रीज बाय द टाइम यू आर गिविंग मे बी वॉट गिविंग दबरकनाथ ब्लॉक इट इज इट इज मोर देन सेवेंटी सेवेंटी थाउजेंड सो यू कैन गिव एंड बट कीपिंग आई ऑन दिमेटो माइन ऑल बट ठीक है यू हैव टू वे द रिस्क बेनिफिट रेशियो some say to give fentanyl during induction while some say to give it after the delivery of baby kindly clarify if you cannot control your blood pressure even with the all these anti hypertensive which, which we discussed so the main aim of your induction and laryngoscopy is to prevent the hypertensive response if if you think that fentanyl will definitely help you to reduce this response then you can give because mother is more important than the fetus and if you are giving you have to inform the pediatrician that you have been opioid in the during the induction with uh, even propofol or thiopentone so that they can be ready with naloxone and they can take care of the baby uh, and one last question ma'am uh, will succamethonium be used in eclampsia where icp might be raised in that it is better not to use when you think that the icp is rich you can have weigh, you have to weigh the pro, risk benefit ratio if you think that if difficult in, intubation is more maybe more and you may not be able to intubate this patient then maybe you can use succinylcholine in this patient thank you ma'am for uh, answering all the queries over to dr devang thank you maitri ma'am for this illuminating session i now welcome dr h k mahajan senior consultant and chief of anesthesia and critical care at indian spinal injury center new delhi his area of interest is anesthesia intensive care ultrasound guided nerve blocks and procedures i request you sir to kindly commence the session thank you so much uh, dr dibang for such a kind introduction at the very outset i sincerely congratulate whole rml team for conducting this wonderful show i hope it will be very very benefited to our examination going post graduate students now it is my turn to invite the next speaker who is a well known name in his fraternity he is dr amal gupta working as a associate professor at molana jar Medical College and Group of Hospitals. His core area of interest include intensive care, remote area anesthesia management, difficult airway, and auto anesthesia. I have also heard that he is also very good in pain and palliative care, and he has authored a book on synapses of anesthesia, apart from many publications in national and international journals. So, it is my pleasure to invite you, sir. for the stock on inhalation and anesthesia inhalation and anesthesia this is a very important topic every year one or two questions they come in the theory and in practical oscp examinations if you are well versed with the physical properties and whatever questions there are on this you can score like mathematics so it is over to you sir for this talk thank you sir for your kind words thank you team rml for giving the opportunity 
thank you sir and thank you team r for this wonderful opportunity so may I request to start the presentation yes sir very good afternoon to respected chairperson seniors and my dear students i use this opportunity to thanks organizing committee for giving this opportunity to discuss inhalation agents with you people i am dr lalit gupta associate professor department of anesthesiology intensive care maulana azad medical college so we are going to discuss a very important topic inhalation agents inhalation agents are the substances that are brought into the body via the lungs and are distributed with the blood into the different tissues we are going to discuss these inhalation agents initially as their introduction as well as their properties with their key messages in their properties and later on we will be discussing some cases based on the uh, topic that we have wrote, uh, we will be discussing by now so the main target of inhalation anesthetic agents is the brain inhalation anesthetic agents i act either by amplifying inhibitory functions or decreasing excitatory transmission at the nerve ending in the brain inhalation agents are mainly used for induction in pediatric populations some may be used for induction in case of adults like sevoflurane and maintenance is always by the inhalation agents irrespective of the patient's age coming to a brief history diethyl ether was first used by william tj morton in the usa in 1846 while cyclopropane was discovered accidentally in 1929 and was very popular for almost 30 years the increasing use of electronic equipment necessitated the discontinuation of this inflammation agent otherwise this was a very wonderful anesthetic agent chloroform was the next agent by used by james simpson in 1847 however it was discontinued due to the cause of sudden cardiac arrest query due to the ventricular fibrillation and dose dependent hepatotoxicity Then the halothane era started in 1951 by the prominent British chemist Charles Walter Sackley while working at the Imperial Chemical Industry. Later on, John Stone used it clinically first time. Then enfluorine 1970, esfluorine, isofluorine 1981, and desfluorine 1996 were the subsequent inhalation agents that were discovered. Coming to a brief classification of inhalation agents accordingly in the present era. they are can be either as a gas like nitric oxide nitrous oxide cyclopropane ethylene xenon and argon and volatile liquids like ether halothane desfluorine isofluorine desfluorine and sevoflurane so what is an ideal inhalation anesthetic agent it depends on the physical properties pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic coming briefly a physical property is stable over a range of temperature not degraded by light does not require presence of preservative non explosive does not support combustion odorless pleasant smell environmentally safe and does not react with other compound like soda lime and must have a boiling point well above the room temperature while pharmacodynamically it should predictable dose related cns depression analgesic antiemetic muscle relaxant properties minimal respiratory depression do not induce bronchospasm minimum cardiovascular effect no uh, not epileptogenic does not impair the hepatic or renal function no effect on uterine muscles does not trigger malignant hyperthermia and coming to the pharmacokinetic it should have a very low blood gas solubility coefficient low oil gas solubility coefficient not metabolized or no metabolites active which are harmful to the body completely by the respiratory system however no inhalation agent meets all these criteria so there is no ideal inhalation anesthetic agent but we will be going discussing the properties of each one by one so that we can understand what they are and how do they behave coming to the theories of mechanism of action despite widespread use currently understanding of the molecular basis for the anesthetic agents is very poorly understood the effect of inhaled anesthetic agents can be explained by the single molecular mechanism it cannot be rather multiple target contribute to the effect of each agent some of the famous theories are overton meyer theory lipid solubility and alteration in the lipid by layers by the lipid perturbation lipid phase transitions and lipid protein interactions alteration to the protein functions luciferase inhibitions they are the few of the uh, very predicted 
theories, but none of them is completely explainable. The mayor of Britain theory describes the correlation between the lipid solubility of inhaled anesthetic and MAC, and suggests that anesthesia occurs when a sufficient number of inhaled inhalational agents dissolve in the lipid cell membrane. While the mayor of Britain theory postulates it is the number of the molecules dissolved in the lipid layer and not the type of the inhalation agent that causes anesthesia. Combination of the different uh, inhaled anesthetics may have the additive effects at the level of the cell membrane. Exceptions of mayer overton theory always exist, which include anfluorine and isofluorine as structural isomers and have the similar oil gas partition coefficients. However, the MAC for isofluorine is only approximately 70% for that of anfluorine. Thus, it would appear that there are other factors which may influence potency. And such are the Mullins theory expanded the mayer overton rule by adding the critical volume hypothesis, that is, absorption of the anesthetic molecules could expand the volume of a hydrophobic region within the cell membrane and subsequently discord channel necessary for sodium influx, which leads to the inhibition of the need needed for synaptic transmission. Protein receptor hypothesis, which postulates protein receptors are the main part. The theory is supported by a steep dose response curve for inhaled anesthetics. Another theory describes the activation of the GABA receptors. Volatile agents may activate GABA and hyperpolarized cell membranes. And the one theory which uh, affects the inhibit the certain calcium channels, which therefore prevent the release of the neurotransmitter and inhibit glutamate channels. So there are multiple theories and none is perfect. Coming to the physical and chemical properties of inhaled anesthetic agents, first come the measure of the anesthetic potency. Every drug is measured by its potency. So in terms of the inhalation agent, it is the minimum alveolar concentration. That is the concentration at one atmosphere of anesthetic in the alveoli that is required to produce in mobility in 50% of the adult patients subjected to a surgical incision. That is 1.2 to 1.3 mag prevents the movement in 95% of the patients. MAC awake, MAC of the anesthetic that would allow opening of the eyes on verbal commands during emergence from anesthesia and it is around 0.3 to 0.4 of MAC. While MAC of the intubation, it would it means it would inhibit the movement on cuffing during the endotracheal intubation. That is 1.3 MAC. While MAC bar, that is the MAC of the anesthetic necessary to prevent adrenergic response to the skin incision, also measured by concentration of cathecholamine in the venous blood. And it corresponds to approximately 1.5 MAC. There are the minimum MAC of the halothane, iso, sevo, dice, and uh, uh, nitrous oxide coming from the halothane. The MAC is 0.74. And of the dice fluorine, it is the 6. While the MAC of the uh, nitrous oxide, not mentioned here, is the 105. And remember, nitrous oxide enable is produced and educated anesthesia. So it requires very high concentration because of the 105 of MAC. The MAC value of different are roughly additive. For example, mixture of 0.5 of nitrous oxide and 0.5 of halothane MAC approximate the degree of the central dispersion of one MAC of isofluorine. That is, it is additive in nature. So what are the factors? So there are many factors which affect the MAC by increasing or decreasing, but you should remember those factors which are very important. Like MAC is maximum at one year compared to the MAC at 120 years. And it is reduced by to 20% at 40 years and by 40% at 80 years. 60% of the nitrous oxide reduced MAC of isofluorine by 40% and MAC of sevofluorine by 24%. And opioids and other sedatives also have the decreasing effect on the MAC. That is, they require the requirement of the MAC of the inhalation agent. While there are some things which do not affect the MAC, they include the gender, duration of the anesthesia, carbon dioxide tension in the blood, that is 21 to 95 millimeter of mercury metabolic acid base, hypertension, and hyperkalemia. So coming to the potency, it is defined as the minimum alveolar concentration. That is, it is small for the potent anesthetic such as halothane and large for the less potent like of nitrous oxide, which has the 105 of MAC. So the smaller the MAC, the higher is the potent of an anesthetic agent. By this way, halothane is the most potent among all the uh, usable inhalation agents at present. Coming to the boiling point and vapor pressure, the halothane vapor pressure is 50.2 and sevofluorine is 58.5, while dash fluorine is 22.8. So it has a particular implication. Dash fluorine cannot be administered using the standard vaporizer, otherwise it will evaporate. So we need a special type of vaporizer for dash fluorine, that is a tax 7. Halothane, iso, sevo, dash, they are the clear non-explosive, non-inflammable liquid clear non-flammable liquid at room temperatures, non-pungent and pungent order irritating and pleasant to the inhalation. So coming by this, halothane is non-pungent and it is very sweet like a fruit. 
well so isoflurane it is pungent co is non pungent and das is very pungent it can even induce the bronchospasm if given like this so the implication is sevoflurane followed by halothane are very suitable for inhalational especially in the patients of copd coming to the structures all the halogenate are the halogenated reagents except halothane which is the alkane derivative others are the ether that is r o r group is present as a inhalation agents derivative implications as a impact on the ozone layers sevoflurane followed by iso and das have the global warming potential of 2 to 3 orders of magnitude higher than the carbon dioxide that is the sevoflurane has the lowest than iso and the das which has the highest potential for uh, ozone depletion and sensitization of hal to the epinephrine toxicity which is seen by the halothane coming to the blood gas partition blood gas partition of halothane is 2.5 while dasflurane is the least 0.42 what does it imply it means halothane is the most soluble in the blood and das is the least so lower the blood gas powder car partition rapid is the induction and recovery from the anesthesia because it is least absorbed so it is it becomes very uh, readily available for the induction it goes from very fast from lungs to the brain and cause the induction as well as the recovery of the anesthesia coming to the stability halothane has some decomposition uv lights and the alkali with uv rights and metals while others are the stables the implication is that halothane is susceptible to the uh, decomposition to hydrochloric acid chlorine bromine and phosgene and it has to be stored in the amber colored bottles with the preservative of thiol metabolism halothane is 20% metabolized to its by products while sevoflurane to the 4% that means halothane and sevoflurane has the end uh, metabolites which may affect the renal and hepatic system so they have the toxic effects too coming to the effect on the various organ systems coming near the cardiovascular mean arterial pressure halothane iso das sevo decreases the mean arterial pressure in the dose dependent manner while halothane and fluorine decrease the cardiac contractility while halothane decreases the heart rate iso and fluorine das and sevo increases the heart rate so only the halothane decreases the heart rate while others increases the heart rate coming to the systemic valvular attack halothane and nitrous oxide has no effect while other causes the decrease in the dose dependent decrease and all the inhalation agents causes the dose dependent decrease in the cardiac output however it is least for the das and sevo while maximum for the halothane pulmonary vascular resistance no predictable effect is seen for other in the other halogenated anesthetic agent while nitrous oxide increases the peripheral vascular resistance cardio uh, coronary blood flow isoflurane is the most potent coronary vasodilator and it shows the coronary squeeze phenomena where the blood is squeezed from the, uh, the affected area to the normal area while halothane and sevoflurane causes the coronary vasodilatation coming to the epinephrine induced arrhythmia halothane precipitates arrhythmia in combination with epinephrine it is a well known fact and that is also a contraindicated in the patient where adr to be used or if higher dose adr to be used the dose at which it is tolerated in microgram per kilogram of the halothane is 1.5 at mac level while for the iso sevo and das it is the 4.5 microgram per kilogram of the epinephrine to can be used with safely coming to the respiratory system halothane das sevoflurane causes the dose dependent decrease in the frequency of the breathing while isoflurane up to the 1 mac cause dose dependent increase and more than 1 mac no further increase in the frequency of the breathing while tidal volume is decreased by all and all causes the the net effect is the rapid shallow breathing which is seen with common to the all inhalation agents so what i am going to explain you is the ventilatory response that is all inhalation agents causes the decrease in the ventilatory response to the co2 they increases the respiratory rate or decrease the tidal volume and rapid shallow ventilation will decrease in the minute ventilation nitrous oxide does not increase psco2 and there is a dose dependent volatile with the ventilatory response to hypoxemia is decreased coming to the airway resistance all volatile anesthetic agents are a potent bronchodilators while halothane is the most potent followed by iso and sevo coming to the airway irritability dasflurane as i told in the beginning is most irritant can cause bronchospasm while halothane and sevo are non irritant and thus prepared for the inhalation induction while halothane causes dose dependent decrease in the mucociliary function so post op morbidity is increased if the halothane is used for over uh few hours coming to the cerebral blood flow volatile anesthetic administered during norcapnia normocapnia in concentration more than 0.6 mac causes the cerebral vasodilatation at mac more than 0.6 remember it 
decrease the cerebral vascular resistance and dose dependent decrease in the cerebral blood flow this causes the greatest increase in the cerebral blood flow nearly 200% by halothane while isoflavin causes minimal or no increase that is the least increase so cerebral blood flow auto regulation halothane is abolished isoflurane impaired sevoflurane intact while all volatile anesthetic agent causes dose dependent decrease in the cerebral metabolism of the oxygen and it it is equivalent to the iso dice and sevo world which is the much more than the halothane coming to the csf production halothane decreases the production by 30% and as well as it decreases its absorption too while isoflurane has the minimum attack by and fluorine cause the increase in the inter, in, uh, production as well as decrease the absorption so the implication is that there is a increase in the intracranial pressure parallel to the increase in the cerebral blood flow and fluorine increase the incidence of the epilepsy isodes and sevo no evidence on the convulsive effect on eeg and nitrous administration cause increase motor activity with clonus and opisthotonus even in the clinically used concentration coming to the next point hepatic system all inhalation agents causes the dose dependent decrease in hepatic blood flow which is and uh, das and sevo the effect is similar to the isoflurane so that effect is decreased by halothane and isoflurane it is maintained by iso but decreased uh, up to the minimum level by das and sevo as per the iso implication is a drug effect interference of the drug clearance by volatile anesthetic is due to the decrease in the hepatic blood flow and inhibition of the drug metabolic enzyme halothane inhibits oxidative metabolism of the drugs halothane produces large amount of the uh, trifluoroacetic acid which cause hepatotoxic iso and fluorine dash cause the minute quantities of the tfa so they are less least hepatotoxic while sevoflurane causes the nil hepatotoxicity coming to the renal system all volatile anesthetic agents are known to cause those related decrease in renal blood flow gfr and urine output it reflects the effect of volatile anesthetic on systolic bp and cardiac output while in com coming to the nephrotoxicity methoxyfluorine followed by n and sevo they are known to cause fluoride induced nephrotoxicity while sevoflurane is alone responsible for vinyl halide induced nephrotoxicity coming to fluoride nephrotoxicity it is a high type output type of renal failure manifestations are polyuria hypernatremia hyperosmolarity inability to concentrate urine first observed after methoxyfluorine administration renal threshold uh, plasma lipid for the fluoride toxicity is 50 micromo per liter and source of the fluoride is the intrarenal production by methoxy and enfluorine and hepatic metabolism of the sevoflurane Vinyl halide nephrotoxicity is caused due to the reaction of the CO2 absorbent with sevoflurane seen only with the sevoflurane degradation products are produced from compound A to E where compound A is known as the fluoromethyl 2,2 difluoro 1 trifluoromethyl vinyl ether it causes the proximal renal tubular injury precipitating factors are degradation of compound A to the reactive thiol coming to the skeletal muscle effects all inhalation agents causes the two fold greater skeletal muscle relaxation than halothane and nitrous oxide causes no relaxation more than one max skeletal muscle rigidity is seen with the nitrous oxide that is all inhalation agent causes muscle relaxation except nitrous oxide which on the higher doses shows the muscle rigidity the implications are that dose dependent enhancement of all volatile anesthetic agents of the neuromuscular agents iso das and sevo have the more helpful to the neuromuscular blocking agents in causing muscle relaxation than halothane and nitrous oxide cause no significant potentiation of neuromuscular blocking agent action so now we have uh, read by now and uh, discuss the chemical and physical properties of all inhalation agents now we will come uh, briefly about the each inhalation agents so that we can uh, discuss the case later on Humphrey David in 1800 first observed the analgesic effect of the Lawson case the cause of nitrous oxide however Horsfield used nitrous oxide to facilitate the extraction of the tooth how it's unfortunately his demonstration was a failure and nitrous oxide goes into the back tooth but similarly after few years it again came into the practice and becomes the main supply of the anesthetic agents along with oxygen coming to the physical properties molecular weight 44 boiling point minus 88 colorless sweet smelling non flammable non irritant gas with mac of 105% blood gas coefficient is 0.42 metabolism is nil excretion by lungs and supply as the at pure nitrous oxide 5000 kilo pascal at 20 degrees celsius full cylinders at room temperature contains only the liquid 
pressure in the cylinder will not reflect how much nitrous it contains as long as there is liquid nitrous in the cylinder critical temperature is 36.5 degrees celsius and antonax which is the 50 at the uh, which is the mixture of equal parts of nitrous oxide and oxygen at 15000 kilopascals at 20 degrees celsius so the manufacturers are utilizing the pontine effect which we will discussing with the separate with antonax it has a low blood gas solubility and rapid equilibrium of fa with fi ratio second gas effect concentration effect diffusion hypoxia and sink effect and nitrous oxide causes the enclosed gas filled cavity within the body so it is best to be avoided in cases where there is a chances of the pneumo peritoneum coming to the concentration effect it is stated that with higher inspired concentration of an anesthetic the rate of the rise in arterial tension is greater and increasing the inspired concentration not only increases the alveolar concentration but also increasing the rate of rise of volatile anesthetic agents in the alveoli that is if you want to uh, 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 more understandable this point it means that during the inhalation of 75% of the nitrous oxide and oxygen initially as much as 1 liter 1 liter per minute may diffuse into the blood stream across the lung which effectively draws more of the gas into the lungs from the anesthetic circuit thereby increasing the effective minute ventilation the other one is the second gas effect this says that removal of large volume of nitrous oxide from the alveolar air increasing the delivery of the second gas effectively increasing its delivery to the alveoli and increasing its diffusion in the arterial blood known as the second gas effect that is increase the alveolar concentration and hence the rate of the uptake of plasma of second in into the plasma of the second gas this is by the facilitated by the nitrous oxide uptake into the blood the second gas is typically a volatile anesthetic but oxygen also behaves as a second the key step the transfer from the breathing circuit to the alveolar gas from the alveoli to plasma and then from plasma to the effect site so nitrogen is the main culprit for the diffusion hypoxia too that is uptake of large volume of nitrous oxide into the alveoli during the recovery and causes the hypoxia by two means directly affect oxygenation by displacing displacing oxygen and diluting the alveolar co2 that may decrease the respiratory drive and ventilation and as i told you it diffuses 20 times faster in the closed space so it should be avoided in case of pneumothorax and as well as in the case of the perforations or uh, obstructions and there is a high chances of the air embolism when there is a increase in the pressure in the non compliant cavities such as cranium and middle area coming to the toxicity it interacts with the vitamin b12 and prevents the oxidization of vitamin b12 from the active cobalamin 1 ion to the inactive cobalamin 3 plus ions which leads to the inactivation of the methionine synthesis which is required for the vitamin b12 and folate as a cofactor for the uh, metabolism less than 30 minutes no measurable effect more than two probably interfere with the methionine synthesis activities ether brief notes about the ether it is colorless highly volatile pungent odor flammable explosive and stored in the cool area with solubility of 12 and mac of 2 to 3% it lungs stimulates the respiration increases the secretions kidney decreases in urine output liver minimum effect decreases the liver glycogen increase initially increase the car cardiac output then decrease and suppresses the vasomotor center it was initially used as a by the open drop open method however better agents are now available now so it is not used nowadays coming to the halothane the one of the most popular inhalation agents which is used since long synthesized in 1951 most potent mac 0.75 low blood gas solubility of 2.5 20 percent is metabolized in liver by oxidative pathways. Major major metabolites are bromine, chlorine, TCA, and TCA amides. The induction dose varies from patient to patient. It may be administered with either oxygen or mixture of oxygen and nitrous oxide. Maintenance dose varies from 0.5 to 1.5 percent. Not recommended for obstetricia except when uterine relaxation is required. Combined with its pleasant odor, it is suitable in pediatrics for inhalation induction. Although sevoflurin is now the agent of choice. respiratory system it as i told you it decreases the respiration increases the bronchial secretion but it is a good bronchodilator and hypoxic acidosis apnea may develop during the deep anesthesia cvs reduces the bp dose dependent decrease in the cardiac output and it may be advantageous in patients with cad because of the decrease of oxygen command demand git innovation of the git mortality causes severe post op nausea and vomiting remember halothane causes the maximum causes of post op nausea and vomiting along with nitrous oxide it relaxes the uterine muscles may cause postpartum hemorrhage concentration less than 0.5% is associated with increased blood loss during therapeutic abortions skeletal muscles relaxation post op shivering is more common because of the increase in the oxygen requirement which causes the hypoxemia 
hepatic dysfunction type 1 hepatotoxicity mild associated with derangement in the lfts result from the metabolites of halothrin in the liver from the reductive bio transformation of halothrin rather than normal oxidative pathways while type 2 is the fulminant type it is very uncommon severe jaundice and sometimes result in the death of the patient it is increased by the repeated exposure of the drug and mortality is up to the 70% so halothrin is not preferred for poor analgesia because of arrhythmias in cases post of shivering and possibility of liver toxicity but it is preferred for relaxation in the skeletal and uterine muscles not so hepatotoxic in children and it is a potent bronchodilator specially used for the copd patients and fluorine max is 1.68 potent cardiovascular depressant sweet and ethereal odor generally do not sensitize the heart to the catecholamine seizures occurs at deeper levels contraindicated in epilepsy and caution should be used because of the fluoride ions in the renal patients iso it is an isomer of the and fluorine isofluorine it is carcinogenic although not approved but some cases are seen in the rats colorless volatile liquid pungent odor stable no preservative is required non inflammable least soluble of the modern inhalation agents equilibrate more rapidly induction rapid theoretically but because of the pungent pungency it is not used and it due to its pungent nature it causes cough and breath holding in the patients during induction effects respiratory dose dependent depression of the ventilation myocardial depression but it also causes coronary vasodilatation that is the coronary still syndrome so should not be used yeah it should be judiciously used in the cad patient relaxation of the uterine muscles and other muscle body muscles uh, it uh, potentiate the effect of the neuromuscular agents cns at the low no change in the cerebral blood flow but at the higher concentration increase the blood flow by vasodilatation of the cerebral arteries advantages rapid induction rapid recovery least risk of hepatic and renal toxicity cardiovascular stability muscle relaxation disadvantage pungent disorder and coronary vasodilatation otherwise it is very close to a good inhalation agent sevoflurane non flammable pleasant smell mac of 2 stable low blood gas partition fast so causes the faster equilibrium and it is non irritant so that is the fastest for the induction respiratory non irritant very less depression cvs uterine muscles and cns effects are more or like of the isoflurane while advantage it is well tolerated because non irritant sweat odor sweet order and even at the higher concentrations rapid induction rapid recovery does not sensitize the heart and does not result in the carbon monoxide production with the dry soda line while disadvantages are less potent than similarly halogenated agents interact with co2 uh, absorber in the presence of soda line produce the compound a which is harmful for the brain liver and kidney 5% in metabolized and causes the elevation of serum fluoride so it can cause the vinyl type of fluoride vinyl fluoride toxicity postpartum agitation may be more common in children than seen with the halothrin best fluorine mac of 6 structure similar to the isofluorine recovery time is approximately 55% less than that of the isofluorine so it is the fastest recovery seen with the death fluorine however it is not so much because of the pungent smell expensive lowest blood gas part coefficient very rapid induction and recovery and used with the special type of electronic vaporizer tax 6 and tax 7 least potent inhalation agents eliminated by the lungs primarily by and 0.02% is metabolized in liver effects are more or less similar to the isofluorine but it is very pungent in comparison to the isofluorine and can cause the severe bronchospasm when used as a alone induction agent xenon is the most ideal inhalation agent present however it is very uh, less in amount and it is a cost a production is very costly so it is not in use still commercially it is non flammable odorless blood gas coefficient is only 0.14% least soluble hence the fastest induction and faster recovery possible mac is 63 to 75% gender dependent mac less in the female acts on the nmda receptors most cardio stable potent hypnotic and analgesic no metabolite is produced in the blood least side effects non teratogenic does not deplete ozone layer remember all other gases deplete except the xenon disadvantage as i told you it is very costly need special equipment for delivery and can cause the bronchospasm antonox as i told you is a mixture of 50% of nitrous oxide and 50% of the oxygen color coding is blue body with blue and white quarters pin index is 7 quantile in fact that is the normally nitrous oxide is liquid at 2400 psi g but if nitrous oxide is mixed with oxygen it remains in the gaseous state that is called as a quantile effect and this is the principle of antonox cyclopropane is the most inflammable and explosive agent pin index is 3.6 it is the liquid gas orange cylinder 
Cyclopropylene shock prolonged anesthesia resulted in the sudden decrease in the blood pressure, potentially leading to cardiac dysarrhythmia. And this was the reason why it becomes out of the practice very soon. But it's still still used sometimes for the pain relief in the liver anesthesia. So now we have discussed all the properties of the inhalation agents and their advantages, disadvantages. We will discuss in the few cases so that we can understand their particular use in particular type of cases. Mr. A is a 45 year old man with acute pancreatitis. Brought to the operating room from the in intensive care, sedated, intubated for abdominal debridements. Remember, patient is from the ICU, sedated and intubated. He has no drug allergy. However, he has the history of alcohol abuse. His all parameters are within a uh, normal limit except the KFTs and LFTs, which are slightly elevated. The anticipated duration of surgery is 120 minutes, and plan involves GA with endotracheal tube with IV induction and maintenance with the inhalation. So our question is now, which inhalation agent is ideal in this type of case? So alcoholic hepatotoxicity is a chance, allothene is ruled out. iso sevo dash are minimally metabolized should be used. Since inorganic fluoride concentration in plasma can increase following the administration of the sevo fluorine, although very less, but there are still a chances. So we would like, and patient A is also has a, some renal disappearment as by the risk of KFT. So we will avoid sevo fluorine. Dash is preferred in such cases because its elimination remains fairly constant regardless of whether the duration of anesthesia is 30 minutes or 6 hours. Plan is for Mr. A to remain intubated post-operatively. So it doesn't matter if this patient we need the rapid recovery or not. So Dash can be used but it is costly. If compared to the isofluorine which has no history of the cardiovascular respiratory impairment in this patient and it can be used as the best appropriate agent for maintenance. So isofluorine is the answer. The other cases, a girl M, 2 year old, 16 kg, was brought to the outpatient surgery center for an ocular examination under anesthesia. Her past medical history include premature birth and retinopathy of prematurity. She takes no medication and has no known drug allergy. Procedure is expected 10 minutes. Anesthetic plans involve GA using an analytic anesthetic for both induction and maintenance. So what should be the agent for this patient? Remember, ocular examinations. 10 minute procedures and there is a history of prematurity. Now it can be difficult to place an IV line in a child who is too young to cooperate, even with the use of topical anesthesia and small gaze IV catheter. In that case, inhalation induction of anesthesia with halothane and sevofluorine is often utilized. So since you have to use inhalation for IV, so dasfluorine and isofluorine, which are both pungent, are ruled out. Now, DAS is not an option as I told you because it can cause bronchospasm. Again, halothane may be excluded because Patient may be using phenylephrine or types of drug which may be used for the dilatation of the people pre-op and which can produce the arrhythmia in some cases if used in the excessive doses. So, and as well as there is a little risk of hepatotoxicity because the patient is a premature. So, halothane may be kept in the reserve drug if the sevofluorine is not available. Sevofluorine is the best agent to use in this patient because of short procedure, low risk of respiratory irritation as well as no side effects in this case and rapid oxide of effect compared with the isofluorine. Coming to the last case of the uh, discussion today, Mr. L is a 30 year old man presenting to the OPD outpatient surgery center in the emergency for left inguinal hernia repair. Past medical history, he has a bron bronchial asthma, never have been hospitalized nor was he wheezing or dizzy prior to the surgery. Medication involves uh, steroids, inhalation agent twice a day for his asthma as well as the salmetrol, which is a beta agonist. Mr. Lal has no, no drug allergy that surgery expected to be 45 minutes. Anesthetic plants is laryngeal mask airway using IV induction followed by inhalation. Anesthetic for maintenance of anesthesia as patient has refused for the spinal. So, DAS, ISO or CO may be selected for maintenance. At one MAC, remember DAS, ISO and CO as the bronchodilator effect. However, as the concentration increases to, to the two MAC, Airway resistance is decreased, is increased with the DAS. So DAS is ruled out. DAS fluorine is not used. Unlike halothin, SIBO, DAS fluorine and isofluorine will not synthesize the myocardium to the potential arrhythmia from the inhaled beta agonist. Since he is on the salmetrol, so I will not use the halothin. Now the choice is between the SIBO fluorine, isofluorine and DAS fluorine. Although DAS is not to be used if more than 2 mac is used. Sevofluorine is the best agent for maintenance because ISO and DAS would be appropriate if does, those remains merely the one. But if the uh, MAC is to be increased, then sevofluorine can be used and it is non-irritant. 
If the duration was to be last more than 60 minutes, one would expect a longer early and intermediate recovery from the isoflurane because of its significant 80% and 90% decremental time. In that case, SIBO or DAS would be a better choice. So in this case, I will use the SIBOflurane because of the ever mentioned reason. So now this is the time to thanks. Goodbye. And if you have any questions, kindly raise your hands and ask me. Thank you, dear friends. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sir. So could I intervene? Are there any questions from the students? Yes, sir. There are many questions. So I think we can take them. The first up. question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hope the first is question is. Of time, isn't it? Uh, we'll try to make up, sir. Yeah, thank you. The first is, sir, whether nitrous oxide is contraindicated in patients with peri uh, peri perforation peritonitis. No, it cannot. Uh, sometimes what happens uh, after perforation peritonitis, the per uh, perforation is sealed. So there is a chance that if the sealed is then giving the nitrous oxide, there may be explosion, there may be distension of the gut, which may interfere with the cell. So if the, it is a sealed perforation, it should not be used. However, if it is already perforated and the uh, content is spilled in the abdomen, it can be used. But at the at the uh, second time is that sometimes the surgeon says that they uh, see there is a chances of the gangrene after that. So they try to uh, ask her to avoid it as more as possible. Still, it can be used in the 50-50 ratio with the oxygen. Another question which has come up, sir, is at what MAC ISO causes coronary steel phenomena? Uh, it is seen usually at the, yeah, it is seen. It is, although it is uh, rarely seen with the, uh, uh, mostly seen in the rats, but at the uh, MAC more than one, it is seen to cause the vessel, uh, coronary vasodilatation where the blood is uh, squeezed out from the infected or the uh, dead area to the perforated area. So it should not be used at the MAC more than one in the CAD patient. One delegate is asking about the most cardiostable uh, inhalational agent. As such, there is no such, but SIBO is more cardiostable uh, in comparison to the others. However, SAV, SIBO, and DES both can be used. And if patient is not is having the CAD, then the isoflurane is equally comparable to the SIBO and DES. That was the next question, sir. That a patient post uh, of cardiac patient posted for non non cardiac surgery, the inhalational agent of choice would be the same answer. If the patient is having the CAD, we should stop the we should avoid the ISO. Otherwise, SIBO and DES can be equally used. Yes, sir. And so use of nitrous oxide in cardiac patients. Uh, cardiac patients, nitrous oxide is there is no contraindication until and unless there is a chance of the increase of pulmonary vasoconstriction. If there is a chance of the pulmonary hypertension, it is better to avoid the nitrous oxide. And last question, sir, how to induce using SIBO in children? The so same is the give the four breath methods, or you can give the higher concentration till the six percent. You uh, the child is uh, the crying the child is, the mask is kept on the crying child. As soon as the child is crying, he is taking the maximum type of the uh, tidal volume, vital capacity breath, it will be induced in the soon. And then once the child is induced, decreases it to the 2% of the uh, maintenance tool. These were all the questions, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lalit Gupta, for an uh, excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. I have sir. some questions, if you permit me some time. Sir, so, please. And we examiners are uh, very passionate about the history. And yes, you will try to cover the history in a very lucid way. So in, in the beginning, you have shown the picture where WTG bottle is giving anesthesia with the lithium inhaler. So yes, please write that picture. But in the time, this picture is given to the students. Yes, sir. So please describe that. Sir, it was that it was initially used for the inhalation agent as a, because uh, at that time it was thought the nitrous oxide is of no use. So once he tried to give it as an inhalation agent in the big room full of the people and it induced the laughing so that people enjoyed and it was like a scene created and there was a record like there is some like puppet show and like there is a joker he was performing there. So it was initially it, was, it is a very pleasant and it was discovered uh, just like uh, uh, there was actually it was discovered accidentally it can be used for this purpose but when it showed that it can be used for the recreational purpose it was sometimes used in the uh, like uh, pran, uh, old uh, long periods and it was given as a recreation in the long musical situations but later on uh, it was described that it can be used as a analgesic so it was used for the uh, tooth and uh, uh, rem uh, removal of the decaying tooth and also the dental extractions but initially it was lost, then it was again came into the effort and then it was used for the 
cesarean sections in the initial years of the king uh, queen elizabeth and then it came into the existence it is a very good innovation event at that time because uh, ether and were on the initial stage and nitrous oxide was the only gas which can be used from the recreation from the laughing to the uh, uh, pregnancy thank you dr lalit gupta i just want to add here sir please i think uh, why we spend why we celebrate this world in asia day yeah. it is 16 the 2 1846 yes this sir 18 sure that is an amphitheater at massachusetts general hospital massachusetts after uh modern wtg modern he is holding lithium and there is a patient name who is gilbert going for the neck surgery by yes sir dr wayren and along with him was the henry wiglo and another important person who coined the term anesthesia and uh, so that was the scene there when he removed the that jaw tumor and to reach that day he has to work very hard wtg modern Yes, Because sir. we are interested in the history, just for the benefits of students. That in 1845, Morton was also there. He was was the pupil, and later he was the partner of Horace Mills. But he was declared a failure. Where the yes, uh, surgeon Wellen said that it was a humbug. So once this feat was achieved, so he said this is not a humbug. And uh, some historical quotes. and the place where he has conducted this procedure now it is called the ether dome ether dome yeah yeah so that yeah. i wanted to when people go to massachusetts they visit yes. the smithy at uh, boston and then this uh, the, this ether dome they feel privileged they feel honored that we were the our forefather they were all dentists from that remote place to this place i think we have traveled a lot and uh, they are the pioneers uh we must remember and my yes. second question is you have mentioned about the nitrous oxide it has been used uh, since 150 years and yes, you have to replace it with xenon sir the xenon production is very costly and it needs special equipment if the if the uh, government is we have developed some of the qualities that it can be extracted from the atmosphere as well as it is a very trace element so it can produce in the larger amount i think the future is the xenon Thank and nitrous you. oxide should be because it includes the greenhouse effect and xenon has no greenhouse effect so the future lies with the xenon if we are have the capabilities to produce on a large commercial ever platform and my last question is uh, you have said the quality of a ideal inhalation and aesthetic agent should be it should not trigger malignant hypoparesis yes so in our sector we may be having after 10 days a case of scoliosis Surgery duration about eight hours, and is a known case of malignant hyperparesia. Strong family history of malignant hyperparesia. I just want to be benefited your benefited from your experience. That how should we go and conduct or work up that case? Are there any procedures, any special tests, or the availability of the dental in sodium? So how you will uh, tackle that case? Sir, most your of the case. most of the centers do not have the dental in sodium. So okay. if if it is available that it is a boon for us if it is not available that all the things is that we should see the what are the we should keep from the history what were the culprit factor like the scoli in the inhalation agent if they are then they should be better avoided and in those cases and there is still a chances that we have to give them then we should keep all the things as the cool like we should the cold fluids as well as we should keep the higher concentration of the oxygen and we should try to uh, remove all the uh, Insisting factors like the increase in the blood pressure or increase in the OT temperature, we should keep it as cool as possible. But since they are not possible, the only the history in the history and the testing is sir very difficult as such because it needs the special uh, history and special finding if this drug could have been implicated. And if the time is do not permit us to get the testing of the skin testing for those another, it is best to keep it avoid the all the insisting factors like inhalation, nitrous, and keeping the cool flood the. the cold ice fluids as well as the higher oxygen is the only thing we can do in so such uh, limited resources if the dentrolin sodium is not available otherwise dentrolin sodium is available we can go ahead thank you dr gupta for your very nice uh, answers no, sir, thank you sir for enriching us sir yeah i have to conclude this session so before i conclude i thanks once again the dynamic team of rml hospital dr kaur Dr. Akhilesh, Dr. Devan, Dr. Anupama Gill, who was very instrumental me to invite to this forum. I shall always be grateful. 
indeed it is a great honor and privilege thank you once again and i wish you all the very success and uh, best of luck to all the examination going students thank you sir and from my team my side also thank you so much sir heart, thank you from my side also heartiest congratulations and thanks to the team rml for conducting such a beautiful congo thank you very much thank you sir thank, thank you sir thank you thank you now before taking a break for lunch let's have another quick quiz the questions are being displayed on your screens please answer in the chat box nitrous oxide Uh, Doctor Devang, sir, they can we come back at two thirty-five? Uh, because they can have their lunch while having sessions also. We are already running twenty minutes late. Fine, sir. So let's break up for lunch now. You are expected back in sharp fifteen minutes. Thank you.
हाँ अब हो गया हो गया यू कैन सी मी हाँ सो क्या यू कैन हियर मी यू कैन हियर मी इसमें लंच ब्रेक आ रहा है ओके 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 Pregnant patient with mitral stenosis for electrolysis. The external faculty for this case is Dr. Kirti Nath Saxena, Director Professor and HOD, Mahanadi Medical College and Associated Loknayak Hospital and Guru Nanak Eye Center, New Delhi. Welcome, ma'am. And internal faculty is Dr. Nitin Chaudhary, Assistant Professor, ABVIMS, and Dr. RML Hospital, New Delhi. The case will be presented by Dr. Kais, a third-year postgraduate resident. Kirti, ma'am, please. Ma'am, you need to unmute yourself. So this is a case presentation of a patient, pregnant patient, having severe having mitral stenosis. So. Uh, the pg can start prashant is the pg what is the name kais is the pg, PG ma'am the name is ha huh? name is kais kais is the name ma'am no i can't see it is displaying as prashant it is being displayed as prashant ma'am okay so Sednesty. prashant the pg okay is... okay okay so he can start the presentation thank you good afternoon everyone Today I present a case of a 24-year-old female, Lata, who is a resident of Pargan, in Delhi. She is a housewife. She came to our casualty with complaints of amenorrhea since eight months and breathlessness since three days. History of present illness: Patient has amenorrhea since eight months. Was diagnosed with intrauterine pregnancy, apparently all right three days back when she started having complaints. I think of the slide should be shown now. The case presentation slide should be shown, shared. No, why don't you show the slides for the case presentation? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Ma'am, the slides won't be displayed. It will be uh, read out from the paper. It's been a common thing for all the PGs. so he will read out the case from the paper that he has with him thank you ma'am I'm just going to mute yourself. Ma'am, shall I continue? Any problem? Ma'am, present illness. Ma'am, can you? Ma'am, actually, uh, you were on mute. Uh, Ma'am, can we start with the case? Yeah, discussion? yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. History of, history of present illness. The patient had amenorrhea since eight months. Was diagnosed with intrauterine pregnancy. Apparently, she was all right three days back 
when she started having complaints of difficulty in breathing initially she complained of breathlessness while climbing one flight of stairs which has gradually progressed to feeling breathless on doing routine household work breathlessness is aggravated on lying down and on physical exertion it gets relieved on taking a rest and on sitting in proper position patient had presented with similar complaints at 4 months of amenorrhea for which she was referred to a cardiologist and on cardiac evaluation she was diagnosed as a case of severe mitral stenosis she was hospitalized for 3 days and was treated medically on discharge she was advised to continue her medications with regular cardiac follow ups however now patient gives history that she has stopped her cardiac medications for last 10 days and has hence developed breathlessness since 3 days patient does not give any history of chest pain awareness of one's own heartbeat dry cough blood in the sputum abdominal pain fainting swelling of legs bluish discoloration of tongue or getting up in the middle of sleep with complaints of breathlessness she was managed medically and was admitted for safe confinement obstetric history patient is g2 p1 l1 a0 her last menstrual period was on 24th of june 2020 Her expected date of delivery is 29th of April 2021. Her period of gestation is 36 weeks. History of present pregnancy: the first trimester was uneventful. In the second trimester, the patient presented to the casualty during the fourth month due to breathlessness, and her cardiac evaluation was done after admission. Her 2D echo was done, and it revealed severe mitral stenosis with mitral valve area of 0.8 cm square. her symptoms include on medical management and was advised to continue medications with regular cardiac follow up she was also immunized for tetanus and was advised iron and calcium tablets there was no history of bleeding or discharge fever or chest pain hemoptysis fetal edema fever headache blurring of vision polyuria or polydipsia polydipsia weakening was felt in the fifth month of gestation ultrasound abdomen was also done In the third trimester, she was continuing her medications till ten days back, but has hence stopped it and since stopped it and has developed breathlessness since three days, for which she presented to our patient. There was no history of bleeding on discharge, TV or abdominal pain. She is able to appreciate her fetal movements well. Her fetal count was more than twelve in the last twenty-four hours. In past obstetric history, her first child is a three-year-old female who was born by emergency NSCS under regional anesthesia. in view of fetal distress at a local hospital at 30 weeks of gestation her birth weight was 2.5 kg menstrual history patient attained menarche at 12 years of age the duration of cycle is 25 to 30 days duration of period is 3 to 4 days no history of any menstrual irregularities in past history in med- past medical history there is no history of hypertension diabetes tuberculosis jaundice asthma copd seizure or thyroid disorder In past surgical history, patient had undergone an emergency LSS three years back for fetal distress under regional anesthesia, which was uneventful with no ICU stay or blood transfusion. She was discharged after five days of hospital stay. Personal history: normal bowel and blood habits. She has a good appetite. She is a vegetarian. No history of any addiction. Normal sleep habits. Marital history: patient is married since four years in a consanguineous marriage. Social economic history: Patient belongs to the lower middle class. Family history: No history of any chronic illness or heart disease in the family. In drug history: Patient is on the following medications: Tablet iron and folic acid, Tablet calcium 500 milligrams twice a day, Tablet digoxin 0.25 milligrams three times a week, Tablet furosemide 20 milligrams thrice a day, Tablet metoprolol 25 milligrams twice a day, and so on. Injection penicillin G, 1.2 million international units, IM every 21 days. Now examination, general physical examination. Patient is conscious and oriented <coughs> to time, place, and person. She is moderately built and nourished. She is sitting comfortably at rest in chair. She is. Her height is 154 centimeters, and uh, weight is 60 kilograms. Uh, she has no pallor, edema, ictus, cyanosis, lymphadenopathy, or clubbing. Uh, JVP is not raised. No midline neck swelling. No sinuses or visible venous pulsations. Her face appears normal. 
neck appears normal no lymph node lymph node enlargement noted trachea is centrally placed her vitals are pulse rate 78 per minute the right radial artery regular normal in volume all peripheral pulses palpable no radio radial or radio femoral delay bp is 100 by 60 mm of mercury in the right arm in sitting position respiratory rate is 18 per minute regular thoraco abdominal airway examination on visual examination there is no obvious facial deformity no loose teeth or artificial dentures mouth opening is more than 3 fingers modified multimetry grade 2 thyromental distance and hyoventral distance are normal that neck range of motion motion is full on cardiovascular system examination on inspection the neck veins are not engorged the precordium has no deformity or bulging there are no sinuses scars or engorged veins on palpation the apex beat is felt in the left fourth intercostal space 2 cm lateral to the mid clavicular line tapic in nature left parasternal heave is absent palpable diastolic thrill is present in the mitral area best felt in the lateral position in full expiration on percussion area of cardiac dullness is felt from second to the fifth intercostal space on auscultation heart rate is 76 per minute regular s1 was loud s2 is normal a low pitched rough mid diastolic murmur was heard with pre systolic accentuation of grade 4 intensity with no radiation over the mitral area opening snap was not heard and respiratory system examination on inspection there was no tracheal deviation the movement of chest was bilaterally symmetrical no superficial veins scar sinuses or ulceration no signs of accessory muscle use the respiratory rate was 18 per minute thoraco abdominal on palpation there was no area of tenderness the trachea was central chest movements are bilaterally equal and the vocal fermentation was also bilaterally equal on percussion bilaterally resonant notes were present over all, all areas on auscultation normal vesicular breath sounds were heard over all areas no adult sounds were heard on abdomen examination on inspection the abdomen was distended moving well with respiration her flanks were full umbilicus was central and inverted stria gravidarum and linea nigra were present scar mark of previous transfers lscs was present hernial orifices were full on palpation there was no local tenderness the symphysic fundal height was just below the sepi sternum corresponding to 36 week of gestation her fundal grip suggested breach her lateral grip was suggestive of limbs on the right side and back on the left side her first pelvic grip in in first pelvic grip the fingers were converging and the head was not engaged in second pelvic grip it confirmed that the presenting mark was the head on auscultation the fetal heart sounds were heard at the left so so spinal umbilical line uh, fetal heart rate was 140 per minute and bowel sounds were present cns examination the patient was conscious oriented higher mental function was normal no signs of any cranial nerve abnormalities no sensory motor or focal neurological deficit on examination of the back the spine appears normal no scoliosis kyphosis or limbus no deformity of the shoulder no scar marks or visible venous pulsation and to summarize the patient is a 24 year old female g2 p1 l1 a0 was a known case of rheumatic heart disease with severe mitral stenosis with 8 months of amenorrhea presented to the casualty with history of breathlessness in 3 days after discontinuation of medications in 10 days admitted for safe confinement okay so uh, now what investigations would you like to get done in this patient firstly the patient presents to you at this time okay so yes, they are sending the patient for a pre op evaluation because uh, they think this patient may require anesthetic management at some point what would that anesthetic management be what are the likelihoods of anesthetic management and this patient may require labor analgesia Mm-hmm. because she is a uh, because she is a case of uh, severe mitral stenosis she yes. may also re- she may require uh, anesthesia if she is planned for uh, lscs because her previous uh, uh, delivery okay. was also by lscs okay so the, it could also be an emergency lscs obstetric indications are always there okay yes ma'am so one should not think that this cannot happen even before you do an uh elective surgery patient could always have some obstetric problem 
So what investigations would you like to do? Um, I would like to get a complete blood count. In complete blood count, I would like to get a hemoglobin to know if uh -huh. there's any anemia. I would like to get a total count to know if so there's any So this is at 36 weeks patient, okay? Yes, so now supposing that the hemoglobin is uh, around 9, 9.2, what would you like to do? Sir, pay, my patient is already on iron and folic acid tablets. Mm. I will uh, advise her to continue that. Mm. And uh, dilution anemia is expected in uh, pregnancy. Yeah. So supposing that she has this much hemoglobin, this is okay. Um, uh, it is on this on the anemic side. It is on less than. Um, it should be more than ten. Uh -huh. Yes. So what can you do to increase it to ten? Just thirty six weeks. So not likely to deliver soon. So there is some time. Yeah. Ma'am, I can uh, give her. A, I can tell her to continue on the iron folic acid tablets. Mm -hmm. Give her a blood transfusion. Uh, in this patient, uh, I would not uh, advise blood transfusion uh, because of uh, the mitral stenosis. Mm. Anything else that you can give? Injection iron. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how long does it take for that to improve the hemoglobin? Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure, ma'am. It takes about two weeks, okay? okay? So you have enough time. That is an important thing. That patient is 36 weeks pregnant and you have some time, okay? Yes, ma'am. What other investigation would you like? Next, uh, I will uh, like to do a serum electrolytes and a uh -huh. uh, kidney function test because uh -huh. patient is on uh, diuretic and uh, uh -huh. digoxin. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would also like to do a liver function test uh, because there is a chance of uh, right heart failure and hepatic congestion in mitral stenosis. No, so uh, do, you also... expect, do you expect kidney function to be deranged? No, ma'am. Usually, uh, I do not expect it to be deranged. Uh, but I would so like to know the baseline. Why? She's a young patient. 24-year-old. So why do you yes, want kidney function the, test done? The... Uh, uh, in uh, patients with deranged kidney function, the half-life of the uh, digoxin is prolonged. Uh, so I would like to know if there is any de uh, derangement in the kidney function. Okay. More important than that, what else do you want? Which component of kidney function? And the serum electrolytes? Yes, that's most important. So, because your patient is already on Diuretic. No? Yes, ma'am. So, yes, ma'am. That is well. Okay. And what else do you want? Then I, I would like for a coagulation profile. Uh, Why? Because patient is having heart disease, or is this a routine thing? No, ma'am. In heart disease, uh, so my patient is not on any anticoagulation therapy. But yes, yes. Uh, um, but uh, patients can be on anticoagulants. Uh, but this patient is not. See, this is a case presentation. So here your patient yes, is not on anticoagulant therapy. So what do you yes, expect? I would expect uh, an values with normal range. Okay. So still you want coagulation profile? Yes, ma'am. Not required. Okay. What else? Ma'am, then I would uh, require an ECG. Yes. What then, else? Uh, after ECG, I would require an echocardiograph. Okay. Why do you want a repeat echocardiogram? Because uh, after the the previous echocardiogram was taken the second trimester and now she yes. is again in, in deteriorated. So I want to know if the uh, mitral vibraria is same or it has again decreased. See, the main reason why she has deteriorated because she is not compliant with her treatment. Okay. Yes, ma'am. 
So that is the main reason. So you should actually put a full on on treatment and then get the eco done. Because yes, if she's in the hospital, most likely she'll be admitted now. She'll continue to be admitted till she delivers. Okay. Yes, so she has to be compliant on with the treatment. They would ensure that. And then do the eco then. So why do we want a repeat eco? Um, to know the current uh, status of uh, the... Of what? Will the valve size change? Uh, no, if there is any pulmonary hypertension, if the pulmonary okay. pressure is increased. So does... Uh, if there is, is any thrombus in the left atrium, she was non-compliant to her medication. So if there is any thrombus in the left atrium. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? If there's any left atrial enlargement. Uh, yes, and then the pressure gradient has uh, increased. Pressure gradient is measured by echocardiography. Um, a Doppler. Pressure gradient. No. It measure the not. pressure half times. Okay. Yes, it does. It is not. Okay. So. We have written here pressure, pulmonary artery pressure and transvalvular pressure gradient, but that is not uh, measured by echocardiography usually. Okay. Now supposing, why why did this patient, uh, now supposing that this patient has come, why do mitral stenosis patients usually present for the first time in pregnancy? You know, very often, uh, yes, patient was fine pre-pregnancy, uh, pre but suddenly she started showing symptoms of uh, heart disease and failure. So why did that happen? I mean, pregnancy, uh, the total plus circulating plasma, uh, the blood volume increases by 40 to 50 percent. The cardiac, the cardiac output increases by uh, 30 to 50 percent. The heart rate also increases by 15 to 20 percent. So because of uh, these changes, uh, as uh, in case, to, no, at 40, 40 to 50 percent is at what time? And at the peak, 32 weeks, ma'am. Uh, so. Usually they will present in. Usually they'll present in second, the third trimester. Yes, yes, yes. Because of the increase in cardiac output. Cardiac, yes, ma'am. Uh, so they start decompensating because whatever compensation was there, they were able. They usually what happens in these patients that they are able to. Uh, the patient compensates in different ways with this. Uh, learns to live a life, a sedentary life without and overcomes her problems. But suddenly what happens that there is a increase in the cardiac output and she starts decompensating. So that is why hemoglobin is very, very important here. Okay, so yes, hemoglobin should uh, ideally be optimal because further, what will happen with the he low hemoglobin? That will also cause a tachycardia, uh, ah. which will again, uh, lead to decompensation. Yes, very correct. So now you have this patient and uh, they call you at 38 weeks. That patient seems to have gone into labor. We think that we would like to deliver her normally as far as possible. So you please give labor analgesia. Okay. Okay. So uh, why do you think labor analgesia should be given? Is it the norm in your hospital? Do you no. give labor analgesia to every patient? No, ma'am. So why would they ask for this patient? You know, most obstetricians are not very fond of labor analgesia. So, <laughs> yes, so why would they a... be asking? There is a mental block towards it, you know. So why would they be asking for labor analgesia for this patient? And what are the benefits of labor analgesia? I mean, this patient... Uh is a candidate for labor analgesia because to avoid mainly to avoid the pain because the pain will cause tachycardia the tachycardia yes. that will lead to decompensation of the patient okay is it only tachycardia and tachycardia and hypertension no something more something more and increase it leads to valsalva maneuver valsalva yes ma'am valsalva okay so patient takes deep breaths and pushes and then again takes a deep breath. So she has this, this leads to more decompensation. Okay. 
So, what labor energy yes, sia would you like to give up? You are called to give labor energy sia. Ma'am, for this yes. patient, uh, I would uh, prefer an epidural uh, analgesia. Okay. So that doesn't stop. Say the whole thing. Uh, which which drug? Yes. How much volume? I would uh, I would prefer a low dose of uh, local anesthetic, uh, like bupivacaine or opivacaine, uh, okay. at a concentration of uh, if it is bupivacaine, point zero six two five to point one two five percent, and the volume of. Uh, in, in, if it is on infusion at a volume of eight to twelve mL per hour, or if it's bolus doses around eight to ten mL bolus. Okay, and uh, would you like to give a test dose before that? Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. I would like to give a test dose. How much? What? Three mL of uh, three mL of one point five percentage lidocaine uh, with uh, five microgram per mL of adrenaline. So is adrenaline okay to give in a patient with heart disease? Ma'am, uh, it does, uh, it does, it may cause uh, transient tachycardia, uh, uh -huh. but if it is in intravascular, uh -huh. and but weighing the pros and cons, uh, it is better to avoid uh, local anesthetic systemic toxicity than a transient tachycardia. And also, patient is in labor, so uh, patient may have tachycardia due to uterine contraction also. So no, no your concept is wrong. So <laughs> we do not give this type of uh, test dose, it is not indicated. Because what happens is that labor analgesia is not an emergency. Okay, it's never an emergency okay. as such. So what can you do? You use the same drug that you were using, supposed to use, and give a small dose of that. Yes, ma'am. And keep giving small doses of that because the total dose is very low. You are giving a dilute solution. Yes, okay. And usually we prefer 0.125 is not preferred. It is 0 0.0625 along with fentanyl, 2 mics per cc, or even intrathecal opioids can be given. Only opioid. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, for the first stage, even that is good enough. So, you can give that intrathecal, that means a CSE. So, you give intrathecal opiate, fentanyl, and then give epidural with this other drug. So, even that may suffice for the initial period and first, do first stage. And then you could give an epidural or you could give just epidural also. So in that case, you would be giving a uh, dilute solution of bupivacaine with fentanyl. So you can give 3 ml of that. Okay. Oh, okay. So, and then see uh, what is the level achieved. So this can give you a very good idea of whether it is intrathecal or not. You can wait for 15 minutes, half an hour. There's no urgency. And very often even this test dose will give analgesia to the patient. Then you can get 3 ml more and another 3 ml and that would be actually adequate. So what is the normal volume that is required for labor analgesia in uh, pregnant patients? Um, I mean, it is around 8 to 12 ml per hour. Uh, so about 3 to 4 doses of this would be more than enough. Okay. So this is the current yes, thought that uh, test dose should not be given. Now, how else, uh, how all would this uh, benefit And this will uh, prevent the tachycardia that can be caused due to pain. Okay. You uh, already the said that. The patient will be more that. comfortable. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. And uh, during uh, the second stage, it will avoid the valsalva maneuver. Uh, and only due to the uterine Both contraction things, will help in the yes. delivery of the baby. All these things are true. What else? Anything mm -hmm. else? Okay, we'll it, come to cesarean section then. Supposing that this patient comes for cesarean section, as uh, she's planned for a elective cesarean section, and your patient is now, you see the patient one day before, yes, tomorrow they want to do the cesarean, elective cesarean section. Okay, because this is a severe mitral stenosis. Yes, ma'am. Okay, normally mitral stenosis, they usually do not do uh, cesarean section and the usual indication is obstetric indication but because this is a severe mitral stenosis patient went into decompensation also at some time some point so they want to do an elective cesarean so how will you proceed 
uh, first pre web evaluation uh, i will uh, take a detailed history uh, i will examine the airway uh, you already then, done that okay yes ma'am then i will advise on the day before surgery i will advise the patient uh, regarding her npo and aspiration profile axis i'll tell her 6 hours of npo for solids and 2 hours for liquids and for aspiration profile axis i will advise you tablet, allow 6 uh, pantoprazole and tablet which, which, which guideline is this 6 hours for solids and 2 hours for liquid for electric case which guideline are you telling telling me uh, asa guidelines ma'am no that yeah, doesn't say so for routine case for elective case please yeah, yes. read yes ma'am it's 6 hours for light meal madam light meal light meal what is that light meal it is specified what is that light meal um uh, meal which is less in fat content no no it's very clearly specified okay it is clear tea no milk and toast without any butter so this is not indian diet this is western diet okay, okay. and you if your patient is uh, to be taken up at 9 am would you tell the patient that you get up at 3 am and take this no ma'am i will tell her to have dinner and yeah so have a light dinner and then sleep okay yes, then i will uh, advise uh, for arranging the blood and blood products and uh, uh, blood cross matching and typing okay. then i will uh, take a written, a written informed consent regarding her condition uh, uh, okay yes ma'am so on the morning of surgery on the morning of surgery first uh, i will prepare my ot Uh, i'll keep mm. the emergency drugs i'll check right, the yeah. machine monitors uh, the airway cord uh, auxiliary oxygen supply then i will advise to ship the patient after giving injection uh, pantoprazole and injection metoclopramide iv and to ship the patient on left side on oxygen in your, are you using pantoprazole in your uh, hospital yes, yes ma'am what is the drug of choice Uh, it's a it's two blocker ma'am ranitidin yes uh then i'll tell the patient to be shifted on left atrial position on oxygen okay uh and then once the patient reaches the ot uh uh-huh. then i will shift the patient on the ot table and give a 15 degree tilt to the left side i'll put okay. the patient on oxygen i will attach the uh, standard monitors that is the uh, ecg pulse oximeter and ibp then uh, I, i would proceed with my anesthesia so what anesthesia would you like to give her uh, i would plan for a, a graded epidural anesthesia for this patient okay so what are you going to use which drug are you going to use uh, i will use uh, bupivacaine okay so bupivacaine takes very long onset it's a very long onset drug okay it's yes, a ma'am. very good drug for cse But it's not such a good drug for only bed epidural. Okay, ma'am. Why? Uh, because our onset of action takes around fifteen to twenty minutes. Easily, more than that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So still, you can use it. I if can. You like, but I can use lidocaine. Yes, you can use lidocaine. Yes, yes. ma'am. So how many ml graded means how many ml are you using? Ma'am, I'll give it in uh, aliquots of five uh, ml, uh, and I will check the level, and I, I would like to achieve a level of T four. Test dose uh, or not? Test dose or not? Test dose. Ma'am, I'll give us small volume and uh, assess of the same drug. No, here it's different. Okay, because bupivacaine which you use. Will be how much? Yes, ma'am. It's point five percent. So it's point five percent. Yes, yes ma'am. So dose is pretty high. So that is why you should use lignocaine with ADR. Yes, ma'am. There is there has been some controversy about ADR, but usually ADR is preferred because it gives you immediately idea whether it is intrathecal or not. 
So intrathecal is because of lignocaine, and ADR will give you idea of intravascular. Yes, ma'am. Whether is it, it is intravascular or not? Okay. So ideally, and uh, with epidural, it is seen that uh, lignocaine with ADR is actually quite good because it gives quick onset of action, and it also helps in reducing the blood levels of the Pro local anesthetic. So that way, it yes, is good. Okay. So. Prolonged action by forty minutes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, uh, what level of analgesia do you need? I'm sensory level up to T four. By T four. Um, uh, because of uh, any, uh, we're opening the abdomen, so any bowel handling uh, can occur. So. Is that the reason? What is the nerve supply of bubble? Um, um, I don't know. It is vagus. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So you cannot block vagus. Right? So yes, that is not the reason. The reason is that they are pushing from above. When the head, when they're trying to push from above to take out the baby, at that time, there is some problem. And even that is what is written, but T4, even a little lower than that is acceptable, but this is okay. Now, first and foremost, why did you choose a regional anesthesia? Any um, reason why you preferred regional? Uh, yes, ma'am. First thing is uh, it provides a better analgesia. And uh, under GA, during GA is, can you not give analgesia otherwise under GA? In, yes, ma'am. Comparatively, but uh, this uh, regional analysis, analgesia is better. And uh, it, we avoid the uh, laryngoscopic response and intubation response that yes. can occur during GA. Yes. Then there is a lesser chance of uh, deep end thrombosis in those patients uh, who have undergone regional anesthesia. What what there's less chance of D DVT deep end thrombosis. Uh, so because when are you when 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 are you saying that DVT post op post operatively post operatively okay and then also in, uh, in regional anesthesia especially in epidural because we are uh, gradually decreasing the SVR we are giving time for the um, body to compensate uh, for the decrease in SVR. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we are dilating uh, because of the sympathetic blockade. We are dilating the peripheral uh, blood vessels, which will accommodate yes, the yes. auto-transfused blood from the okay. uh, uterus. So that, is, that is very important. That the auto-transfusion which occurs is compensated by this increase in the peripheral uh, circulation. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So this is what is the biggest advantage. So otherwise, in under GA, what will happen if this auto transfusion occurs? Ma'am, uh, under GA, uh, it, it is uh, one thing is uh, we have the, the, the auto trans. The, it can cause like uh, it can decompensate because the it can increase the circulating central circulating blood volume. Yes. Uh, so yeah, it can uh, decompensate. And may lead to pulmonary edema. When? Uh, if the uh, uh, blood volume is uh, just Im that, immediate, when? immediate interbottom, immediate postpartum. What do you mean immediate postpartum? The after uh, delivery of the fetus, uh, there is auto transfusion from the uh, uterus, uh -huh. and uh, that leads to. Uh, increase in circulating blood volume. Yes, but that doesn't uh, manifest. That doesn't manifest. Okay, so we'll talk about GA later on. But you see that volume does not manifest. Why? Because we are giving IPPV. Okay, yes, so that volume is likely to lead to pulmonary edema. But you are already treating the pulmonary edema by giving IPPV. Yes, so it is likely to manifest following extubation. When the patient starts breathing normally and generates negative pressure during inspiration, then the fluid will just pour into the lungs. 
Yes, okay. So that is what it helps. What other advantage is there, which is there in every patient? When you, the biggest reason why regional anesthesia is preferred. We are, we are not manipulating their way. Uh, we no, can control no. the level of the block. We can control yeah, the... Yes, yes, yes. What else? One important thing. We can, uh, it can be used for post-operative analgesia. It can be used for post-operative analgesia. Very good. And one more thing. What about bleeding? The bleeding is lesser in uh, regional anesthesia. Okay, so that is a very important thing. Because we are saying that patient is having heart disease and if she bleeds more, she will give more fluid. Then you might even need blood transfusion. Okay, yes, so these are the things. And then if you give blood transfusion, then more complications. So if we can minimize the bleeding, that is a very good thing. So these are the general uh, advantages of uh, regional anesthesia, which you must always remember. So first say the general advantages and then yes, say the advantages in this particular patient because of the mitral stenosis. Okay. Now, supposing that for some reason, this patient comes uh, as an emergency fetal distress and you have to do it. You have to get the cesarean done. Yes, ma'am. Then in emergency, we cannot use epidural because it will take time for uh, onset of action. So mm -hmm. then we'll have to go for uh, general anesthesia. Okay, so how will you give general anesthesia? In general anesthesia, ma'am, uh, we will uh, go for rapid sequence induction. Okay, so what drugs will you use? How will you give? We, I will use uh, atomidate uh, okay. for induction. Uh, okay. I will then uh, for uh, decreasing the stress response, I will use esmolol and uh, zelocard. Mm. Both. Then for uh, muscle relaxant, no ma'am, I'll use, I'll, I'll use a small old one. Then okay. for muscle relaxant, I'll use sexual schooling. Okay. Then and and uh, I will uh, use the, uh, I'll, I'll give record pressure. Uh, I'll use the Zelex manner. Then uh, I'll index, I'll induce the patient use uh, by uh, rapid sequence induction. Okay. And once the tube is uh, in place and the cuff is inflated and bilateral air entry is uh, confirmed, then I will remove this LX maneuver and uh, uh, connect the patient to a ventilator. Okay. And then hand over the patient to the surgeon. Okay. So, then, uh, go ahead. Is that the end of it? The no. Then uh, once the uh, 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 once the fetus is delivered, then I will give an infusion of oxytocin, uh, uh, 20 units in, um, 10 units in 500 ml, uh, slowly. Mm. Uh, I will ab uh, avoid, uh, methylagometrin and prostaglandin, um, because it, methargin? Uh, methargin? Methargin. I will avoid a uh, methargin and prostaglandins okay. because it can cause tachycardia, hypertension and increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. Okay. Anything else? Then uh, for post-operative analgesia, then uh, towards the end of surgery, uh, I will give a uh, transverse abdominal strain block. Bilater bilateral you forgot something else, no? Block. You forgot something else after delivery of baby? After delivery, ma'am, I will also give an injection fentanyl. Yes, so you should give something, some analgesic, no? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then? After surgery is over, yes, tap block is a very good idea. So, uh, with what will you give tap block? And with uh, <laughs> BP again. Mm -hmm. uh, with an adjuvant like uh, fentanyl. Okay. One microgram per ml. Can you think of a better adjuvant for this particular block? Ma'am. Has fentanyl been shown to improve the quality of block or prolong the block? In this particular block, I'm not sure, ma'am. Fentanyl. No, no, no. Yes, no. So, which, uh, if you have to give some agent, what would you do? 
Ma'am, I can also use adrenaline. So, in this patient, would you like to give adrenaline? See your patient. Uh, no, ma'am, that can cause tachycardia. Yeah, so what would you like to do? Um, because this means at least about 30 ml you are giving, at least. Yes, no? yes ma'am. Okay. So, what else can you give? Dexamethasone. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Dexamethasone. That yes, is a good agent because it doesn't cause any hemodynamic changes. Okay. So yes, this is this may be a good choice. Okay. Now coming to reversal. Uh, be... So you haven't talked about non-depolarizing relaxant. Uh, yes, ma'am. I will give a no non-depolarizing relaxant uh, also. Uh, like uranium. Uh. And uh, during reversal, uh, I will reverse the patient with uh, injection nearest treatment and uh, glycopyrrolate. And uh, before reversal, I will uh, also uh, keep s uh, ready to prevent any tachycardia. Okay. And uh, I will extubate the patient uh, once the patient is uh, awake and uh, uh, in uh, obeying commands. Mm -hmm. uh, then, then uh, after extubation, um, I will still keep the patient on oxygen. I will raise the head up. Uh, yes. So, how long should you observe this and, patient? Where will you keep her? Ma'am, this patient should, and will be kept in a high dependency unit uh, for 24 yes. hours for observation. Yes. There, and you would like a, to observe her uh, till what time? There's a chance for uh, uh, cardiac failure for up to seven days post uh, partum. Okay. So, so that, will, that is seven days, but immediate, that is what we are talking about that the auto transfusion increases the chance of failure. This patient already has history of uh, hemoptysis, which means that she was having pulmonary edema at some point. Okay, yes, so she's likely to go into pulmonary edema. She already has severe mitral stenosis. So, at least for two hours, you should observe her. And then keep her in a high dependency unit. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, that is uh, okay. Now, supposing that post-operatively, they call you that, okay, now the patient has suddenly got, she is not able to uh, vocalize. Okay, what now. will be the reason? Oh. Think of all the I'm complications. Not, uh... Think of all the complications, no? This is a severe mitral stenosis, okay? So and one thing to Otno syndrome or enlarged left atrium uh, hostness so always can be seen. Does, does the patient have enlarged left atrium on echo? No, ma'am. Uh, no. So the, was this a real case or was this a virtual case? <laughs> no, a real case, ma'am. Huh? No, tell me truthfully. Yes, ma'am. Real case. Huh? Real case, ma'am. Real case. No, say it truthfully, because severe mitral stenosis is more likely to be on anticoagulants. Okay, so the patient might be throwing from by. She could be having. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so she could be having pulmonary edema. She could be throwing from by. She could be having so many other problems. So one has to observe the patient, and ideally, if such a thing happens, you should call a cardiologist and have a look at. We should have a look at her. So that is why all that pre-op evaluation is very important. You are able to uh, compare the patient yes, operatively and post-operatively. So you get a good idea that what is her, what is the change in her neurological status. Okay, so I was going to say that pre-operatively that what is the importance of neurological status in this patient. So this is the importance. You, you see. What is uh, this raises the risk that if the patient has ever had thrombi, she has had pulmonary edema, 
and her ejection fraction is low. That means that this patient is likely to have many complications. So you said that the ejection fraction is 60%. Okay. Yes, so it's not likely that a patient who has a size of the valve as 0.8 centimeter would have such high ejection fraction. She already has history of hemoptysis, which means that she was sometime in pulmonary edema. She had pulmonary, she had respiratory distress. So patient was having many problems and she was decompensating earlier. But probably on this treatment, she has improved. Okay. But she can decompensate again at this time and go back into that condition because of the reasons we already discussed. Yes, ma'am. So, okay. And now I'll request Dr. Nitin. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Nitin can take over and uh, talk about the other things, the summarizing the whole thing. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, Dr. Nitin, you can talk about the summarize the, okay, this Make it full screen. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. So I'll briefly summarize this topic for all the PG postgraduates that we have as our delegates here. The mitral stenosis is predominantly seen in patients with RSD. Around 99% of the RSD, uh, mitral stenosis is seen to be out of uh, rheumatic origin with 25% being as an isolated valve disease and almost 38% of the patients usually have multi-valve involvement. Now, mitral stenosis can be graded into mild, moderate, and severe based on the valve area and the mean transvalvular gradient. The valve area normally is four to six centimeters. However, if it is less than uh, two centimeters, usually these patients present with symptoms. Mild is said to be if the area is more than 1.5, moderate being 1 to 1.5, and severe as an area of less than 1 centimeter square. The mean gradient is usually less than 5. However, 5 is to be moderate, and more than 10 is supposed to be a severe mitral valve stenosis. Now, stages of mitral stenosis, the current AHA guidelines have uh, come with stages of mitral stenosis. They are based on the valve anatomy the valvular hemodynamics, the hemodynamic consequences because of the valvular obstruction uh, in the uh, LA and the RVH and pertaining to it, the symptoms that the patient would precipitate. So they have basically classified them as at-risk population, patients with progressive MS, asymptomatic MS and symptomatic severe MS. Here they have basically talked in terms of the valve area, they have limited the valve area to just one value that is 1.5 uh, centimeters squared. Anything below 1.5 has been taken as a severe MS and a transvalvular gradient of 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury has been taken as a severe MS. Coming to the pathophysiology of MS. Now because of the mitral valve stenosis, there is a back pressure which results in increased left pressure which is reflected on the pulmonary circulation resulting in an increased venous hypertension followed by an arterial hypertension. Lastly, this gets uh, reflected onto the right ventricle, projecting it as a right ventricular hypertrophy, which often results in vent left uh, right ventricular dilatation and subsequently TR occurs. Now, because of the left right ventricular dilatation and the TR, there are chances of right heart failure in these patients. The second thing that happens is the left atrial dilatation, because of which they have increased preponderance towards the atrial fibrillation and uh, they can also have thrombus, which results in, which can uh, later on, because of atrial fibrillation, can go into systemic embolic events. Now, why are we so worried about the uh, mitral stenosis patient, particularly when they are the parturients? Firstly, the increased blood volume. Now, the increased blood volume increases the risk of pulmonary edema in these patients. Secondly, the decreased SVR, if seen in the patients, they are at risk of hypertension because of the fixed cardiac output state of mitral stenosis. 
the increased heart rate which happens with pregnancy results in decreased diastolic time which again results in decreased cardiac output and thereby resulting in hypertension the increased cardiac output as seen in the pregnancy can result in increased transvascular gradient which further aggravates the uh, severity of the lesion the auto transfusion which is seen with labor as well as uh, during the delivery results in decomposition as has been discussed in this lecture already the large atria resulting in atrial fibrillation and there can also be uh, uh, thrombus present in the left atria because of the hypercoagulable state which is already present in the pregnant parturients last but not the least there is an increase in the nyha grading in all the parturients if the pre pregnant parturient nyha grading is one then it, it increases by one in all the patients so one has to be careful of that why are uh, which valvular lesions are basically associated with high risk mitral and fetal uh, risk in pregnancy we have ms with nyh functional state of more than 2 if the mitral valve disease has severe pulmonary hypertension wherein the pressure is more than 75% of the systemic pressure if mitral valve disease is associated with a severe lv dysfunction with an ejection fraction of less than 0.4 that is 40% and in patients with mechanical prosthetic valves on anticoagulants the maternal mortality can be uh, classified based on the clark's classification where the patients with mitral valve stenosis with an nyha of 3 and 4 falls in the group 2 with had a mortality of as high as 5 to 15% now what do we the medical management during the pregnancy of these patients we need to maintain the svr and avoid tachycardia basically before they go into labor for that one needs to confine them to bed rest oxygen should be administered in these patients in case if they are uh, admitted uh, in the uh, in the an award beta blocker should be started to control the late metoprolol is uh, should be taken over the etanol because uh, etanol tends to have fetal growth retardation in these patients diuretics in cases of patients who have a low ejection fraction digox uh, sorry uh, digoxin to be taken up in patients with low ejection fraction and diuretics to avoid any chances of failure calcium channel blockers can be added especially verapamil in case patients is on af It has a the ecg is suggestive of atrial fibrillation anticoagulation therapy is mandated in all patients with mitral stenosis if it is not contraindicated and bacterial endocarditis prophylaxis can be there however uh, the latest aha guideline uh, does not uh, recommend endocarditis prophylaxis in uh, the patients uh, in the parturients with mitral stenosis coming to the anticoagulant therapy the anticoagulant therapy is indicated in patients with ms and af if they have a history of previous embolic event in a documented left atrial thrombosis if the patient is having a sinus rhythm however with a left atrial enlargement of as high as more than 55 mm if the patient has sinus rhythm with spontaneous contrast on echocardiography and the patients with prosthetic valve the treatment is usually warfarin and the ina to be maintained is around 2 to 3 The patients with mechanical prosthetic valve, the endothrombotic monitoring should be uh, should be started and should be frequently monitored. However, the uh, discontinuation of warfarin with initiation of ultrafiltrate heparin or low molecular weight heparin should be started at least one week prior to the day of surgery. Low dose aspirin of twenty seventy five mg per kg per day should be started in pregnant patients on mechanical and bioprosthetic valves. The ACE guidelines twenty twenty. uh patients on prosthetic uh, mechanical prosthetic valves says that if the warfarin dose is less than 5 uh, mg in that case you can either continue in all the three trimesters or it should be adjusted uh in place uh, and uh, low molecular weight should be started in the first trimester and thereafter warfarin can be started for the second and the third trimester however in cases of warfarin uh, more than 5 mg per kg molecular weight heparin monitoring of uh, factor 10a levels should be started in case one does not have the availability of factor a factor 10a less in their setup in that case uh, they can very well go ahead with the ultra filtrate heparin uh, infusion intervention during pregnancy and do we go continuous valvular lobotomy in patients before pregnancy if patient is symptomatic with severe ms or if it is asymptomatic with severe ms however the valve morphology of is, is of at most importance when you go for a valvotomy it should be favorable for a balloon valve monitoring during pregnancy if the patient presents with severe ms with favorable valve morphology and uh, is still symptomatic despite the medical management then uh, 
hypertonotomy is the uh, intervention of choice. However, the ideal time is 12 to 14, that is in the second trimester of pregnancy, just to decrease the uh, risk of radiation on the growing fetus. Last is the valve replacement, which can be done in patients where the valve morphology is not suitable to go for a valvotomy. In these patients, a valve replacement can be considered. However, the ideal time again here is 13 to 28 weeks. Some of the books mention it as 20 to 28 weeks. But the major uh, take-home message is that it has to be done in the second trimester of pregnancy. Now, what is the role of anesthesiologists for these patients particularly? These patients may come for uh, numerous interventions. First is the normal delivery where we might be asked to give labor analgesia to these patients. Secondly, they may come for elective or emergency LACs. Thirdly, for a non-obstructive surgery, it could be a surgical indication or it can also be a cardiac surgery that we talked about like a valvular or mitral valve replacement surgery. And last but not the least, for a post-operative care ICU setup. What are the anesthetic concerns or goals in a patient of mitral stenosis? First is managing the ventricular preload, that is the auto-transmission. So one needs to be careful of the fluid that is being administered to these patients. Secondly is the heart rate to avoid tachycardia as they have a fixed cardiac output state. Any increase in the heart rate would result in the decreased diastolic filling time, thereby resulting in decreased cardiac output. Secondly, these patients may also have uh, atrial fibrillation. So a rate control, atrial, uh, we should try and attain a rate control rhythm. Careful airway management as should be done on parturians. Absolution prophylaxis again, is according to the parturians who come for a surgery to us. Maintain PVR. To maintain PVR, one should avoid any pain, hypoxia, hypercarbia, hypothermia, hyperinflation of the lungs or acidosis. Maintenance of PVR to avoid falling the SVR, one should always be prepared where uh, adequate uh, suppressors would be final F in a cardiac parturi. Aortocaval compression should be, uh, uh, one should be cons considered about the aortocaval compression. They should always have a tilt, a left lateral tilt should be given to these patients. Anticoagulation, if the patient is on anticoagulant therapy, one should stop them the ideal time that should be there. And uh, if it is not, uh, we cannot uh, have uh, the ideal time to uh, stop these medications, then one should be ready to uh, manage it accordingly by transfusing uh, vitamin, uh, by giving vitamin K or transfusing uh, FFEs to these patients. And last but not the least is the blood loss management that one should have adequate blood and blood products at hand when they are taking these patients for a surgery. A plan for obstetric management, vaginal delivery is usually preferred in parturians. There can be indications for LSCS. Uh, mostly these patients come to us for an obstetric indication of LSCS. Uh, but however, there are certain cardiac indications as well, like Marfan syndrome, severe heart failure, aortic dissection, or uh, anticoagulants in preterm pre labor. Coming first to the labor analgesia, why should these patients be uh, advocated labor analgesia? I has already talked about it. Basically, to avoid the stress response in these patients can be avoided. It can either be an uh, epidural analgesia or one can go for a combined spinal epidural. Intrathecal administration of hypophilic opiates like fentanyl give adequate analgesia in the initial stages of uh, labor. And uh, also when you give intrathecal uh, opiates to these patients, the pain immediately wears off. And this patient can perhaps give you a better position while you're placing an epidural catheter in these patients. The second stage is the uterine contraction uh, and uh, the valsalva that the uh, patient would be doing. Uh, in these, in, uh, this is the time when the uh, uh, the a sympathetic uh, dilatation, you know, sympathetic blockage because of the epidural would help in increasing the venous capacitance. So the the auto transmission can very well be accommodated in the peripheral circulation. And last but not the least, one should try and shorten the second stage of labor by going for an instrumental delivery. Hypertension has to be managed at all times aggressively, and the choice of drug is phenylephrine in these patients. While giving a labor epidural to these patients or epidural analgesia of any form to these patients, supplemental oxygen is the environment. One should always be watchful of giving a left lateral tilt with a good venous for a good venous return to avoid the aortic cable compression. Monitoring should be done as advocated by ASA standards that should include an ECG to watch for the rate and rhythm of the patient, pulse oximeter and NIBP. Hypertension to be managed and uh, fetal monitoring should be done in all stages of labor. And uh, the other advantage of giving an epidural analgesia for labor could be that these, uh, the catheter can very well be used in case one has to go for a 
cesarean section in these parturients. Regional anesthesia for LSCS, no guidelines per se uh, have come out for regional anesthesia. However, the majority of uh, the European Society of Cardiac uh, Anesthesia has, uh, has advocated that regional is uh, better in the parturients with cardiac disease. It depends on the patient's cardiovascular stage, uh, status and also the experience of the obstetric anesthesiologist that is available. Uh, usually it's said to be avoided in patients with a mitral wall of 1.5, but now we have uh, sufficient evidence where it has been used in severe mitral stenosis successfully and uh, has uh, rather resulted in uh, better outcomes. Subarachnoid uh, sub block uh, sh can be given uh, in these patients. Uh, however, there are certain advantages with the subarachnoid block. There could be rapid onset of excessive sympathetic blockage because of the um, uh, vasodilatation uh, cause of the subarachnoid block, which can result in hypertension and thereby tachycardia to maintain the cardiac output, which again is detrimental to these patients. So it should be avoided or a low dose can be given in the parturients. Intrathecal anesthesia low dose, LA or OPs are uh, preferred and proper precautions should be taken if the patient is on anticoagulant therapy. Epidural anesthesia technique. The desired sensory level can achieved with the incremental doses as has been discussed in this uh, particular case. It is a titrable technique, lowers the risk of sudden hypertension. In case of hypertension, small boluses of uh, phenylephrine can is it can be used as a sole anesthetic agent in mild to moderate cases and also in severe cases as has been uh, discussed already. of local It provides post-operative analgesia, which is of very parturians and has a decreased sympathetic stimulation. The disadvantage is that it is slow in onset, so therefore cannot be used in emergency situations. Elective LSCS is preferred. For elective LSCS, it is preferred. This is a case a report of a patient with severe mitral stenosis with one of them in failure, which has been successfully managed with the titrated uh, epidural anesthesia. The Last is the combined course. spinal epidural technique for patients. Yes, ma'am. Three, three case, uh, case series where they have uh, three oh. cases. Yes, yes. Last is the combined spinal epidural uh, technique. Now the advantage with the spinal, combined spinal epidural technique is it gives a faster onset with improved analgesia, better hemodynamic stability. Uh, one can go for a lower dose of uh, local anesthetic in spinal and an epidural volume expansion technique can help in providing better hemodynamic status. Postoperative analgesia, it helps avoid the general anesthetic in case of uh, the failed subarachnoid block. One can go for an epidural anesthesia. Autotransfused blood is well taken care of by the venous capacitance that is increased because of the sympathetic blockade. Improved microvascular blood flow prevents the uh, DVT and it allows for early ambulation and return of the bowel movements. Also, the blood loss is seen to be less in, uh, has been found to be less with the regional anesthetic technique. Coming to general anesthesia, the advantage with general anesthesia could be that it could be rapidly established, especially when you have a severe uh, uh, patient with the emergency where you don't bet, bet time is very crucial for the fetal outcome. Pro can uh, better hemodynamic stability, prevention of aspiration as we have the airway secured in a general anesthesia. Control ventilation may provide the advantage of maintaining the PVR, preventing any VQ mismatch and can administer IPPV and P during the intraoperative period which can help uh, obviate the uh, signs of failure. Cardioversion can be performed if at all there's a patient goes into atrial fibrillation, cardioversion is what is required, mandated because of hemodynamic instability. Then if the patient is already in general anesthesia, we need not be required to give any more sedation to these patients. And for post-operative elective ventilation in cases of heart failure. How do you conduct general anesthesia in these patients? Pre-operative preparation to take appropriate informed risk consent should be taken. One should definitely be prepared to monitor these patients in high dependency or intensive care. Anxiolytics can be given in these patients. However, it should be uh, one should be watchful. One should uh, monitor these patients when you're giving anxiolytic in these patients. Continue all medications, cardiac medications, till uh, on the day of surgery. Morning electrolytes should be mandated if the patient is on diuretics. Most of the times you will have these patients on diuretics or digoxins. So uh, one should uh, definitely ask for a morning serum electrolytes. Discontinue warfarin five days before surgery or replace them 
uh, and one can start with bridging therapy with low molecular weight heparin. However, depending upon uh, the dosage of uh, low molecular he weight heparin, one needs to discontinue them 12 or 24 hours before the uh, time of surgery. And do arrange for adequate blood and blood products. OT should be prepared in a difficult area car should always be kept ready. The patient should be shifted with oxygen supplementation with left lateral tilt. Aspiration prophylaxis should be given and antibiotic prophylaxis, if recommended, should be advocated in these patients. They should be monitored, the, including ECG, so pulse oximeter, NIBP, and end-tidal carbon dioxide. Invasive arterial BP and a CVP is not mandated in all the patients. One has to look at the patient profile and then accordingly go for it. Pre-medication should use the uh, which may uh, include a low dose of fentanyl. In case you are giving fentanyl in a pre-operative, uh, as a pre as a pre-medication, one should definitely inform the administration of fentanyl in these patients. Etomidate would be the drug of choice for induction, as uh, thiopentone uh, or thiopentone in case you don't have etomidate. However, you should use them in low titrated dose. Ketamine should be avoided and propofol should be avoided for the risk of hypertension, aggravated hypertension in these patients. Modify RSI with succinylcholine is the uh, ideal technique of uh, in induction in these patients. These patients may have a prolonged breakdown circulation time, so you should give dilute induction agents. One should give them uh, slowly, uh, especially if they are a patient with a low cardiac heart. Pre-oxygenation should always is mandated in these patients. Muscle relaxant of choice would be vecuronium or rocuronia, which have the least effect on the heart rate. Atracurium and cisatracurium can have histamine release, which can cause tachycardia. Ancurium again causes tachycardia and should be avoided in these patients. Inhalation should be, be isoflurane and sevoflurane. However, a MAC of 100 and MAC is advocated because of the risk of uh, uterine dilatation because of inhalational agents. Halothane should be avoided in these patients. Nitrous oxide can cause pulmonary vasoconstriction and should be avoided. Fluid management is of utmost importance. One should be very judicious. It should be a goal-directed fluid. One should not really uh, be very uh, uh, aggressive in the fluid resuscitation in these patients. The first choice in case of hypertension would be to give uh, vasopressors to these patients rather than going for a high fluid bolus. Avoid hypovolemia as it worsens the pulmonary edema and hypovolemia as they have already decreased ventricular filling time. Avoid the lighter planes of anesthesia. Hypertension should be aggr uh, aggressively treated uh, with the uh, phenylephrine. In case of there is intraop tachycardia, one should be watchful to check out for an uh, adequate plane of anesthesia, ensure adequate analgesia, as most of the times uh, in cardiac patient, we tend to give very less drugs. So these are the two very important uh, causes which can cause an intraop uh, tachycardia in these patients. And last would be to use beta blockers in case of any intraoperative tachycardic event. If there is atrial fibrillation, then ventricular rate should be controlled. It could be through medical management using esmolol, propanolol, or digoxin. Or in case if it doesn't revert, one can go for a cardio version. Not the least of anesthesia, as we would be giving non deizing muscle relaxant. Uh, one should uh, be very watchful when you are reversing the patient, like be given. However, one should give the drugs very slowly to avoid uh, cardia, which was seen with glycopyrrolate, as it can again be detrimental to the patient. The points to remember would be the choice of anesthesia doesn't per se depend um, entirely uh, on the choice of the anesthetist. It would depend upon the, the lesion, the severity, and also the experience of the anesthesiologist with the, with the choice of uh, uh, technique of anesthesia he's trying to administer. Region anesthesia, Take uh, is based on the profile, the degree of hemodynamic alterations, and uh, the severity of the lesion. General anesthesia can be safely administered to these patients, provided the hemodynamic perturbations associated with laryngoscopy, intubation, surgical stress, and ext extubation has been properly taken care by using pharmacological agents. Last is the utratonic ducts. A word of caution when you're using uh, ergometrin, it should be avoided as it would result in increased systemic uh, vascular resistance. Oxytocin should be given to these patients, however, not in a bolus form. One should give as it in uh, continuous uh, infusion, also on the lower uh, of five to 10 units. Prostaglandin should also be avoided in case 
because they increase the uh, systemic vascular resistance and uh, sorry, the pulmonary vascular resistance and tend to cause tachycardia. Post of management, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, one should uh, reverse the patient if it is done under general anesthesia. In case of regional anesthesia, um, this would not be required. In case of any decomposition of pulmonary edema, post-op ventilation is mandated. Oxygen supplementation should always be given in these patients in the post-operative period. Monitor these patients for 20, 24 to 72 hours till the uh, blood volume reaches the pre-pregnancy levels. Post-operative analgesia is of at most important and try and go for a multimodal uh, choice of anesthesia uh, of analgesia. Anticoagulants should be started in accordance with the ASTRA guidelines. Manage hypothermia and shivering. In these patients, it should be avoided as they tend to increase the oxygen requirement of the body, which is not uh, wanted in these patients. And continue with your cardiac medications. Thank you for your patient listening. And I wish all the best to all the postgraduate students for their upcoming exam. Thank you, ma'am, for your um, presence. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions? So I think chat box is empty. No, ma'am, I'll put. I'll just... uh, please, Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Akhilesh, I'm talking, ma'am. Anji, Anji, tell me. Anji, ma'am, how are you, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I'll ask you. One question is, uh, is please compare how low dose thiopentone and please compare low dose thiopentone versus graded propofol for induction. Which thing you will prefer? To whom are you directing the question? Ma'am, to you, ma'am. Okay. So obviously low dose thiopentone rather than propofol. Propofol, that's many points. Firstly, it is a direct myocardial depressant. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, there are three methods by which propofol uh, causes hypotension. One is direct myocardial uh, depression, then suppressor of the baroreceptor uh, receptor reflex, and thirdly by causing vasodilatation. So it will cause hypotension definitely. So one should not go for it. And graded thiopentone would definitely be preferred. And actually, ideally, one should use atomidate. Why even thiopentone if you have uh, atomidate available? Uh, one more thing, ma'am. Uh, yesterday also this question came up. Uh, something called ketofol, ketamine plus propofol mixture. Actually, propofol is not approved for use in pregnancy. Okay, ma'am. Uh, so one should be very careful. You can think about it that maybe this will benefit, but medical legally you are not on sound ground. Okay. Uh, for spinal or epidural in pregnancy, what is the lowest acceptable platelet count? For spinal, it is 75,000. For epidural, it is 1 lakh. Uh, someone has asked, uh, what should be the concentration of local anesthesia and volume which should be used for epidural as a sole anesthetic agent? You can use 1.5 to 2% uh, lignocaine along with adrenaline. Okay, 1 and 2 lakh. Uh, is there a role of tap block in a patient undergoing surgery in epidural anesthesia? No doesn't give any additional benefit because you're using like he said for under GA you can yes, give uh, yeah. tab block for post-op analgesia but here if you are giving epidural you would hopefully have put a catheter and the catheter will can continue to give post-op analgesia and there are so many drugs uh, which you can use yes ma'am what invasive monitoring would be justified in this case well invasive BP can be done so uh, if you like it, but usually the general consensus is that invasive BP should not be used because thio, uh, this uh, cesarean section is a brief procedure and usually the patient is likely to improve, improve after the surgery is over. So uh, it's a sort of conflicting thing, but the general consensus is that it should not be done. Okay. But if the patient is so bad, like it depends on individual case also. If the patient is really sick, then maybe uh, invasive BP should be done. But then uh, you're asking me also about pulmonary artery catheter. Yes. So that, uh, no, nowadays nobody uh, accepts because pulmonary artery catheter, what information can it give you? 
because the difference there is a difference in the pressure on the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart okay so and it can itself uh, block it, it can itself it block the artery yeah. pulmonary artery so nowadays mm -hmm. nobody says mm -hmm. that you should put then again uh, patient may be on anticoagulant so again that may be a contraindication to invasive procedures is of bleeding no uh, uh when is this if etomidate is not available can we induce with fentanyl alone yes you can induce with fentanyl but then you you'll use need higher doses and then you should have to be prepared that the fetus might be depressed uh, respiratory depression may be there so you should give uh, tell this to the pediatrician who should be prepared to resuscitate the newborn uh one i think it must have been covered should we give lignocaine with adr as epidural test dose or if we give it without adrenaline how no, can we identify depends. no no it depends on what you are saying for i was saying for labor analgesia you should not use but for epidural you should use it okay ma'am uh in case there should be a diuretic post op post op prophylactically should we use diuretic as a prophylactic uh, agent in the post operative period if it is done under general anesthesia one can one can because okay. lasix would benefit the patient at this time okay ma'am uh, i think okay uh, some questions are here if we have to go for neuraxial anesthesia should we go for coagulation profile routinely Uh, actually, coagulation profile normally gynecologists themselves go for this BTC, TCRT. They normally do. So this is not be additional. But if the patient is not is on anticoagulants, then definitely we need it. And you know that pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state rather than a hypocoagulable state. So it will not give you any additional information otherwise. But if patient is on anticoagulant, then definitely you need it. Okay. Next is epidural dose. so epidural doses uh, dose of local anesthetic for cesarean delivery so most doses are 2/3 of normal this means that normally if we use 18 ml for epidural in this case we would need only 12 ml then again one should put a catheter and uh, give it in a graded manner because again uh, these are not absolute doses it depends on the height and weight of the patient also so this is there then uh, is ranitidine avoided cause of reactions we can use ranitidine actually ranitidine whatever concerns are there are for chronic use of ranitidine that repeated doses but here we are not giving repeated doses we are giving single dose of ranitidine so there is nothing against single dose of ranitidine then why is bleeding less with regional anesthesia i think you should be knowing that exam going pg why bleeding is less with regional anesthesia most of the halogenated anesthetics cause relaxation of the uterus you need certain depth so bleeding is likely to increase and in under sympathetic block with epidural or with spinal whatever you are giving it is seen that a uh, uterus contracts very well mm -hmm. and this may be uh, also because of the uh, sympathetic uh, normally uh, sympathetic this thing causes contraction of the uterus uh, loss of sympathetic this thing so uh, tone so that may be also a reason uh, what the reasons are there then there is something uh ma'am what is that and also bp is less with uh, regional anesthesia so that pressure head is low so that again causes reduction in the uh, bleeding then uh, ma'am what dose of dexamethasone should be used so normally we use about uh, 0.1 mg per kg body weight that's the normal dose that is used so you can divide it and uh, about 4 mg to 5 mg should be enough then uh, somebody actually tap block gives pretty prolonged analgesia so if you have to add something then you give dexamethasone then uh, what invasive monitor so we we just discussed invasive please explain again graded epidural doses so graded epidural is that you put in a catheter and give small volume you give the test dose first wait then give small volume and wait for the level 2 we uh, then check for the level then give small doses again and again this is graded epidural so you may give say 3 ml of test dose then give another 4 ml then give another 4 ml and then see what is the level and still if the level is not reached then you may add 2 ml 3 ml more then isn't subarachnoid block contraindicated is yes it is contraindicated 
so uh, we are not we were not, not advocating subarachnoid block at all in severe ms we were advocating epidural now epidural causes less hypotension than uh, ms the, than uh, spinal uh, one reason is that uh, the there is no difference in the uh, level of uh, autonomic blockade as compared to the sensory blockade so with spinal uh, there can be difference in the autonomic blockade which would be much higher than the sensory blockage then secondly that uh, so the level is as much as it is for the sensory blockage and with a graded epidural that is why we are saying graded epidural because you can control the level which can go out of hand if you are giving spinal anesthesia you don't know how much you expect this much but at times you know you might have seen also that even the cervical uh, uh, patients are having tingling in the fingers which is showing cervical blockage so this happens and at times the level may stay low also so then you would have to give ga so this is why we avoid subarachnoid block ma'am less uh, pertaining to this there is one question ma'am can we go for low dose spinal with epidural if it is not severe ms yes if it is not severe ms then one can go definitely so we can give low dose of spinal and then uh, increase the level with epidural epidural it epidom atomidate not available can we use with fentanyl so we just i just answered that mm -hmm. then uh, next question is why bleeding is less answered that epidural as sole anesthesia what dose in what concentration and volume so you can use bupivacaine also but i always prefer lignocaine with adr because effect is certain more certain bupivacaine by itself gives patchy anesthesia initially and this may take up to half an hour to 45 minutes for good effect to come so if it is elective it's okay but for emergency or semi emergency is definitely not good then for spinal or epidural in pregnancy what is the lowest acceptable platelet this we answer yes okay in subarachnoid block you have mentioned single shot not preferred so what does that mean no that was not for subarachnoid that was for epidural then please compare low dose thiopentone versus graded propofol propofol as i said is a no no so low dose thiopentone definitely then what other is there selix maneuver as general practice yes selix maneuver definitely spelling of selix is not correct ga with epidural in case of lscs with ms why do you want to give ga with epidural if your epidural fails then it's okay otherwise why should you give both in this case should we give diuretic post op yes people do give it is not advocated but there's no harm in giving it because you expect that pulmonary edema will occur if uh, following ga yes um uh, one more uh, ha yes let us ask is sequential epidural and graded epidural mean the same thing uh, sequential epidural sequential is usually used for cse no okay ma'am and should we give lignocaine with adr as epidural test dose or without adr so now this is also this controversy has been more or less cleared that it is better to give adr mm -hmm. one can give uh, lignocaine alone also but uh, many advantages also of adr that it prevents um, as i said that we are using it for epidural as such so what is the advantage that epidural this adrenaline once you are sure that it is in the epidural phase this adrenaline acts as a replacement for phenylephrine also what does phenylephrine do it causes vasoconstriction and it keeps the bpi so maintained so this adrenaline gets absorbed slowly and it may act you may not require phenylephrine at all ma'am one last question uh, how low should be the low dose of uh, how low should be the dose for low dose low dose spinal anesthesia when we talk about uh, uh, in case of a uh, non severe oh. mitral stenosis so how much low dose can we give uh actually we have done a thesis also on this and found that in most patients in many of the patients even uh, levels like 1.2 ml of bupivacaine are adequate for cesarean section so you can use even lower dose ke keeping in mind that this is a uh, patient with mitral stenosis you can give as low as 0.6 to 0.8 ml and then uh, wait for the effect to come and if you require uh, then you could go ahead with the epidural thank you so much ma'am thank you for uh, taking out the valuable time for us thank you thank okay. you over to devan
so can i leave thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you so much ma'am okay uh before starting the next session i like to make uh, one announcement uh yesterday also you got the feedback form and uh, quiz questionnaire in that form of a uh, google forms uh today this has been sent to you by i think 12 o'clock those who have not received that may please uh, give your email id in the chat box and uh, after that the form the questionnaire for the quiz will be opened at 5:45 pm so those who have not received the uh, questionnaire in the form of google form uh, in their mails so please give their email id it will be sent to them thank you so much we have dr satish with us i now invite dr satish kumar professor in hod drd medical college gorakhpur his area of interest is pediatric anesthesia critical, critical care and regional anesthesia i request you sir to kindly begin the session so would you please unmute yourself a good afternoon everyone i am adbul yes sir you are audible what is uh, we are starting new session that is equipment session and the first speaker is dr namita arora she is professor of anesthesia at ab vims and dr rml hospital new delhi she has a special interest in difficult airway neuroanesthesia and atls training she is going to speak about the anesthesia machine checks and safety measures dr namita arora please thank you very much sir <clears throat> good afternoon everyone i will be speaking about anesthesia machine is my screen visible yes akhilesh is my screen visible yes ma'am it is visible ma'am can you please be little away from your because uh, your voice is echoing little bit okay on <clears throat> hello yeah it's perfect now is it better yeah perfect ma'am yeah okay so uh, i'll be uh, talking about anesthesia machine testing and safety features so why are we talking about it we are talking about anesthesia machine checking and safety features because if you just google adverse events due to anesthesia a uh, machine malfunction and because of improper leave following checklist there are loads of loads and loads of articles which indicate adverse events and that is why it forms an important topic for post graduates so uh, what is an anesthetist in a modern operation theater like uh, v chopra and bovel they published a paper way back in fall of 1991 in anesthesia patient safety foundation and they mentioned that an anesthetist working in the operation theater with uh, well, surrounded by complicated machines is very similar to a pilot in a cockpit however in aviation routine and discipline used use of checklist forms an integral part of <clears throat> integral part of standard operating procedures and they spent considerable amount of time in teaching and practicing these procedures and although checklists do exist in anesthesia but they have not been standardized structured and disciplined and a regular standardized approach to their routine use is very often lacking so to prevent any adverse events it is important that we give emphasis to routine check and understand the safety features involved with the anesthesia machines and it's important to understand especially people who are uh, working in private setup and who have 
uh, heard people who are experts in uh, matters relating to litigation, regardless of the level of training and support by technicians, the anesthesiologist is ultimately responsible for proper functioning of equipment used to provide anesthesia. And this is very important for one to understand. <clears throat> So anesthesia machines can be of various types from very basic, this is a boil basic to say an Excel 210 to the modern day anesthesia workstations. So it's very important for one to understand the anesthesia machine. It's like when you sit to drive a car, you need to understand the controls. And here you are using it and it can be very deleterious for the patient. So understand the working and whenever you are not familiar, open the uh, user manual of the machine and understand the parts. So an anesthesia machine has two parts, basically broadly electrical system and the pneumatic system. The electrical components involve a master switch, which is used to put it on, a power failure indicator, reserve power in the form of a battery, electrical outlets, additional outlets, which are given to be used with uh, equipments, which come with the workstation, circuit breakers and data communication ports. These are all electrical components. And then the pneumatic components, which are broadly again divided into three main parts, the high pressure system, which, in, which is subjected to cylinder pressures, that is very high pressures. Then the intermediate pressure systems, which are subjected to pressures of 37 to 55 pounds per square inch and low pressure, which are only slightly above atmospheric pressure and they do not have a constant pressure. It varies, it depends on the patient parameters and the ventilator parameters. So the pneumatic components can be broadly, if you look at this diagram, can be broadly divided into these three areas. The first area is the high pressure area. As you can see, this involves cylinders. So this is a nitrous oxide supply cylinder, and this is oxygen cylinder. Then the, <clears throat> the shoulder and the yoke of the cylinder, and then the uh, pressure gauges of the cylinders and the check valves and the tubings through which this high pressure goes. These are the pressure gauges, cylinder pressure gauges. And then comes the pressure regulator, which steps down the high pressure onto the intermediate pressure. So these are all the areas that are involved with and subjected to high pressure. Then come the intermediate pressure. So remember the pipeline pressure is intermediate pressure. So this is from 37 to 55 PSIG. So nitrous oxide or oxygen pipelines, then their respective pressure gauges, then come fail safe valve, which is again to prevent hypoxic mixture from going in. Then <clears throat> oxygen supply failure alarm, again comes in the intermediate pressure system. The oxygen flush valve and any other, or other auxiliary oxygen ports may be for running the ventilator or for running jet ventilator or for sometimes suction. So these are all, these all form the intermediate up to the point that the flow control valve following which once the, they come into the flow meters, then they come into the low pressure circuit and from the flow meter through the vaporizers, that is the back bar, and then coming on to the check valve and the machine gas, common gas outlet. So that is how pneumatic components are divided. Coming to high pressure division, the first thing, as I told you, I'm leaving out the cylinders, not going into the detail, restricting myself to the machine. So the area where the machine on the machine the cylinder is attached is called the yoke hanger and then the yoke block we'll come to these individually so uh, this is a yoke ha yoke hanger 
and you can see it has multiple parts the main body of the yoke hanger then the retaining screw the nipple from where the gas enters the machine the index pins washer filter filter is important because it prevents any dust from entering into the machine the check valve assembly and the swinging gate so the body it provides a tight it first provides a support for the cylinder to be attached provides a tight seal because of this washer and ensures unidirectional flow of gases wherever i am just talking about the features of the machine but wherever you see this symbol that is a safety measure that has been provided because the time is limited i'm not going to first talk about the machine then talk separately about the safety measures so then there is this retaining screw with the characteristic threads which for which go into the middle of the gate and it fits into a conical depression which is on the cylinder yoke so the cylinder yoke has two parts on one side is a conical depression which is for the for the retaining screw and on the other side is the port from where the gas comes out and the respective holes for the pin index so once the cylinder is hung on to this the port of the cylinder has to be in line with the nipple this is the nipple with the washer it the nipple projects from the side of the yoke and fits into the gas outlet there is something called a pin index safety system which was proposed in 1952 that was to inadvertently prevent cross uh, a connection or cross putting of uh, cylinders on different yokes it was accepted in 54 in uk and 65 in us not very far back in the uh, history so system of gas specific pin and hole positions arranged in an arc under nipple or gas outlet from the cylinder so this is how they are arranged this is the place where the nipple is and these are the areas for the pin with this defined numbers 1 2 3 on this side and 4 5 6 on this side with 7 in the center and there are, so there are these seven specific positions they are formed at 60 degree angle from the outlet and 12 degree angle between the two positions so these are the pin positions of the normally used gases air being 15 oxygen being 25 nitrous is 35 and antonox that is oxygen nitrous equi mixture is 7 coming to the washer very important again it seals the cylinder valve and the yoke prevents any leakage we are all familiar with washers they are used at many places so here it's important that a single washer is put to prevent uh, the pin index being uh, nullified so it fits over the nipple it has got a metal rim at the periphery it is 1 mm thick and 2.4 mm in the middle so something called a yoke block what is a yoke block yoke block is something which sort of replaces the it it is something which is fixed on to the hose of a pipe which comes from the uh, wall outlet and is fixed so that it forms a connection between the hose of the pipe gas and the machine but you can see a, a symbol of caution here it is to be discouraged to use a yoke block because yoke block on the side where it fixes to the hose has got no safety mechanism so a yoke block can be attached to any of the hoses a yoke block block which has got pin index of oxygen can be attached to nitrous oxide hose and hence can cause an inadvertent giving of hypoxic mixture so that is why it should be discouraged 
so can pin index at the yoke be uh, bypassed if there is breakage of pins then any cylinder can fit into it if like i told you we put a double washer then also it can be bypassed or if the pin gets pushed in or if the yoke is put upside down by mistake so coming to the cylinder pressure gauge remember we are talking about all the high pressure systems so cylinder pressure gauge is specific for each gas cylinder uh, and it is got a gauge which is also called the bordon tube uh, it has got a bordon tube attached to it that is a hollow king tube which is attached inside and one end is open and is open to the gas whenever there is high pressure the coil tube opens up and is calibrated to indicate the pressure of course now the digital gauges are also available and the safety mechanism is they should have the scale should have 33 more than 33% of the maximum gas pressure that is recordable and should be confined within 182 to 80 degrees that is position 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock and the there is another safety mechanism they are color coded and the name of the gas for which they are to be used is also written on the pressure gauge coming to the pressure regulators they help to reduce the high pressure of cylinders to intermediate pressure they are attached they come between the gas cylinder and further into the machine they convert into a constant pressure and which is important because otherwise the flow meters will be subjected to variable pressure and every time one will have to change the flows to maintain a fixed flow coming to the intermediate pressure system this receives gases at reduced pressure that is 37 to 55 psi it involves flow meter assembly pipeline inlet connections from the wall outlet pipeline pressure gauges ventilator power outlet oxygen flush and oxygen pressure failure device so uh, the first thing like i told you are the pipeline inlet connections they should be non interchange interchangeable they can be either quick connections quick type or diameter index safety system type the diameter safety index system it involves three parts body nipple and a bracket and there is variation in the caliber of the nose and the shoulder which gives a different caliber and then this goes and fits into the wall outlet so this is quite uh, uh, fail safe and very very Uh, reliable and in fact the ansi standard uh, uh, says that every anesthesia machine which provides connections for the pipe gases should have diameter index safety system however now quick connections are also available in the form of diamond probes or other probes and their shapes will vary and the wall plate will vary to fit in this to take in this probe however these are easy to connect one with one hand they can easily be connected but there is a caution these are more convenient but tend to leak more often so one has to do a more confirmed tug test to ensure that they are fitted well so these are the features of the intermediate pneumatic system the flow meter assembly the oxygen flush the auxiliary port for connecting the ventilators and the uh, wall outlet and the pressure gas pressure tubings so there are some auxiliary oxygen outlets are also provided this these may be to run the pneumatically driven ventilators 
uh, I'm sure a lot of PGs who are familiar with the Primus machine have not seen these, but I would suggest it's a good idea to go into OTs where these uh, uh, non-functional machines are there to go and see how these parts look and what functions they had. Then there are additional oxygen outlets which may be given in the form of auxiliary ports or for high frequency ventilation, blood pressure cuff inflation sometimes for spray using as a spray and for suction operation. There's something called hypoxia prevention safety devices. These are also part of the intermediate pneumatic system. So these can be either something which involve mandatory minimum oxygen flow. Again, a safety mechanism. So they would ensure a minimum 50 to 250 ml or per minute of oxygen flow before other gases can be uh, uh, put in or uh, the flow meter can be started. However, these do not prevent mixture of uh, hypoxic mixture going into the patient. Then another thing that came up was minimum oxygen ratio. This can, this ensures that hypoxic mixture is not going to the patient so this can be ensured either by mechanical linkage or by electronic linkage. Mechanical linkage is a mechanical linkage between nitrous oxide and oxygen flow control valves because of which when one is uh, turned, the other automatically turns. So there is no way you can increase the nitrous oxide flow more than the oxygen. That is not hypoxic mixture that I mean. Then electronic link, linkage and electronic system can be used to provide minimum ratio of oxygen to nitrous oxide flow. And here electronically one is able, to, the machine is able to uh, gauge whether there is enough percentage of oxygen in the uh, final mixture that is being delivered to the patient. And then of course there are alarms which indicate the uh, low level of oxygen in the uh, uh, final uh, fresh gas flow. So this is the mechanical linkage that I was talking about. This is also called link 25. Then oxygen pressure failure device. In an anesthesia machine, it may be equipped with a device that a reduction in oxygen flow due to a drop in the supply pressure below 50% of normal will result in cessation of flow of all other gases. So this is something which is, pro, which is uh, mandatory by the ANSI machine standards. Then these oxygen failure safety devices are located in the intermediate pressure system upstream of the flow control valves of all gases except nitrous oxide, except oxygen. Thus oxygen pressure acts as a control for all other gases and is set to close nitrous oxide line if there is drop in the oxygen pressure. So here you can see oxygen pressure, if it is 50 PSI, then it provides pressure, it is giving constant pressure here and this seat is lowered and allows nitrous oxide to flow into the machine. However, if oxygen pressure drops below 50, then the pressure is not there on this seat. As a result, it blocks the inflow of nitrous oxide and as a result, hypoxic mixture cannot be delivered to the patient. Low pressure alarm sensitive to pressure drop are also part of the intermediate system and they are actually activated by a pressure drop of more than 50%. 
and these can be of various types may be spring loaded electronic or whistle type so whenever there is a drop in the pressure of oxygen some air is suddenly blown into the alarm to blow a whistle and if oxygen supply pressure falls below the manufacturer specified threshold then an alarm is activated within 5 seconds so some machines have a level of 28 psi for oxygen pressure draker machine has 30 to 37 and another important mecha safety mechanism is that these alarms cannot be silenced for longer than 120 seconds and cannot be disabled and there can be pneumatic alarms also and remember that if there is a whistle which is blowing it is only to alert you if it stops blowing does not mean that the correction has happened only initially to sound some gas may flow and blow the whistle you have to take corrective action but these devices also have certain limitations they depend on pressure and not on flow and do not guard against accidents that occur due to crossover in pipeline cylinders containing wrong gas operator errors like closing oxygen flow control valve and leakage downstream of device coming to another component of intermediate system flow flow meter it consists of body stem and seat and flow control knob so the flow control knob in itself has many safety mechanisms it is gas specific in shape and in uh color and the oxygen flow control knob is the biggest and it is touch coded the shape is different so even if you are looking somewhere else and in emergency you have to switch to 100% oxygen one is able to do it without inadvertently giving 100% of the other gas and oxygen knob generally stands out compared to the rest of the knobs and a minimum inter knob distance as per standards should be at least 25 mm to prevent any other knob being turned when you want to turn the knob of oxygen and bar guard protected or recessed that is these knobs are slightly inwardly present in a recess to prevent any inadvertent touching and changing of flow meter readings then these flow meters are arranged in series and in parallel so the ones that are arranged in series are for the same gas there is one which indicates only uh, for smaller uh, flows up to 1 liter and second gives higher flows and only once the first flow meet first one fills up at the second so if both are showing a reading you get take the reading from the second flow meter and they the parallel arrangement for two different gas flow meters and as per the standards oxygen should be delivered downstream of all other flow meters there are certain problems with the flow meter a person may not read the bobbin accurately improper assembly or connection is possible all these things i am talking about more so in the less advanced machines where there were physical flow meters nowadays with anesthesia workstations we have virtual flow meters so these problems are circumvented again failure to rotate back pressure float damage and float used to get stuck at the top when suddenly the flows were increased there may be blockage of the tube outlet then reading of wrong flow and changes in flow position the safety mechanism on the bobbin used to be that they used to rotate they used to have a white dot to indicate that they are rotating but because of some static charge they used to stop rotating unless you would increase or decrease the flow 
and as you can see leaks is written in red with a big caution mark if there is any leak inadvertently in the oxygen tubing flow meter tubing and it leaks through there then there is very it is very difficult to uh, detect in the older machines where you there used to be no oxygen measuring device at the uh, common gas outlet so like i told you if the oxygen tubing shows a leak has a leak then either of the gases can be irrespective of which gases were even if oxygen is downstream and there is a leak in the oxygen tubing it can cause hypoxic mixture being delivered to the patient then something called proportioning devices like i told you ensure minimum concentration of oxygen relative to nitrous oxide and there are various mechanisms to ensure that coming to the oxygen flush valve it can deliver unmetered oxygen at 30 to 65 liters per minute and it is independent of the master switch can be delivered even if the machine is in off position in the older machines then self closing type to prevent barrow trauma that when you it has got a spring loaded valve when you press it it delivers only till such time that you keep it pressed and then when you leave it it closes by itself and the button is recessed as you can see it is encased in this and the fact that it is encased there the inadvertent pressing of the oxygen flush is uh, minimized then it produces a pressure change in the machine circuitry which may cause a vaporizer increase in the vaporizer output or flow indicator readings may change because there may be a slight depression in the flow meter reading now remember that whenever oxygen flush is being activated nowadays there are these latest vaporizers they are uh compensated flow compensated and they do not give higher output because of the back pressure changes and it is recommended that activation of this oxygen flush should not change the pressure at the vaporizer out, outlet by more than 10 kpa and should not be kept on for a long time as i said it can lead to barrow trauma coming to the low pressure system in the machine from outlet of flow meter assembly to common gas outlet so this involves the output of the flow meters the back bar the vaporizers the back pressure safety device and the common gas outlet so as you can see in these older machines just just after the the flow meter output then the back bar the vaporizers the uh, uh the pop off valve and the common gas outlet so the vaporizers i'm not going into the details of the vaporizers because you have a separate lecture on vaporizers but i would talk about the safety uh, features the vaporizers are color coded for the agent and the bottle and the filling device all are color coded and these are internationally accepted colors for individual agents and then the, another mechanism in the in the uh, vaporizer is one needs to press this and then rotate inadvertently one cannot rotate this one has to press this and then rotate it then agent specific keyed filling devices are available which prevent any cross filling of agent and there is a something called an interlock mechanism which prevents two vaporizers from being put on at the same time so that there is no mixing in these uh, vaporizers because these vaporizers are very difficult to clean if a wrong agent gets into them and so there is this bar in case you want to 
uh, remove this, then you have to swivel this lever and free this vaporizer to remove it. And only then you can fill the, uh, only then you can attach a different vaporizer. Coming to the pressure relief device, some machines have a pressure relief device near the common gas outlet to protect the machine from high pressures. And it this, this has got a valve which opens to atmosphere and vents gas to atmosphere if a preset pressure is exceeded and it is set by the manufacturer. Coming to the common gas outlet, the exit point of all gases and vapors is from the common gas outlet after the mixing. And it's usually at the level of the working surface and may be recessed or guarded to prevent any sudden disconnection of the circuit which, which is attached here. And gas pressure at this outlet may be four to eight PSI and that is uh, above atmospheric and it is it generally uh, accepts a 15 millimeter female slip in and a 22 millimeter male connection the safety features include i'm summarizing now for the whole anesthesia machine anti static large caster wheels then front wheel locking bar is there plus a small floor space which gives more area all around color coded cylinders provisions to accommodate two type e cylinders high pressure gas conduit tubing pin index safety system pressure gauges pressure reducing valves oxygen fail safe device low pressure alarm and two auxiliary ox oxygen outlet quick couplers then nowadays we have an auxiliary oxygen port also available in case there is any electro electrical failure in the machine one can use the auxiliary port which gives oxygen one can attach a main circuit or a istp circuit and use it for uh, ventilation and otherwise there are other uh, we can even use it for giving oxygen supplementation to patients say who are in regional then there are these these machines the newer machines also have a possibility of quickly switching to um, uh, manual mode from ventilatory mode so coming to uh, i hope everyone has understood the uh, machine the parts of the machine and the um, three systems the high pressure intermediate and low pressure and the safety features so when do we check the machine we definitely check every day before administering anesthesia to the first case like when we get into the car in the morning we make sure that everything is okay there is enough fuel there is enough um, uh, air in the tires and everything. We set our seats, we set everything same way. It's very important when you get into the theater, you check the anesthesia machine. That is the tool that is your tool, which you have to sharpen every day to use. Whenever any change has been made to the system, then you should, or the machine has been moved, then also you check. If say you have moved it because there was some OT cleaning or there was some uh, glitch in the machine and you had to bring another machine. So whenever a machine is moved, you should always check it. And a short checkout of the breathing system should always precede administration of an anesthetic. So the machine check when you perform, it's under category, eight categories emergency ventilation equipment, high pressure system, low pressure system, scavenging system, then the breathing system, manual and automatic ventilation, monitors and the final position. So FTA recommends that you should always verify backup ventilation equipment is available and functioning properly 
functioning, maybe a manual resuscitator bag or a oxygen cylinder or another wall outlet with a Bain circuit or a ISTP circuit, depending on the category of the patient that you are going to take up a, this should always be ensured. Then check the oxygen cylinder supply. This is a, a Dagger Primus machine that we have in our hospital. And there, the on this panel, we have the cylinder pressures and the pipeline pressures. So check the oxygen cylinder supply. There is This provides position for one oxygen cylinder, a B-type cylinder at the back. So ensure, put it on, check the uh, gauge, check that it has got at least 1000 PSI pressure, then close the cylinder after having checked it. And if you are going to use nitrous, then check the pressure in the nitrous oxide cylinder also and close it. Then check central pipeline supplies, check that the hoses are connected and engaged do a tug test. Like I told you, the quick couplers need not be attached very well. Then pipeline gauges should read, read about 50 PSI pressure. The ASTM anesthesia workstation requires that every anesthesia machine have a diameter index safety system fitting for each pipeline inlet. So here, this is going into the pendant and then this will then go to the machine and that should have a disc fitting. Then verify patient suction, whether it's adequate to clear the airway prior to each use. Then low pressure system, check the initial status, close the flow control valves and turn the vaporizers off. Check if they are filled properly and tighten all the vaporizers filler caps. Check all connections if they are secure and the pressures are okay. Check leak in the low pressure system. Verify that the machine master switch and flow control valves are functioning. Attach suction bulb to the common fresh gas outlet. Squeeze the bulb repeatedly until fully collapsed. Like you can see here, attach it to the common gas outlet, squeeze it and then observe it Verify that bulb stays fully collapsed for at least 10 seconds. Open one vaporizer at a time and repeat these steps to make sure that the bulb should remain collapsed for at least 10 seconds. Then turn on the master switch. There is an audible signal which indicates that the switch has been put on. Then once you put it on, remember this is not for the Draeger primers that we use. It has it goes into a self-test. I'll come to that. So test the flow meters, check flow of all gas gases through their full range for operation of floats and undamaged flow tubes. Attempt to create a hypoxic mixture by turning the nitrous oxide and verify correct changes in flow and alarms. It's very important that this is checked in the beginning. Check scavenging system. Ensure proper connections between scavenging system and check the APL valve and ventilator relief valve. The scavenging system has got different size. I don't remember the size right now. You, you will have to look up to see they have a different size from the regulars to prevent any inadvertent uh, cross connections with the scavenging system. Fully open the APL valve and occlude the YPs with minimum oxygen flow, allow scavenger reservoir bag to fill completely and verify that absorber pressure gauge reads zero. With oxygen flush activated, allow the scavenger reservoir bag to breathe and verify that absorber gauge reads less than 10. So this is the absorber canister and as you can see this is something which has been already used up so it should be changed and the bonnet bottom canister rotates to the top position and the lower one has been changed and remember that the leak test should always be done after filling up 
very often initially the leak test is performed on the machine and then suddenly one realizes that the uh, soda lime needs to be changed then the soda lime is changed or sometimes it is changed in the middle of the case and then a leak test cannot be performed and then adequate tidal volume is not delivered to the patient and then ventilator bellows are also collapsing and then one doesn't know what's happening because in between the case, the soda lime was changed and the canisters were not fitted properly. Calibrate the oxygen monitors. Ensure monitor reads 21% on room air. Verify low oxygen alarm is enabled and functioning. Reinstall sensor and circuit and flush breathing system with oxygen and verify that now with 100%, it should read more than 90%. Check for breathing system uh, leaks, set all gas flows to zero, close APL valve and occlude the YPs, pressurize breathing system to about 30 centimeters of water with oxygen flush, ensure that pressure remains fixed at least for 10 seconds and open APL valve and ensure that pressure now reduces. Ventilation system and unidirectional valves should also be checked Set appropriate ventilator parameters for the patient. Always, this is very often the case. In between the cases also, if there was initial gain an adult who was being done, then very often one, one does not remember to change the settings of the monitor, of the ventilator. And then next, if you take a small baby, then the ventilator has very high adult settings. Even the monitors have high settings. And then the monitor keeps giving an alarm of high uh, heart rate. And then one is not bothered about one gets uh, sort of accustomed to, the, accustomed to the alarms being sounded. So make sure that you change the um, limits, alarm limits. Same for ventilator, set the ventilator parameters for the patient, switch to automatic ventilation and fill the bellows and breathing bag with oxygen and then turn the ventilator on and set oxygen flow to minimum and see that it is functioning and make sure that the unidirectional valves are functioning and the artificial lung that you have connected is getting ventilated. This I've already told you, set alarm limits of mon monitors capnometer, oxygen analyzer, pressure monitors with high and low airway alarms and pulse oximeters. Check final status of the machine, make sure vaporizer is off, APL valve is open, select, a, select switch to bag because initially you would require to use manual ventilation. All flow meters should read zero, Patient suction should be adequate and breathing system ready to use. So document, always document completion of checkout procedure prior to each case. Like we have now a surgical safety checklist, even the anesthesia equipment checklist should be mentioned in the anesthesia notes. It has got a very big medical legal uh, implication. Coming to the automatic machine check, that is self-test, these modern machines being more sophisticated and increasingly complex, many conventional tests which I have just told you cannot be applied and it is difficult for an anesthetist to determine a problem. So these most modern anesthesia delivery systems, they perform a self-test and have ability to detect and report the faults. So this is the, uh, this I have taken from the, uh, uh, the manual or the, uh, the user manual of a machine, of a workstation. And it, it says that the checklist is displayed after about 35 seconds. So when you put on the self-test, this is what you will get. And the steps to be performed are grouped in five categories and the categories are clearly mentioned. On the right on the screen, you can see the categories that are mentioned. 
so here on these all these things are automatically tested the gas supply is tested that includes the pipeline pressure cylinder pressure oxygen flush whether functional or not safety oxygen control functional or not same with vaporizers they check and then all these things are to be first checked you have to make sure that vaporizers are set to zero and filled appropriately and safely locked once all these things are checked then prepare for self test set apl valve to manual adjust apl valve to a reading of 30 seal the vps connect the sampling line and remember this is done this is recommended with the silicon circuit that is provided by the machine so seal the vps connect the sample line and close um the safety oxygen flow control now check the components as instructed in checklist on the screen and as described and then confirm the change of soda line by pressing the soft key soda line change so you have to be at it one when the self test is being done you have to be looking at it to check what it is indicating and this green indicates that this is passed a uh, red indicates there are certain points which are critical where if not passed then the machine is not cleared by the cleared for the user then start so once you start the self test then it goes into the self self test mode and it indicates the time it is going to take and the percentage that is done you can always do the complete self test you should always do it in the morning and in between cases you can do a quick check and as you can see here press the cancel test key and do the emergency start you can do that in case in the middle of it there is a patient who comes for surgery emergency surgery you can cancel it but always perform a complete self test unless there is an emergency situation and whatever is the problem is located in the lower bar so one has to keep in mind that not all faults cross connections or misconnections can be reported by these machines and backup ventilation ventilation equipments like a manual resuscitator should be checked and always kept ready check for successive cases if the same anesthesiologist is using the same machine in successive cases all steps need not be repeated or may be abbreviated after an initial check out so to summarize verify backup ventilation equipment is available and functional check oxygen cylinder supply central pipeline supplies should be checked check initial status of flow pressure system of low pressure system perform leak check of machine in the low pressure system turn on turn on the machine master switch and test flow meters adjust and check the scavenging system and calibrate oxygen monitor thank you sir please unmute yourself thank you dr namita the topic is very well covered by you i think post graduates uh, take advantage of this talk and do do the proper checking of the machine before using the uh, machine to the patient thank you very much thank you sir there are few questions ma'am okay one of the delegate is asking where oxygen comes out of the oxygen auxiliary oxygen port the source of oxygen of the from the auxiliary uh, output port auxiliary oxygen port there is a small oxygen source which is available in the form of a small reservoir which is there in the machine in case of complete failure that is providing oxygen 
right ma'am there is another question the flow meter they want to know whether flow meter is a part of low flow or the intermediate flow system see the flow meter till the flow meter norms is uh intermediate but once the flow is, flow meter norms are the ones which are subjected to intermediate pressure but when you turn the knob and the flows the gases flow into the flow meter they come into the low flow thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you ma'am for thank this you. thank you thank you thank you ga thank you ma'am thank you just a second sir Hello, I must thank Dr. Namita, Mr. Chairperson. She has prepared it at a short notice of a, I think, a notice of one day or one and a half days, because Dr. Baljit Singh was supposed to present it, and uh, due to some reason he sent his regret, and uh, she came to my rescue. And thank you so much, Dr. Namita, for doing this hard work and presenting it in such a discreet. thank you so much because the pg assembly can complete without uh, lecture on good lecture on anesthesia machine so thank you very much thank, thank you. you so much ma'am thank you my pleasure ma'am <laughs> thank you ma'am okay. and for the last session of the day i invite dr anup raj gogia former hod vmmc and subdurgen hospital new delhi His area of interest is pain relief and trauma care. I request you, sir, to kindly begin the session. Sir, please unmute yourself. Hello, hello. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay, dear. Uh, so this is an important session again. Uh, continuing with the equipment section the first lecture would be this uh, this session has two lectures first is on pulse oximetry and the second one is on neuromuscular monitoring system so first person who is speaking on this uh the first session on pulse oximetry is by dr sanjeev sharma he is a professor and uh, uh department of anesthesia atal bihari vajpayee institute of medical sciences and dr rml hospital his area of interest is airway ultrasound in anesthesia uh welcome dr sanjeev sharma uh this is a very very important uh lecture because pulse oximetry is used not only for the purpose of monitoring but also used as a prognosis and seeing the efficacy of oxygenation to the patients not mm -hmm. only in anesthesia but everywhere even in critical care systems so for a deep understanding of this i think uh, dr sanjeev sharma will elaborate uh, welcome dr sanjeev sharma thank you sir thank you very much good evening everyone the topic of my presentation is pulse oximeter pulse oximeter are the electronic devices used for non invasive continuous me measurement of hemoglobin oxygen saturation sometimes it is also called the fifth vital sign it is it has been an integral component of intraoperative anesthetic management and was adapted as a minimum monitoring standard by the american society of anesthesiology it is also a part of who safety surgical checklist now coming to the principle pulse oximeter depends on spectrum analysis for measurement of oxygen saturation that is the detection and quantification of component in their solution by their unique light absorption characteristic the pulse oximeter combines the two technologies spectrophotometry and photoplethysmography coming to the spectrophotometry when light passes through a matter it is transmitted absorbed or reflected 
the relative absorption or reflection of light at different wavelengths is used in several monitoring devices to estimate the concentration of dissolved substances. This type of measurement is called a spectrophotometry. It is based on beer lambert law of absorption. Now coming to beer lambert law, state that if a known intensity of light eliminate a chamber of a known dimension, then the concentration of dissolved substance can be determined if the incident and the transmitted light intensity is measured. By using this formula and solving for unknown concentration C, now the unknown concentration C is inversely proportional to the length the light has to travel and it is directly proportional to the ratio of the incident to the transmitted light. So using the principle of beard number law, the concentration of a given solute in a solvent is determined by the amount of light that is absorbed by the solute at a specific wavelength. And it is detected by transmitting the light of a specific wavelength across the solution and measuring the intensity on the other side. This, this slide shows that there is peak absorption of reduced hemoglobin at 660 nanometer and oxygenated hemoglobin at 990 nanometer. Now I'm coming to photoplethysmography. Because the absorption of light is proportional to the amount of blood between the transmitter and the photodetector, change in blood volume are reflected in the pulse oximeter trace. Pulsatile expansion of the arterial blood increases the light path length, thereby increase absorption. Light absorbed by tissue can be divided into pulsatile compartment and non-pulsatile compartment. The tissue in which the tissue in which the blood volume increases is systole is known as pulsatile or alternative current or compartment and the tissue in which it does not change with cardiac cycle it is called non-pulsatile and or direct current compartment this uh, this slide shows the absorption of the tissue and from the veins and the capillary bed and the non-pulsatile arterial bed are included in the DC compartment while the absorption from the pulsatile arterial blood are there in the AC compartment Blood uh, pulse oximetry take advantage of the pulsatile flow of the arterial blood to provide an estimation of the oxygenated hemoglobin of blood by differentiated light absorbed by the arterial blood from the light absorbed by the other component. During, uh, as you see in this figure, during systole, the volume of the blood in present in the finger tip is increased and consequently light absorption is decreased while an inverse phenomenon is observed during diastole. Therefore, the photoplethysmography waveform depends on the art arterial pulse. Now coming to the types of pulse oximetry. There are two types of pulse oximetry, transmission type and reflectance type. In transmission pulse oximeter, oximetry, it is the most common type. The light beam is transmitted to a vascular bed and is detected on the opposite side. While in reflectance, Reflectance pulse oximeter rely on the light that is deflected to determine the oxygen saturation. The probe has both the LED and the photodetector on the side on the same side. Now coming to the equipment, pulse oximeter consists of a probe, cable, and the cons console. So uh, so the first part is part of the equipment is probe. The probe come in contact with the patient, contain one or more LED that emit light at a specific wavelength and a photo detector. There are two types of probes, reusable and disposable probes. The second part is a cable. The probe is connected to the oximeter by an electric cable. Cable from different manufacturers are not interchangeable. The third part is a console. Signal is processed and values are displayed on the console. Most oximeter that are used in the operating room are part of physiological monitor. And small handheld battery operated pulse oximeter are often used, especially during transport. Now coming to the site of probe application. Most commonly we use on the finger probe. Failure rate are less and accuracy is better than on the ear lobe. Probe should be placed on an arm opposite from that only the BP cuff is applied. The performance is unaffected by arterial cannulation present on the same arm. But 
poor function may occur with intravenous infusion due to local hypothermia and vasoconstriction and it should not be placed on the index finger when the patient is in recovery position when the patient is recovered from general anesthesia it can lead to corneal abrasion can occur finger is relatively sensitive to sympathetic system vasoconstriction lead to poor circulation finger block digital pulp space infiltration or the vasodilator may improve performance dark finger nail polish or synthetic finger nail the probe should be oriented so that it transmits the light from one side of the finger to the other acrylic nail does not affect saturation desaturation detection and desaturation is slower than a centrally placed probe response time may be quicker when placed on a thumb the second side is top it is alternate side when the finger is not available or the single from the finger is unsatisfactory the third is nose it is usually a very convenient location nasal bridge the wings of the nostril and a nasal septum can be used that is respond more rapidly to change in saturation than probe place on the extremities it has been recommended under conditions such as hypothermia hypotension and infusion of vasoconstrictor drugs but if the patient is in tender position venous engorgement can occur around the nose This show artificially low saturation. So this is the picture of nose probe. The fourth side is ear. Ear can be particularly useful when there is a finger motion. Ear probe may be held in position by plastic semi-circular devices. Ear lobe should be massaged for 30 to 40 seconds with alcohol or a vasodilator or amla cream. Can be applied for 30 minutes prior to probe application to increase the perfusion. it has a fast response time and is relatively immune to vasoconstrictor effect of sympathetic system it may give wrong reading or erratic reading in tricuspid regurgitation or steep head down position the next site is tongue it uses a reflectance pulse oximeter this site is useful in patient having burn over a large percentage of body surface and this saturation and this saturation can be detected quicker it is resistant to the signal interference from electrosurgical unit there are few disadvantages also it is difficult to maintain in place during emergency situation tongue tongue quick quirking may mimic tachycardia venous congestion from a head down position and excessive oral secretion lead to poor perfusion it leads to easy dis- dislodgement it may it should be placed after tracheal intubation or after insertion of supraglottic devices next come the cheek a probe with a metal strip backing can be used to hold a disposable probe around the cheek or the lip it give more accurate reading than finger pulse oximeter detect de- uh, increase and decrease saturation more qu- quicker than uh dose probe effective during hypothermia decrease cardiac out- output increase sensory vascular resistance this site is also useful in patient in burn Uh, and in neonates uh, difficult placement poor acceptance by awake patient and the artifact during airway maneuver are the disadvantages the next probe is esophagus this probe use use elect, uh, reflectance oximeter the esophagus is a core organ it is better perfused than extremities in state of poor peripheral perfusion and may, may therefore provide a more consistent reliable source for pulse oximetry with hemodynamic instability reflect, reflect change in saturation more quickly it, it is also useful in patient with excessive burns the last is the forehead probe a flat reflectance pulse oximeter sensor is used on the forehead it should be placed just above the eyebrow so that it is sent center slightly lateral to the iris the sensor site should be cleaned with alcohol before applying the sensor to help the to help to secure it this site is usually easily accessible and is less affected by vasoconstriction constriction from cold or poor perfusion than the ear or a finger this is a for uh, this is the picture just for forehead probe rupal ji now now coming to the application of pulse oximeter it is used as a safe non invasive continuous monitoring of the cardio respiratory status of patient undergoing regional anesthesia general anesthesia and monitor monitored anesthesia care and also during thoracic anesthesia and particularly one lung anesthesia to determine whether oxygenation via the remaining lung is adequate or whether 
to increase concentration of whether to increase the concentration of oxygen then the recovery room is another location where desaturation is common protein oxygen administration to recovering patient may not be necessary when the patient are monitored with pulse oximeter during transport unrecognized oxygen desaturation may occur while the patient is being transported between the operating room and the post anesthesia care unit most transport monitor has pulse oximeter other in intra hospital area where pulse oximeter is used are patient frequently experience hypoxic episode in the post operative period after leaving the post anesthesia care unit pulse oximeter can detect the episode and help in deciding when oxygen therapy should be discontinued it is useful for monitoring patient in the icu helpful during weaning from the artificial ventilation ventilation reflectance pulse oximeter can be used for assessing fetal status during labor and delivery by applying a forehead probe it also been used to assess the viability of limb after plastic and orthopedic surgery patient with limb fracture may be compromised may have a compromised circulation distal to the fracture site pulse oximeter may serve as a useful guide to blood flow to that area it is also used to determine systolic blood pressure the blood pressure cuff is applied to the same arm as the pulse oximeter the cuff is inflated slowly and the pressure at the point at which the wave front is not is noted as systolic blood pressure to limit the oxygen to oxygen premature neonate supplement oxygen can be tapered to maintain an oxygen saturation of 90% thus avoiding the damage to the lung and retina of the neonate it also help in locating the arteries when the axillary artery cannot be palpated it may be located by placing a pulse oximeter on the finger on that side and pressing on the axilla until the pulse wave disappear this can also be used in femoral and distal pedis arteries now coming to the analysis of photoplethysmography wave form first one is uh, the pulse heart rate the pulse oximeter wave front can be useful tool for detecting and diagnosing cardiac arrhythmia to be useful to the maximum benefit the pulse oximeter waveform is used in conjugation with ecg this can greatly help in correcting interpret interpreting artifact due to patient movement or electric cortrail one of the most useful plethysmography feature is a waveform amplitude the amplitude of the plethysmograph signal is directly proportional to the vascular distance stability if the vascular compliance is low for example during episode of increased sympathetic tone the pulse oximeter waveform amplitude is also low with vasodilatation as in sympathetic blockage the pulse oximeter waveform amplitude is increased uh, this figure shows the response of pulse oximeter wave form to a surgical stimulus at the first surgical stimulus as you see there is sudden reduction in the amplitude due to sudden increase in the sympathetic tone because of peripheral vasoconstriction now coming to the pleth variability index pleth variability index is an autonomic measurement of dynamic change in perfusion index that occur during a complete respiratory cycle for pleth index calculation the infrared pulsatile signal is indexed against the non pulsatile infrared signal and expressed as a percentage reflecting the amplitude of the pulse oximeter waveform pva calculation measure changes in pi over a time interval sufficient to include one or more complete respiratory cycle pva has been shown to help a clinician to predict fluid response in a in mechanically ventilated patient under general anesthesia defined as a significant increase in cardiac output after fluid administration if pvi is greater than 14 prior to the volume expansion then that patient will respond to fluid administration and if the pvi is pvi is less than 14 prior to volume expansion the patient will not respond other uses are may be useful to determine the effectiveness of therapeutic bronchoscopy for detection of congenital heart disease in neonate and during the transportation of patient especially for example in aircraft helicopter or ambulance 
patient having mild case of covid-19 and it is self treating at home an oximeter can be helpful tool for checking oxygen level so that oxygen level can be detected earlier now i'm coming to the advantages of pulse oximeter pulse oximeter is accurate and accuracy does not change with time it has a fast response time non invasive it has a separate respiratory and circulatory variable probe application is simple and fast it is convenient side no side preparation is required there is no calibration or change of electrolyte or membrane is required a variety of different probes are available for different side application it has a fast start time there is minimum delay in operating the oxygen saturation it is user friendly lightweight compact and other feature most important feature is the tone modulation the change in pulse tone with varying saturation allow the user user to be continuously updating without taking his or eyes off the patient it allow a quick recognition of hypoxia it allow quick recognition quick recognition of hypoxia episode then does a fixed tone there is no heating required but it is a can be battery operated and it is economical now com coming to the limitation and disadvantage of pulse oximeter failure to determine the oxygen saturation in asa physical status 3 4 and 5 patient due to low quality signal in in inadequate signal the second one is poor function with poor perfusion adequate arterial pulsation are required to distinguish the lies absorbed by the arterial blood from that absorbed by the venous blood and tissue and reading may be unreliable if there is loss or diminution of peripheral pulsation significant reduction in saturation reading may be observed for for the patient having systolic blood pressure less than 80 and in situation of proximal blood pressure cuff inflation leaning on the extremities improper positioning hypotension hypothermia giving a message such as low quality signal or inadequate signal method to improve the signal include application of vasodilator cream digital nerve blocks administration of intra arterial vasodilator or placing a globe filled with warm water in the patient's hand using a better perfuse site warming cool extremity may increase the pulse amplitude provided the cardiac output is not depressed signal extraction technology may perform better during low perfusion state the second third one is the difficulty in detecting high arterial partial pressure high oxygen partial pressure at high saturation small changes in the charge uh, at uh, small changes in saturation are associated with relatively large changes in pao2 thus the pulse oximeter has a limited ability to distinguish high but safe level of arterial oxygenation from excessive oxygenation which may be harmful as in premature newborn or in patient with severe copd who need the hypoxic drive there may be significant delay between a change in alveolar oxygen tension and a change in oximeter reading delay in response is also related to sensor location this actually is detected earlier when the sensor is placed more centrally lag time will also increase with poor perfusion and a decrease in blood flow to the site monitor performing a neuro neurological block neural neural block may cause the lag time to decrease by venous obstruction peripheral vascular constriction hypothermia and motion artifact delay the detection of hypoxemia irregular heart rhythm may cause erratic performance during aortic balloon pulsation the augmentation of diastolic pressure exceed that of systolic pressure this lead to double or triple peak arterial pulse pressure wave so that it may not provide an accurate reading it is unreliable in the presence of rapid arterial fibrillation pulsatile vein cause causes under reading as oximeter cannot differentiate between pulsatile arteries and vein tricuspid regurgitation and neonate with hyperdynamic circulation may have inaccurate reading now coming to the different hemoglobins carboxyhemoglobin and meth hemoglobin absorb light at one or both of the wavelengths used by the pulse oximeter accordingly the presence of these hemoglobin species produces error in spo2 the light absorb uh, the absorption of light at 6 60 nanometer by carboxyhemoglobin is similar to that of oxyhemoglobin at 940 nanometer carboxyhemoglobin absorb virtually no light thus in patient with carbo 
carbon monoxide poisoning as CO2 is falsely elevated. Meth hemoglobin absorb light equally at the red and infrared wavelengths that are used by most pulse oximeter. When compared with functional saturation, most pulse oximeter give falsely low reading for saturation above 85% and falsely high value for saturation below 85%. When the presence of either of these dis hemoglobin is suspected, the pulse oximeter should be supplemented by in vitro multi-wave length co-oximeter. Sickle cell disease as well as presence of fetal hemoglobin, the pulse oximeter reading are accurate. If the probe is not properly positioned, it may allow the light from the emitter to the detector to only lay the tissue instead of passing through it. This is Penamera effect. It may result in spurious SpO2 value in the low 90s in normal patient. And if the patient is hypoxic, the oximeter may overestimate the true value. And in severe anemia, the SpO2 value is overestimated. When different dyes are used, there is a decrease in SpO2 reading without actually, without actually decrease in SpO2. When nail polish applied on nails, all color reduces the SpO2 reading. Coming to the next uh, disadvantage, is optical interference. Light flickering, at, light flickering at frequency similar to the frequency of LEDs, including sunlight, fluorescent light, operating room light, etc., can enter the photo detector and result in inaccurate or erratic reading. There are a number of ways to minimize the effect. Selection of a correct probe, photo detector is across the from the LED, shielding the probe from the light and other nearby probes, covering with optical material, towel, gauze piece, aluminium foil, etc. So this is a special mitts to cover the hand. Then there is the electronic interference also. Electric interference from an electrostatic unit can cause oximeter to give an inaccurate pulse count or falsely register decrease in oxygen saturation. This probe may be increased in patients with weak pulse signal. The effect is usually transient and limited to the duration of cauterization. There are various steps to minimize electric interference include locating the electrosurgical grounding plate as close to and the oximeter sensor as far from the surgical field as possible. Routing the cable from the sensor to the oximeter away from the electrosurgical apparatus. Raising the high, raising the high pulse rate alarm, operating the unit in a rapid response mode, and the, the both the operators should not be plugged in the same power source. The next one is a motion artifact. Motion of the sensor related to the skin can cause an artifact that the pulse oximeter is unable to differentiate from normal arterial pulsation. Motion may produce a prolongation in the detection time for hypoxemia without giving a warning. Neonate and children with their tiny digits and poor contact with probe are more susceptible to motion artifact. Motion artifact can cause usually be recognized by fast or erratic pulse rate display or distort lithographic waveform. Artificial artifact caused by the motion can be decreased by carefully sensor position on the different extremity from that being stimulus. Ear, cheek, nose probe may be useful then finger probe in restless patient. If a limb is hypermic, the flow of capillaries as well as blood become pulsatile. In this situation, the absorption of light from these sources will be included in the saturation comp competition, uh, co competition with resultant decrease in accuracy of oxygen saturation measured by pulse oximeter. A pulse oximeter placed near the site of blood transfusion may show transient decrease in oxygen saturation with rapid infusion of blood. Hypoventilation and hypercarbia may occur without a decrease in hemoglobin oxygen saturation, especially if the patient is receiving supplement oxygen. Pulse oximeter should not be relied upon to assess the adequacy of ventilation or to detect discon disconnection or esophageal intubation. Now we come into the patient complication. Injuries ranging from persist, persistent numbness to ischemia injury at the site on which the probe was applied has been reported. 
these risks are increased by prolonged probe application, compromised extremity perfusion, and tight probe application. Frequent site examination and moving the probe to different site reduces the likelihood of injury. The second is the corneal aberration, commonly occurred during recovery from general anesthesia with pulse oximeter in the index finger when the patient rubs their eyes. So finger other than index finger must be used during recovery. The last one is a burn. Injuries ranging from redness area to third degree burn under pulse oximeter probe has been reported. It frequently results from incompatibility between the probe and from one manufacturer and the pulse oximeter of another. Using a damaged probe can result in a burn. A pulse oximeter probe may provide an alternate pathway for electrosurgical use currents. To avoid burn injuries, frequent probe site inspection and site or rotation are recommended. When probe is placed on a finger or a toe, the light source should be placed on the nail rather than on the pulp. The reference is Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev. It was a very nice presentation and uh, the topic was covered nicely. Um, I hope there are some questions. Uh, can we take the questions now or at the end of the sessions? Hello. No questions, sir. No questions over the topic. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev, uh, can you please elaborate whether the uh, uh, the pulse oximeter, as we take it from the fingers or uh, from the periphery, is it a true reflection of uh, uh, regional flows, for example, in the brain or the other other areas? In the finger probe? Yeah. The finger probe is mainly the periphery located, while the central, more accurate will be the central probes that occur in the central part of the body, like tongue or cheek that is more centrally located, it will give more information and it will be faster as compared to the peripheral probe. Yes, that is, uh, that is the message I wanted to give to the postgraduates who are listening to it, that it is not a true reflection of regional flows, mm -hmm. either in the brain or in the, uh, uh, say, viscera. So it may not be the correct reflection of the regional flow. So it is a sum total of all over the flows in the body and uh, saturation is uh, just a reflection of all those areas. It is not a true representation of regional flows. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, very nice uh, presentation. And now we will move to the second part of the equipment lecture, that is neuromuscular junction monitoring. Uh, neuromuscular junction monitoring, again, is uh, another important aspect, which is Unfortunately, it is not, uh, uh, has become a routine in the, uh, uh, the estimation of the uh, usual, our uh, usual day-to-day -day practice. But uh, this is one thing which should have become a, a regular feature of monitoring, but unfortunately it has not. Partly it is due to the advancements in the uh, neuromuscular uh, uh, blocking drugs. We have now short duration, limited duration drugs which can be metabolized very easily in the body. So, But still, there are conditions where it should be done. And uh, to speak about it, we have uh, Dr. Surendra Kumar. He's uh, assistant professor and uh, head of onco-anesthesia uh, uh, at Delhi State Cancer Institute, Delhi. His uh, primary area of interest is airway management. And uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Surinder, uh, 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 to uh, apprise everybody of the importance of neuromuscular monitoring. Thank you, sir.
very good afternoon everybody at the outside i congratulate the team for organizing the event in this session we shall discuss neuro monitoring of neuromuscular transmission before we begin please accept greetings from delhi state cancer institute to begin with we discuss why should we monitor neuromuscular transmission at all we all recognize and acknowledge that neuromuscular blocking agents have revolutionized surgical practice so much so that in 2015 barash et al in the list of 20 uh, most important anesthesia articles ever published listed the article by griffith and johnson on use of curare at number 13 however another article cited that the use of curare has resulted in a increased mortality after surgery uh, from 1 in 2100 to 1 in 370 93% of the sorry 63% of the uh, such deaths were caused by respiratory failure so with the six fold increase in the mortality rate what is pumped to think what has gone wrong well it was recognized that inadequate recovery of neuromuscular function was the main cause and it was termed neurostimulant resistant polarization residual neuromuscular blockage is defined as a presence of signs and symptoms of muscular weakness after administration of neuromuscular blocking agents even though the block might have been reversed in the operation theater critical respiratory events have been defined to include airway obstruction hypoxemic episodes dysfunction of pharyngeal muscles aspiration and pneumonia risk need for tracheal reintubation and increased length of stay in post operative care units Four decades back, the incidence of residual block was cited to be around 40 percent, and even in present times, the incidence is said to be between 40 to 60 percent, which is quite high. In absolute numbers, half a million people suffer from critical respiratory events worldwide every year. But is the residual residual block the only problem? Well, no. Uh, the fifth nation audit project report has concluded that use of neuromuscular blocking agents has resulted in a substantially high incidence of intraoperative awareness so something needs to be done to monitor the well the most commonly used uh, type method of monitoring is the clinical method which includes uh, sustained head lift uh, feel of anesthesia bag and different different things so, however none of these clinical assessment is infallible including the most sensitive considered uh, test that is the uh, resistance to uh, removal of uh, tongue depressor from between the clenched teeth so they are uh, fallible and something more needs to be done but something more needs to be done is that in 1965 churchill davidson opined that the degree of of uh, neuromuscular blockage can be most satisfactorily uh, determined by observing contraction of a muscle after stimulation of nerve uh, subsequently evaluation of evoked response was recommended the evoked this evoked response of uh, the or the contraction of the muscle can be assessed by sub, uh, subjectively by looking at the muscle or the zone or by uh, feeling the contraction however this is not sufficient but uh, the peripheral nerve stimulators available at that time uh, did not have any device to monitor or uh, uh, to record or interpret the evoked response which could be displayed this thing but this needs to be done a principle of moving on to principles of nerve stimulation and type of uh, the nerves can be stimulated magnetically or electrically for all clinical purposes uh, uh, electrical stimulation is used and we will limit our discussion to electrical stimulation only the stimulation can be provided by means of surface electrodes or needle electrodes surface electrodes are usually uh, the ecg electrodes however the dedicated nerve stimulator electrodes can also be used with different thickness and also have uh, some buffers incorporated in them which uh, help in maintaining the ph of the skin Uh, which subsequently, which effectively helps in uh, avoiding the change in skin resistance. Needle electrodes can also be used when the skin resistance is high, 
such as in cases of edema or obesity, renal failure, etc. etc. The two electrodes uh, have uh, negative and positive uh, polarity. Negative electrode is uh, uh, placed over the more superficial part of the nerve, and uh, the negative or positive electrode is placed a little proximal. This is the picture of uh, showing a metal ball electrodes. This is the usual flat electrodes. The evoked response dip is directly proportional to the strength of the stimulus, which uh, in turn is a function of current intensity and the duration of the um, uh, duration for which the impulse is uh, uh, provided. Also, the current uh, needs to be constant throughout the application uh, <clears throat> and it needs to be monophasic and square wave. This is because of biphasic current, we cause repetitive firing and uh, if uh, the current is not square wave, it, uh, that is it doesn't uh, rise and fall. Uh, Quickly, uh, the slow rising current can cause uh, accommodation of the nerve and the nerve may not be stimulated at all. Uh, the, for a muscle to contract, a certain minimum number of uh, fibers has to be stimulated and the current uh, at which the, this number, minimum number of uh, muscle fibers is <coughs> stimulated or con contract is called the threshold intensity. As the current intensity increases, the number of fibers uh, con uh, stimulated is uh, increased and this is called this value of current is called uh, maximal stimulation uh, max, maximal current intensity or maximal stimulation however over time skin resistance may change and this maximal stimulation may not be sufficient to uh, excite uh, or uh, making the uh, all the muscle fibers contract so therefore uh, uh, a value higher than the maximal current is required this called supramaximal stimulation is about 20 to 25 percent higher than the maximal stimulation. The duration for which the, the uh, stimulus is applied is, zero point, is not usually 0 0.2 milliseconds and it should not be uh, more than 0.3 milliseconds. This is because uh, if uh, it uh, it is applied for a longer duration, it can uh, overshoot the refractory period and a sustained contraction may be uh, observed. The frequency of stimulation depends on the pattern of stimulation, whether, whether we use a single pitch or repetitive stimuli. There are different patterns of twitch uh, stimulation. The simplest being the single twitch stimulation. This is in single twitch stimulation, a single supramaximal stimulus is applied at a frequency of 0 0.1, that is uh, one stimulus over 10 in 10 seconds or to one hertz frequency with a pulse width of 0.2 milliseconds. If the frequency is kept higher than one hertz, it can overestimate the block because it causes fatigue and the muscle doesn't contract completely the, to the its full potential. Mm -hmm. And to compare the, the response of the uh, to compare the response to stimulation, a pre-block level is where the, which serves as the control. Mm -hmm. As we see here, this is an unblocked muscle. The on application of a single twitch response, single twitch, the height of the twitch response is measured. And after depolarize after administration of depolarizing or, or non-depolarizing block, the twitch height is measured, which is compared with the the block height and the ratio of the block, uh, ratio or degree of the block is observed. Here we can see that uh, the <coughs> twitch height decreases similarly in depolarizing and non depolarizing block. Therefore, it, it uh, this uh, pattern cannot distinguish between the two types of blocks, whether it is caused by depolarizing uh, blockers or non depolarizing blockers. Uh, for a twitch height to decrease, at least 75% of the receptor should be blocked, <coughs> and the twitch height completely disappears when 95% of the blocks are 95% uh, of the receptors are blocked. Uh, in clinical practice, single twitch uh, doesn't have much of the application except for uh, establishing supramaximal stimulation and as component of the post tetanic potentiation. However, in research uh, field, it has a very high potential which is used for determination of potency of drug that is determining the ED95 of the drugs. 
the problem encountered with the single twitch response is that it needs a pre block control as overcome by another pattern of stimulation mm -hmm. wherein four equal supra maximal stimuli at 2 hertz are applied since the four stimuli are uh, applied the first stimuli serves as the control for subsequent uh, uh, responses the Measurement is uh, the degree of block is measured by the ratio of fourth twitch, fourth twitch to the height of first twitch. That is T4 by T1, and this is called the top ratio or train of four ratio. Alternatively, the number of responses, twitch responses, can be counted, which is called a train of four count. In the advantage of this is no control is no pre block control is needed, and uh, the, the, this can also be the top count or the uh, response can be assessed by visual and tactile means also. Uh, however, uh, the, the subjective evaluation is uh, limited by the fact that uh, uh, since the, the response of uh, four uh, uh, contractions is uh, to be compared, it becomes difficult to when the top ratio exceeds 0 0.4. This is the graph. The representation is the control. Uh, uh, this is the control uh, uh, representation of uh, top stimulation response in control patient prior to administration of any muscle blocker. After administration of depolarizing, depolarizing blockers, the twitch height decreases, but the two, uh, it should be noted. It can be noted that the uh, height of all the four responses is similar. In contrast, after administration of non-depolarizing block, we can see that the although the height of uh, the twitch, uh, twitch response decreases, but the uh, response of the fourth twitch decreases the most and uh, the first twitch decreases the less. As the block uh, pro uh, uh, progresses, the fourth block, uh, fourth response disappears completely, followed by third, second, and first. During uh, recovery from non depressing block, the twitch responses uh, reappear as if, uh, the first response uh, the appears first, uh, the response to first twitch appears uh, first, and the fourth twitch appears at the last and the uh, height are, heights are different. Uh, after recovery from depolarizing block, the all the four uh, uh, all the four twitch have same height. So because of this phenomenon called fade, the block can be distinguished whether it is uh, because of non-depolarizing block or depolarizing block. Or the limitation as discussed okay. is that uh, the uh, fate cannot be differentiated once the top ratio exceeds 0 0.4. Some clinical correlation has been made with the top ratios. At uh, top ratio 0 0.4 or less, there is obvious muscle weakness. However, the usually uh, conducted clinical test, uh, the, the most common sustained head lift of 5 seconds can be performed uh, at uh, top ratio 0 0.7. And muscle uh, master strength may not be um, uh, is achieved at 0 0.86. However, it should be noted that uh, pharyngeal and upper esophageal function is inadequate uh, till the top ratio reaches 0 0.9, and this inadequacy can cause regurgitation and aspiration. Now the next uh, pattern of stimulation is tetanic stimulation and uh, uh, followed by a uh, post tetanic stimulation, uh, post -stimulation using, which uses the post tetanic potentiation. Uh, in the tetanic stimulation, very rapid stimuli 50 hertz for 5 seconds is applied and is not be, uh, repeated before expiry of 2 minutes. The Like uh, train of 4, uh, fade is observed after tetanic uh, stimulation also at uh, administration of non-depolarizing vaccines and phase development of phase 2 block after depolarizing block. Also. <clears throat> because a tetanic response uh, uh, is applied uh, 
uh, at a very high frequency, uh, the uh, the response, the contractile response to each stimulus is super is mm -hmm. added to subsequent mm -hmm. stimuli and sustained contraction. This sustained contraction gives an indication that the block is uh, uh, weaning off, which may result in uh, either overdosing or overestimation of recovery. In clinical practice, this is uh, tetanic stimulation is not uh, commonly used except in con uh, uh, connection uh, combination with post tetanic stimulus. The post tetanic stimulus uses the phenomena uh, of post tetanic potentiation. During the uh, what, uh, during this uh, uh, tetanic stimulation, intraterminal calcium rises, which results in subsequent larger release of acetylcholine quanta, uh, which, for, which further results in a higher contractile response of the muscle. So this is useful when uh, there is no response to train of four or tetanus because of the uh, even though there is no response to train of four or tetanic stimuli, because of post tetanic uh, stimulus uh, applied subsequent to tetanic stimulation can cause uh, a higher response uh, of uh, contractor response. Uh, and uh, this uh, post tetanic potentiation is maximal three seconds after application after cessation of the tetanic stimulation and lasts for about two minutes. Therefore, post tetanic stimulus is uh, applied three seconds after the uh, tetanic stimulation. It is used to ensure a complete block, which is important in certain surgeries like open globe surgeries and neurosurgery, vascular surgery, etc. Uh, as the, this is a graph showing uh, this uh, control value, the contact, uh, sustained contraction to tetanic stimulus. All, uh, all, but uh, after administration of a blocking agent, there is no response to tetanic stimuli, but on a post tetanic stimulation, the contractor response is observed. As the block, as the time passes, the contractor response to post tetanic stimulation increases, and with further passage, uh, stimulation to tetanic stimulus uh, it can also be observed. Uh, for as we discussed earlier in the train of four stimulation, the limitation is that the subjective evaluation by visual or tactile means is uh, limited when the uh, top ratio exceeds 0 0.4. Uh, this is because of the comparison of four twitches. So this problem is overcome by application of two bursts of tetanic stimulate 50 hertz separated by a period that allows adequate relaxation. Uh, this is called a double burst stimulation, uh, in which the uh, the three the, uh, double burst stimulation, three three is the mo is most commonly used. Uh, in it, in each tetanic burst, three stimuli, three stimuli are applied, separated by 750, 750 milliseconds. Since the uh, train of four elicits four responses, uh, the the comparison becomes difficult. The double burst stimulation uh, elicits only two contractile responses because of which the comparison between two is uh, uh, a little easier than the comparison between four, uh, first and fourth. So therefore, the range of uh, subjective evaluation is increased. However, this two is uh, limited. Uh, uh, limited to uh, up to a trough ratio of 0 0.7, which is still well below the uh, mark of adequate recovery, that is a uh, trough ratio of 0 0.9. On the basis of the uh, response to uh, stimuli, the block can be designated into different types, that is inten uh, intense block or deep block or a moderate block uh, like this. When uh, uh, the after the, the uh, administration of neuromuscular blocking agent to, to three to six minutes are after that, if we try not four or tetanus uh, stimuli is applied, there is no response. The this period of no response is called the profound profound block or intense block. 
if we even in this period even if you like post tetanic stimulation even the post tetanic potential does not uh, help and uh, no response is observed but after a certain period of time uh, the post tetanic stimulation uh, elicits a response this is uh, post tetanic but because of post tetanic potentiation and the count is called uh, ptc post tetanic count with further passage of time the ptc count increases increases and when the 10 to 12 counts are available a ptc count is available the appearance of first twitch to train of 4 is expected in this here we can see that the train of 4 there is a response to train of 4 the top count is 1 so when top count is 1 or 2 the this plane this plane of block is called surgical block or moderate block the relaxation is considered to be adequate for most uh, surgical procedures however this is not yet a path of recovery uh, and uh, no reversal agent should be given during this period so uh, during this period the reversal agents are advised when preferably 3 to 4 responses are available are our muscles equally sensitive or respond in a similar fashion to neuromuscular blocking agents no they have different fiber composition uh, acetylcholine receptor density is different acetylcholine release is different uh, uh, like that so they respond, uh, respond differently the diaphragm is said to be the most resistant but here we can see the dose of uh, pancreas required uh, by diaphragm to produce a similar depression of twitch response is almost twice to that dose required by adductor pollicis muscle but clinically it is seen that the block in diaphragm develops faster it stays shorter recover also recovers faster so why is this contra contradiction this contradiction is explained on the basis of a higher per gram blood flow of diaphragm than the limb muscles which enable the uh, higher delivery of the blocking agent to diaphragm and similarly it results in a faster recovery also so the significance is that if the measurement is being done at the at a limb muscle the uh, response to tof may be zero but uh, because of recovery of uh, diaphragm patient may cough or uh, hiccups may be there so this diaphragmatic recovery uh, can be uh, dangerous in certain situations so this is to be avoided further diaphragmatic recovery uh, does not uh, should not be taken as an indication that extubation can be performed extubation can be performed because if extubation the laryngeal muscles are more sensitive the there there will be need for reintubation also the pattern followed by orbicular oculi oculi muscle is similar to that of peripheral muscle and corrugator supercilia muscle uh, responds in a similar fashion to laryngeal adductors the significance is that uh, for to for protection of patient from uh, pulmonary complications or uh, the critical respiratory events the important muscles that is laryngeal pharyngeal diaphragm are usually not accessible for measurement so we have to choose a different muscle nerve muscle unit for monitoring which is accessible away from surgical field and not paratic the most commonly used uh, nerve muscle unit is the uh, ulnar nerve adductor pollicis uh, muscle uh, others may also be used the ulnar nerve is usually stimulated at uh, wrist uh, can also be uh, stimulated at elbow or uh, hand uh, when you uh, stimulated at uh, uh, wrist the negative electrode is uh, placed 1 cm uh, uh, proximal to where the proximal uh, proximal crease crosses the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris and this uh, uh, positive electrode is uh, placed about 3 to 6 cm proximal to the negative electrode the advantage of choosing the ulnar nerve uh, uh, adductor pollicis muscle unit is that uh, the uh, adductor pollicis muscle being a sensitive muscle the risk of overdose is less and uh, when uh, recovery is observed on 
uh, this muscle, it can be safely assumed that uh, the possibility of uh, residual blockade will be minimal. And also, since the muscle and uh, the nerve stimulation are on uh, two opposite sides, the possibility of uh, direct uh, muscle stimulation is minimized. However, it should be uh, realized that the elimination of response to uh, stimulation of uh, this nerve muscle region does not guarantee the diaphragm paralysis. These are some of the other nerve muscle units which can be used. Uh, this is based on time, different uh, patterns can be used. Uh, the before induction, uh, the setup can be prepared, single twitch at induction is for uh, and others. The, the important is that uh, the normal function to hypoxemia, protection for critical respiratory events, absence of uh, heaviness of eyelids, visual disturbance, and difficulty in swallowing and patient anxiety cannot be adequately removed uh, unless the TOF ratio uh, re uh, reaches or exceeds uh, the 0 0.9. Now we go on to different types of peripheral stimulators. They can be standalone, standalone units which only uh, stimulate the nerve, have, have no means to, to record or interpret or display the evoked response. Others uh, are available which uh, have units to interpret the evoked response and display it. The popular top watch is visible here. Others are uh, these are standalone units and the uh, units can also be incorporated in a special workstation through a module and the remote response can be displayed on the monitor. The types of record uh, techniques of record responses, the gold standard uh, mechanomyography is precise and reproducible. It uh, measures the mechanical response of muscle during an isometric contraction. Since the contraction is isometric, a preload is applied to the muscle. This makes the setup a little cumbersome. Excuse me. This uh, makes the setup a little cumbersome and uh, the technique is not used clinically. The other is electromyography, wherein uh, the action potential of the muscle is uh, measured. Since the action potential of the muscle is measured, the free muscle uh, movement is not required. However, it is affected by elect uh, interference by electronic devices like diathermy. The other is acceleromyography, wherein a piezoelectric sensor is used to measure the acceleration of muscle. Uh, it requires free muscle movement, but uh, it is uh, commonly available and commonly used, is easy to use. The other is kinemiography, wherein uh, again a piezoelectric uh, sensor strip is used, placed between the thumb and the index finger. Uh, the degree of uh, electrical signal is generated by bending of the uh, 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 sensor strip and which is translated into the visual display of uh, the level of block. The others are uh, phonomyography and compressomyography. So these are the pictures of these uh, pictures of the uh, different techniques. Now the muscle, uh, when is the monitoring absolutely essential? Uh, when the prolongation, uh, the uh, administration is prolonged or uh, the long acting agents are used or when the residual blockade can be devastating like uh, morbid obesity or uh, severe respiratory distress or when the ad administration of reversal agents may be harmful or the uh, drug profile, drug pharmacokinetics is altered and the expected response of uh, the drugs is no, not there in case of liver renal failure or when there is neuromuscular diseases. The hazards, uh, the burns have been reported after use, uh, especially with the neural electrodes, more so with the neural electrodes, nerve damage can occur because of pressure because of repeated stimulation and muscle soreness can be observed or when the battery of the equipment is low, uh, adequate uh, sufficient responses may not be uh, produced and this uh, gives us to misleading information. The message for today is uh, 
that the residual neuromuscular causes post operative pulmonary complications the quantitative or objective monitoring is the surest way of assessing level of block tof ratio of 0.9 <clears throat> should be achieved to exclude residual neuromuscular blockade sorry uh, top, uh, a tof count of 1 to 2 provides adequate surgical anesthesia and reversal of the block should not be attempted unless uh, the tof count is 2 or but is preferably 3 to 4 if the tof ratio is below 0.9 antagonism of the block should be done and all of the departments should have at least should have a quantitative monitor with this i thank you very much for your patient listening thank you sir please unmute yourself yeah uh thank you dr surender uh, uh this topic is a little more tedious and uh, requires a lot of explaining and uh, requires a lot of uh, understanding of the physiology but you have adequately covered the topic are there any questions mm, looking for it sir one delegate has asked what will happen if intraoperatively scoline is given to patient who is maintained on ndmr will it affect recovery well when the ndmr is has already been given to the patient it is a competitive blocker the mechanism of uh, succinyl choline is different from that of the non depolarizing blockers the because of the different mechanisms the blockers are already the receptor acetylcholine receptors are already blocked by non depolarizing blockers so it succinyl choline will not get attached to that that the, them the block will proceed as the, the non depolarizing blockers itself there's one more question sir one of the delegate wants to know about ot pollution prevention he wants to he wants you to elaborate over this is it relevant in this uh, uh, this context uh, no sorry i i could not get the relevance to this context sir there's no further explanation regarding this question sir he has just written please explain ot pollution so ठीक है सर नो मोर क्वेश्चंस नो रिगार्डिंग द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन व्हिच वाज आस्क सम टाइम्स वी यूज्ड टू गिव दिस सक्सनल कोलिन इन वेरी स्मॉल अमाउंट्स फॉर क्लोजर ऑफ पेरिटोनियम व्हेन लॉन्ग एक्टिंग मसल रिलैक्सेंट्स वर यूज्ड एंड वी डिड नॉट वांट टू गिव अ फर्दर डोज ऑफ दिस थिंग एंड इट वाज फॉर अ स्मॉल पीरियड ऑफ टाइम यू वांटेड रिलैक्सेशन एंड दैट टाइम इट वाज यूज्ड द it may lead to a mixed type of a block but since the amount used is very very small it usually doesn't and this was done in past but nowadays uh, these things are not practiced because the uh, muscle relaxants which are being used are anyway are short acting and you are pretty sure that they will reverse uh, it used to be done in uh, previous years not now thank you sir and that is very correct and uh, in that situations uh, that you said the scoline succinyl choline is mainly uh, used to be used uh, for peritoneal closure that too when the block from non depolarizing has already almost weaned off yes because surgeon was surgeon may be asking you for little more relaxation so that they can put the bowel in yeah at, exactly at, at, at that time are, it used to be given we used to give about 25 mg of succinyl choline yeah yeah But exactly sir because, because because you do not want to give a very long acting muscle relaxant like exactly. curare at that time was one which was being used exactly now it is you have have a muscle relaxant which have short duration of action plus you have muscle relaxant which can wean off by yourself yes, uh, by itself like uh, atracurium or cetracurium exactly so sir. we have come a long way uh 
since uh, those periods that is why uh, that is why that is what i wanted to say that it has not become a routine practice for us to to uh, do the neuromuscular monitoring in routine cases nowadays because we have got such good drugs though it should have become a routine practice but now the indications are very few as uh, dr surendra pointed out where uh, liver cases or uh, kidney cases where it may be required or when when already patient suffers from some neuromuscular uh, junction myopathies so these are the uh, few indications where it is a must uh rest of the things we just uh, do routinely but uh, it is a good practice that even if for routine cases you at least try and work on this so that in difficult cases of uh, uh, long duration surgery or uh, cases of liver and kidney affliction you can use it at that time that that is the message that uh, i wanted to give anything else uh, you want to add dr surender no sir that's all sir you have completed uh, contributed in this information and the good message for their postgraduates sir okay thank you thank you sir thank you for the session sir that concludes the proceedings of day 2 of apec 21 Before closing off, I would request Dr. Akhilesh to debrief the PGs. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. How are you? बिल्कुल बढ़िया सर आप कैसे हैं? ठीक बढ़िया. Good afternoon, Dr. Surinder. Good afternoon, Dr. Akhilesh. आ क्या हाल चाल आपके? I am good. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. And best wishes thank for Apex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the PGs who have logged in, uh, the quiz will be open at six fifteen. So don't get worried if you find that quiz is not opening. Uh, we have shared the link uh, from morning, and those who have given the email IDs, the link is given to them, uh, and the quiz will open at six fifteen. and uh, the first two winners of the correct answers maximum correct answers will get rupees 2000 refund and we will declare the name of those uh, tomorrow and plus six winners who have won the food vouchers of today will also be declared tomorrow and uh, there is a feedback form attached to it so please fill the feedback form and give us genuine feedback so that uh, we can improve upon thank you and tomorrow we'll start at 8 thank you Thank you sir thank you